Hey everyone. Welcome back for part 3 of what if Konoha honored Minato's dying wish. As always, huge thanks to all of my Patreons, making these videos would be impossible without you guys' support, especially with all the restrictions YouTube places on my type of content. As always, the full story is already out over there for you guys along with about 30 other different stories you can enjoy. Also feel free to send me any messages over there if you have any questions or even if you just want to chat. Link to all of that will be in the description. Anyways, everyone, enjoy the video. Chapter 15. Chunin Exam Finals. Naruto woke up early on the day of the finals. This had been an amazing month for him. The time he spent with his girls was so positive and uplifting that it kept a smile plastered on his face. The girls often requested to go on dates together. Anko took a special liking to Ino. It seemed both of them were bi-curious. They would never do anything without Naruto present, but they had kissed a few times, and liked it. Kurotsuchi and Samui were a far less excitable pairing, but they found comfort in each other's presence. They really started hitting it off after Naruto took them out for a date to a nice restaurant and then took them to the Hokage Monument to look over the village at night. Both were really starting to fall for the handsome blonde. Tsunade had apologized to Anko a couple of weeks ago. Since then, Anko was frequently in Naruto's room at night. She was a more than willing test subject for Naruto's new erotic jutsu. The application of various types of chakras got various results. Naruto found that applying lightning and water chakra was the best for sensual stimulation of erogenous zones. The application of small amounts of fire chakra to his dick and fingertips would help keep Anko on her toes. Fire chakra in combination with water chakra also made his massages even more effective. By the end of each night, Anko was putty in Naruto's hands. Naruto had perfected the removal seal for the caged bird seal and his theory work on the new seal was sound. There was no way to be 100% sure without actually applying it to a Byakugan user. Naruto had shared his plan with Jiraiya and Tsunade. They were concerned about the political fallout but trusted him. They each said they would step in and have his back if worst came to worst. Naruto woke up, at breakfast and stretched. He meditated for an hour and then let Q out. Q wanted to watch from the stands with Tsume and Matatabi. It took Yugito a while, but she learned the shadow clone jutsu and let Matatabi out a few times to go rut with Q. It helped quiet the cat's incessant rumblings when she returned to Yugito's mind. She yelled at Naruto for not warning her about the memory transfer the day after Q and Tabi, Matatabi's alias, had sex. Naruto laughed his way to the bank after that. So, with a fist bump and good luck, Q left Naruto to finish his meditation. Naruto showed up in the arena an hour early and met in the dignitary's room. He greeted A.I., Onoki, Mei and the fire daimyo. All were excited to see his matches and promised to chat more after the finals. After agreeing to meet the Hokage in his booth at the start of the matches, he left. An hour later, 11 contestants and Hayate looked up at the cage's box. The arena was jam-packed with civilians, ninja and foreign dignitaries alike. The dull roar quieted after Hiruzen stood up and used a jutsu to address the crowds. To the citizens of Fire Country, our guests, foreign dignitaries, the Rakage, Suchikage, Misakage, and Kaze Kage, I welcome you to the 30th biannual Chunin exams. Before we begin today, I wanted to make an announcement. It has been my pleasure to serve Konoha and Fire Country for the past 56 years. I am proud of the will of fire that has grown fiercely in our village. The will has led to the gathering of the Great Five and brought us closer to peace. Today, it brings me great pleasure to announce that I have found my successor. I hereby nominate Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze as my successor, to take effect on his 18th birthday. Naruto, please step forward, my boy. Naruto stepped forward, wearing a Haurian cage-shaped hat that denoted him as the heir apparent. He waved to the crowds and took in the cacophony of shouts and praises. He loved his village, this just reaffirmed it. Behind him, I and Onoki smiled because they knew that Naruto was going to honor his promise to them. Hiruzen raised his arms and waited for silence. Naruto is the son of our late Yondaime Hokage. He is also the reason that we have all five caged together here for the first time in over a decade. He has inspired peace talks that will take place after these tuning exams. I ask you all to pray to Kami for her blessing of peace. May the elemental nations prosper together. Without further ado, let us start the tuning exam finals. Hayate had the finalists clear the field and called for Neji and Naruto. Naruto threw a three-pronged kunai at Hayate, who caught it deftly. Naruto then appeared in a yellow flash in front of Hayate and took the kunai back from his. This drew audible gasps from the crowd and then a roar of cheers exploded from the citizens of Fire Country. 
The twist of the Kaze Kage's lips into a brief snarl wasn't missed by Hiruzen. He gave hand signs to his guards, Jiraiya and Tsunade, so they would be ready. You were always so flashy. No matter, Naruto, today fate will favor me. Snarled out Neji. In a way, it will. Was Naruto's simple reply. Hayate began the match and Naruto made a single shadow clone, applied a reinforcement seal, then addressed the audience. Today, Neji will face a single shadow clone of mine. This is to teach his arrogant ass humility. If Neji destroys this clone, he wins the match. Naruto's voice carried around the arena and was met by looks of confusion and outrage from the gamblers. The clone of Naruto, dubbed Ruto for this fight, stepped forward and squared off against Neji. He secured the original's pouch to his leg. The two stared each other down for nearly a minute before Hayate coughed, igniting the two's movement. Ruto sped off in a blur while Neji activated his Byakugan. Neji processes the clone dropped something out of his pack, and then Neji's whole world went white. The blinding power of Ruto's flash tags was set to maximum. Neji screamed out in a panic as he lost his sight. Ruto started beating on the Hayuga. He could have ended it all at once, but what kind of punishment would that be? The beatdown was interrupted after three minutes when Neji called out Heavenly Spin and a blue dome of chakra emerged around his spinning form. Ruto had to halt his advance until the dome faded. As soon as it did, Ruto appeared in a shunshine next to Neji and kicked him on his chin. Neji went sailing into the air. What happened next was unreal. Ruto jumped into the air and summoned ten shadow clones. Neji received a straight kick to his chest and an elbow to his face to propel him nearly fifty feet in the air. Then, in rapid succession, three clones landed successive punches plummeting Neji to the ground. The whole time, Ruto's clone were saying, Yutsu Maki Barrage. The real Naruto flashed to Neji's location and quickly set up a barrier before Hayate could intervene. He applied a pre-made seal tag to the unconscious Neji's forehead. He paused briefly to look directly at the Hayuga section of the audience and locked eyes with Yashi and Hizashi. He then channeled Chakra to the tag and called out Fun, Kai. The seal disappeared from Neji's forehead. The Hayugas with their Byakugan activated, jumped the rails into the stadium and charged the barrier. Naruto then applied the new protection seal, which looked like the symbol of the leaf and applied it to the base of Neji's neck. A quick Uzumaki protection of the whirlpool, Fun was all that could be heard before all hell broke loose. The Hayuga elders and a couple of main house members surrounded the barrier in fighting stances. Hyashi and the Hokage appeared in front of them, surrounded by Anbu. You will stand down or face my wrath. The god of Shinobi made an appearance. The stadium was deathly silent. But, a Hayuga elder was cut off mid-sentence by Hyashi. Silence. We will disrupt these exams no further. Any action taken by the Hayuga will be done through me via the proper channels. Return to your seats or take a trip to T&I. A very displeased group of Hayuga elders frowned the whole way back to their seats. Hyashi bowed an apology to the Hokage before taking Neji's limp form from Naruto. The Hokage nodded to Hayate, so Hayate announced the winner of the match, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. The brief and awkward silence was replaced by a dull roar as Naruto walked to the finalist box. When Hiruzen rejoined the cages in the cage box, he entered the ongoing conversation. That was ruthless and efficient. He completely took away his foe's greatest strength and dismantled him. Remarked May. I chuckled, that beatdown was something special. I bet you that boy planned out how he was going to punish the Hayuga. We all watched the preliminaries and saw him. That cold look in his eyes is the same as father always wore on the battlefield. Onoki chimed in. Indeed, I. I remember that look well. It still amazes me how he approached us. That bold look in his eyes and the oath he swore brought life back to my old bones. Hiruzen's chuckle drew the group's attention. Naruto-kun has that effect on people. I apologize, Kaze Kage, Naruto didn't have time to make it to your village. Think nothing of it, Hokage. So, am I invited to the cage summit that I heard you were having? Came the cold voice of the Kaze Kage. Ah, I had planned on inviting you after the finals, old friend was Hiruzen's cheerful reply. It was met by a curt nod and turn of the head from the Kazekage. Or, I would have if you didn't kill the Kazekage, Orochimaru. You will not escape this time. Was the Hokaye's follow-up thought. Back on the field, Kurotsuchi and Chojuro took their places. Onoki decided to comment, is that one of the new swordsmen of the mist, Mei Dono? Indeed, Onoki Dono. I was quite impressed by your granddaughter's lava release. If these treaties work out, I propose an exchange of jutsu and training, I would enjoy passing on my techniques. 
Quite an interesting idea. Let's get it on paper and discuss it over some sake later. Replied Onoki. The fight had begun and Kurotsuchi was dodging around Chojuro's attacks. She had prepared to fight against swords for most of the month by sparring against a Naruto clone. Naruto was far faster and more graceful than Chojuro. She used a flash tag Naruto had given her to buy some space. The stunned and partially blinded Chojuro lost sight of his opponent. He saw her coming to attack him with a lava-coated fist to attack him. Chojuro channeled chakra to Haramkare and extended it into a bat of chakra. When he hit the clone, it melted into a pool of lava around the chakra construct. Kurotsuchi appeared behind Chojuro from beneath the ground. Chojuro's arms were still extended in the swing and Kurotsuchi had a kunai to his neck. Winner, Kurotsuchi of Iwaga Corps. Hayate's voice echoed across the stadium. A polite applause followed the good fight. Sasuke Uchiha and Haku Momochi, please come to the field. Up in the cage box, Onoki had just finished doting on his granddaughter. May conceded, it was a good fight, Onoki Dono. She earned my gratitude for not taking young Chojuro's life. Zabuza, please step up the training regimen for the future swordsman. He left me wanting, so I expect you to make up for it. The playful and flirtatious tone earned sweat drops from the other cage. Sasuke was excited. He had seen Haku's match and witnessed her power. Itachi took the whole month to train him. His training focused on agility, which combined with the gravity seals, produced a monstrous improvement of his speed. While his eyes could track Haku in her mirrors, he doubted if his body could keep up. He wanted to prove himself to this foe that Naruto had already bested. It was important to him to take this step forward to join Naruto in pursuit of the orange mask. After Hayate started the fight, Sasuke took off and appeared in front of Haku. Haku could keep up with his speed, but Sasuke had more power behind each hit. Kunai's are heavier and denser than her senbone. Therefore, she was steadily losing the battle blow by blow. She finally caught one of Sasuke's hands and forced him to drop his kunai. She blocked his knee strike with her knee while going through one-handed seals. Everyone was stunned to see a Janan working with one-handed seals. This was a high-level technique that Fujoni never mastered. Sasuke was too stunned to react to Haku turning into ice and starting to cover his right arm. It was then that Sasuke was in trouble, immobilized by the ice clone, Sasuke could not escape the crystal ice mirrors technique before it had completely surrounded him. The real Haku appeared in all 20 mirrors. Sasuke had his Sharingan activated and could tell that this jutsu took a lot of chakra. He was dodging volleys of senbone needles when he heard Hyaten, Violent Blizzard. One of the mirrors turned into snow and ice shards that flew throughout the dome. Sasuke put up a desperate defense by blowing out great fireballs to melt the snow. His desperate tactic eventually worked leaving both contestants drained. Sasuke had cuts all over him trickling blood, nothing too deep but it took a heavy toll on him. Meanwhile, Haku was panting from her overuse of chakra. Sasuke saw the mirrors weakening and took a deep breath Katan, flamethrower jutsu. He concentrated the beam of fire on one of the mirrors nearest him. He maintained the technique until three of Haku's ice mirrors shattered. She didn't have enough chakra to reform them, so Sasuke was able to escape. Sasuke paid for his escape by catching three senbone needles to his back. The fight in the center of the stadium reset to the roars of the crowd. Sasuke was heavily injured and quite exhausted. He had yet to land a quality strike on his opponent. He saw Haku stumble for a brief step before looking up to ascertain Sasuke's position. Her eyes met his for a brief moment, but that was all it took. Sasuke put her into a hellviewing genjutsu. While Haku was stuck in the genjutsu, he used his top speed to take her back and put a kunai to her neck. When Haku broke out of the illusion she took in her position. Proctor, I forfeit, Haku said in a dejected voice. Winner, Sasuke Uchiha, said Hayate while raising Sasuke's right hand. The stadium erupted in cheers for Sasuke. Strangely, the Kaze Kage could be seen giving a polite golf clap for the Uchiha. Hiruzen flashed some hand seals to Jiraiya, Sasuke. Potential. Target. Get. Hawk. Jiraiya excused himself to go to the restroom and alerted Hawk of the Hokaye's suspicions. Hawk told Jiraiya he had Sasuke covered before Jiraiya returned to his post. The fourth match between Samui and Tamari was a battle of opposites. Samui generally preferred close-range fighting with her katana. Her opponent was a long-range wind fighter, so Samui had to close the distance fast. Tamari floated down to the stadium on her fan with a cocky smirk plastered on her face. She had her fan open slightly so one purple moon could be seen on the inside of her fan. As soon as Hayate opened the match, Tamari launched a futon, wind gale at Samui. 
Samui answered this by using Shunshine to dodge the gale to the left. She flew through hand signs and whispered Raten, lightning beast tracking. A wolf made of lightning took shape from the lightning chakra in her hands and charged at Tamari. Tamari knew lightning beat wind, so she ran from the lightning beast that was now chasing after her. This particular jutsu wasn't that strong, but it locked on to an opponent's chakra signature and ran at them until it hit something. Tamari dodged away from the lightning beast three times before she was able to dispel it with a couple kunai. However, Samui used this distraction to close the distance. By the time Tamari realized it, Samui was two paces away already swinging her sword. The sword's edge had a blue hue to it, and it was sparking. Tamari closed her fan and held it perpendicular to block Samui's horizontal slash. She wasn't ready for the sword to glide through the thick metal of her battle fan as if it were hot butter. Tamari was left stunned, holding the two separate pieces of her battle fan as Samui held her blade an inch from her neck. The shocking sensation she could feel from sparks of electricity quickly encouraged her to surrender. Hayate called the match and Tamari fell to her knees. She had never been so soundly beaten before. And what the hell is with that sword? I have faced lightning users before, but nothing has ever gotten through my battle fan. Shit, what am I going to do during the invasion? Well, shit. Were the thoughts racing through Tamari's head as Samui walked off the battlefield. That is quite the exceptional talent you have there, Rakage Dono. She had a battle plan and completely outplayed her opponent. Hiruzen added a slightly playful tone to his voice to Ega Rochimaru on. Why, thank you, Hokage Dono. It is always nice to get a compliment from one hailed as the god of shinobi. I must admit it is good to see the fire in your eyes again. Came the Rakage's good-humored reply. Well, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel, Rakage Dono. Since I am on my way out, how much would any of you give for the secret to defeating paperwork? I will admit it is an Uzumaki original jutsu that was entrusted to Konoha, but I think Naruto-kun would be willing to share it with you. Hiruzen's tone was now jubilant. The cage, Orochimaru included, surrounded him like rabid dogs surrounded the last piece of bacon. Onoki opened, Hiruzen, how long have you known of this jutsu? I thought we had a fellow bond as senior cage. Surely, you would be willing to part with this secret of yours. The desperation in his tone would be something Hiruzen would never forget. The rakage cut in, whatever the old fence sitter offers, I will double it. Hokage Dono, please. It is the bane of my existence. I simply wish to train more to keep this old body strong. May added her petition. It was much easier when I was simply fighting the rebellion. All of the cleanup and reform paperwork is drowning me. It is one of the main reasons I came here and left Ao in charge, I will offer one of the seven swords as payment. Orochimaru may be a rogue ninja, but he still had all of the paperwork that being the cage of Odogakor produced. It had cut into his experimenting significantly. Hell, he would call off the invasion for this secret alone. Hiruzen, surely you would be willing to share this secret with an ally? The Hokage, Jiraiya and Tsunade all laughed gleefully. It was so simple, yet due to its simplicity, nobody thought it could solve the age-old problem of paperwork. I will leave negotiations on this topic to Naruto-kun, since he is my heir apparent. I am sure that he would be willing to part with it, but what you offer him is up to you. All the cage settled down at this. The old monkey had just played them. They didn't even realize that Kuji had forfeited his match against Gara. Flashback, three days ago. Naruto walked up to the Akimichi household around dinner time with Q by his side. Kuza answered the door after he knocked. He gave Naruto a jovial greeting and a pat on the back before inviting him in for dinner. Naruto had visited the Akimichi about once a month to bond and learn more about the nutrition requirements of the Akimichi. Naruto thought that they were an unappreciated resource in the village and wanted to use them to improve training regiments and the overall quality of Konoha Shinobi. Kuzo was more than willing to talk to his old friend's son, which is why he was so caught off guard by Naruto's serious mood. Naruto sat with Q at the Akimichi table, and they were joined by Kuzo, Kuji, and Shiru, once she had served the food. They ate in peace, but everyone noticed the difference in Naruto's demeanor. Naruto knew to never bring negative news to an Akimichi before they ate, so he did his best to enjoy the meal. After all parties had finished the main course and Chiru was serving some key lime pie, Kuza addressed Naruto. Okay, Naruto-kun. Thanks for letting us eat in peace, but now it is bothering me, what has you down, my boy? The normally cheery face had a battle-hardened seriousness on it. Kuza-sama, you heard the news from Shukaku today, correct? At Kuza's nod, he continued. Well, part of that is that Gara is the Jinchuriki of the Aichibi, Shukaku. To make matters worse, 
His seal is so poorly done that there is almost no barrier between human and bijou. Q cut in here. My brother has always been bloodthirsty, but this is the craziest I have seen him. I have grown to care for my kit's friends and wish to warn you. Brother? Kuji asked. Yeah, Kuji. Please, don't freak out. I plan on revoking the Hokaye's edict anyway. I am the Jin Churiki of the nine-tailed fox, QB. He was sealed into me on the day of my birth. Naruto paused here taking in Kuji's stunned expression and just decided to rip the bandage off quickly. Q is actually the QB freed by a jutsu I created. Kuza, already being in the know, put a big hand on Kuji's shoulder. Son, I know this is a lot to take in, but you must accept there is a lot you don't know. I will leave the rest to Naruto to reveal to you in time. Kuji's head had turned and gotten stuck looking into Q's eyes. Q met his gobsmacked expression with a playful gaze and smirk on his lips. Look, Kuji. You can digest that later. Q has been my friend and partner since a little after I turned eight. If it means anything to you, know that I trust him with my life. I came here today to warn you about Gara. I do not doubt your strength, but I would ask you to consider forfeiting. I do not wish to see you get hurt or die unnecessarily. Know that I have a plan to deal with it when the time comes. That is all we wanted to say. Thank you for a wonderful dinner. Q and Naruto left the Akimichi household with the thanks of Kuza and Chiru for looking out for their boy. Flashback end. Returning to the stadium, Hayate announced that there would be a 20-minute intermission followed by a display for Lord Jiraiya. The 20 minutes came and went, and Jiraiya jumped from the roof of the stadium while performing a summoning jutsu. Three giant battle toads appeared, barely fitting into the center of the arena. Jiraiya stood on the head of Gamabanta and addressed the stadium. Ladies and gentlemen, many of you have heard of the gallant Jiraiya and may have heard stories of my womanizing ways. Many more of you may have read my books. I wanted to share something with all of you. Eight years ago, my life changed. Many of you noticed my absence from bathhouses and brothels. The audience chuckled at this. I credit this to the love of my life, Tsunade Senju. This wonderful woman always had my heart in the palm of her hands, and eight years ago she gave me a chance. I thank Kemi every day for this. You all know of her beauty and skill in the medical field. What you don't know is that she has the biggest heart hidden behind that beautiful Kemi blessed bust of hers. Whistles and cheers met this statement. Jiraiya continued, getting down on one knee. The toads mirrored him and dropped to a knee and bowed their heads to Tsunade, who was now standing over the rail of the cage box, clutching her chest. Tsunade sends you, I promise to love and cherish you for the rest of my days. I swear off all other women and to hold you close every night I can. Will you do me the honor of becoming my wife? Tsunade jumped out onto Bunta's head, tears streaming in her wake, leaving a glistening path. She landed and hugged Jiraiya, completely ignoring the massive diamond ring. Yes, it took you long enough, Yubaka. She said yes, yelled an ecstatic Jiraiya. The toads let out shouts of joy as they stood. The women of the audience were blown away by the adorable display. Every single girlfriend looked at their men wishing for something as romantic as this. The guys were focused on cheering for the toad Sanin. Orochimaru hissed a bit in jealousy. He always had a thing for Tsunade, but his experiments were more important. As they cleared the field in giant puffs of smoke Hiruzen stood and addressed the crown again. It is a joyous day for fire country. Let's give the newly engaged couple a round of applause. The Hokage waited for the applause to die down. Without further ado, let's being the second round of the tuning exams. Kurotsuchi jumped down onto the field with Naruto. They gave each other and chased kiss, earning more catcalls from the crowd. They wished each other good luck and took their positions. Hiruzen and Onoki sat forward in their chairs. Onoki had no delusions his granddaughter would win, but he was hoping for a good fight. Hayate began the match and the two lunged at each other with smiles on their faces. Naruto started by performing a blunting jutsu on his blade. This surrounded the blade with a small cushion of air. Preventing it from being lethal, for the most part. He started with a swift horizontal strike at her midsection, which she promptly jumped over, spinning over his head and lashing out with a kick. Naruto casually moved the head out of her foot's path as she sailed over him. Naruto wanted to give her a chance to show off a bit, so he didn't take advantage of the obvious opening. She landed ten feet away from Naruto and turned to see him, smiling that adorable smile of his. When he raised his arm and did a come get some motion with his fingers, she was back at him. She launched a Doton, earth spike jutsu at him. Three rows of five foot tall spikes rapidly made their way toward Naruto. Naruto created two clones to his left and right, then jumped in the air. Kurotsuchi spit a series of lava balls at the airborne Naruto. There was a brief shimmer and a Naruto clone popped out of existence. 
using substitution with his clones is practically cheating. Before she knew it, she was wrapped in a hug from behind and Naruto placed a kiss on her cheek before ducking under an elbow that was swung at his head. Naruto launched back into a series of backflips before he landed holding the bird seal. A massive gust of wind kicked up sand throughout the whole arena. Naruto's futon, great breakthrough was so strong it could be classified as an A-rank jutsu. Kurotsuchi flipped two hand signs and spit out a mud wall that shielded her from the wind blast. She immediately began a long series of hand signs and placed her hands on the ground, whispering Yotun, Great Volcano Jutsu. The ground shook under Naruto and he knew he may be in trouble here. Without waiting for the results, Naruto substituted with his clone hidden in the tree. A 20-foot tall volcano sprouted out of the ground, spitting lava. The whole arena grew noticeably hotter. Naruto's clone had said fuck this and dispelled before the heat could hit it. The middle of the arena was now coated in lava. Naruto let out a low whistle in appreciation for the jutsu at the panting Kurotsuchi. She was standing near the lava's edge, and her head swiveled in his direction when she heard the whistle. Naruto took full advantage of her momentary fatigue and distraction to shunshine behind her. He once again wrapped her up, but in a full Nelson this time. Kurotsuchi fell back on top of him as her legs were forced to separate and give out. After whispering good fight, sweetheart into her ear, Kurotsuchi called out that she admitted defeat. Naruto was announced the winner. Naruto transitioned from a full Nelson to just wrapping his arms around her midsection. A blushing Kurotsuchi brought an elbow into his gut and whispered, Not now, Baka. Naruto smiled and kipped up on his feet. The two left the arena together, holding hands. Onoki was proud of the display Kurotsuchi put on, even though the blonde brat was playing with her. He knew Naruto's skill level and felt no shame. He was also happy to see them getting along so well. It was a good sign for things to come. Well, I will have to beat some humility into that boy of yours, Hokage Dono. I am grateful that it ended without Kuro-chan getting hurt though. It was all in good fun, Onoki. I am glad to see how close they have gotten over this month. Young love is such a beautiful thing, Hiruzen said with a big smile on his face. I do hope there is room left in his heart for Haku-chan. Zabuza, you should be taking notes, you stubbly oaf. Zabuza grunted at May's double low blow. He still didn't think the Gaki deserved Haku and now his girlfriend was comparing her to some brat. Oh, Zabuza couldn't wait to fight the damn Gaki. Orochimaru was furious. The leaders of four villages were sitting and chatting like time old friends. He knew this probably ruined his plans. The other cage would definitely interfere at this rate. However, he had his trump cards. He just needs to kill the old monkey and escape. It was far too late to call off the invasion. If he had time, he should kill the damn brat while he is at it. This kid is far too strong and would only get stronger with age. Sasuke and Samui were walking onto the field. Sasuke was clearly still tired from his chakra intensive fight with Haku. Samui approached in a very slow and cool pace. Both contestants nodded at Hayate and a brilliant Kenjutsu battle followed. The audience really got into it when both contestants sheathed their swords and lightning chakra. However, the fight changed when Samui's storm's edge had finally sliced through Sasuke's sword. When it came to a blade coated in lightning chakra, penetration was the specialty of the lightning element. The superior quality of the Uzumaki sword helped Samui achieve victory. The fight ended when Sasuke stumbled backward to avoid Samui's blade after his katana snapped. Samui held her blade over the Uchiha's heart and got him to surrender. She offered him a hand up after Hayate called the fight. Where did you get that blade, Samui-san? Sasuke asked with more than a little jealousy. It was a gift from Ruto. He said it was one of his clan swords. Its name is Storm's Edge. She held her blade in its sheath for him to inspect as they walked back to the finalist box. Sasuke unsheathed the blade and couldn't help the fit of jealousy. The edge of the blade was in perfect condition, not a single nick on it. He couldn't help the fit of jealousy and rage that swept over him. As they walked into the box, he held up the blade and called out to Naruto. Oi, Ruto, what the hell man? I am one of your best friends and I don't get anything while you give this treasure to your girlfriend. What the hell, bro? Sasuke indignant voice carried out past the finalist box and could be heard by the rookies. Naruto just walked up to Samui, snaked his arms around her waist and gave her a passionate kiss. You see, bro. You don't do that for me. It is that simple. I tell you what, stop by the compound and I will hook you up, but don't you have some family blades handed down through the Uchiha? Ruto, she just sliced through one of those blades like it was nothing. There isn't even a nick on her sword. Sasuke's indignant voice once again carried to the rookies. Naruto just rubbed the back of his neck and smiled. 
That's the power of Fuenjutsu, bud. The blade takes her chakra to repair the edge. Come on and enjoy the rest of the matches. Sasuke calmed down and took his seat. Naruto went back to his seat next to Kurotsuchi and Samui took the one to his other side. The thruple held hands and had content looks on their faces. Then Naruto realized that the next match was Gara vs Shino. He jumped over to Shino and whispered something in his ear. Shino nodded before jumping down to the field. The fight between Gara and Shino was interesting. Shino kept dodging Gara's sand attacks. He hit his bugs in Gara's sand and was able to drain a considerable chunk of his chakra. Unfortunately, he now knew that he was up against a Jinchuriki, so that wouldn't win him the fight. After Gara launched a tidal wave of sand at Shino, Shino jumped to the far wall and called out to the Proctor. Proctor, I forfeit. There is no way for me to win against this opponent, Shino yelled in the loudest voice anyone had ever heard him use. He was forced to dodge multiple sand javelin as he was saying this. Hayate jumped in front of Gara and announced him the winner. Gara was beyond infuriated. He hadn't gotten to kill a single person. Shukaku was in his head, acting as his mother, demanding blood. Hayate called out and addressed the crowd. There will be a 10 minute break before a three way battle for will determine the winner of the exams. Gara barely reeled in his bloodlust. He jumped up to the finalist box and said, Let's go, Uzumaki. Mother wants your blood. Um, there is a 10 minute break, dipshit. Was Naruto's eloquent response. He wanted to talk to Samui. He got her to agree to withdraw. She knew Gara was a Jinchuriki and Naruto just told her about the expected invasion. She didn't want to get in Naruto's way, and she wanted to conserve strength for the invasion. Naruto created a clone that flashed into the Hokage's box. Pardon my intrusion, honorable cage. I must speak with Hokage-sama, he said while bowing low to show respect. Hiruzen nodded and took Naruto into a private conference room that was attached to the cage box. He put his hands on the wall and activated a strong privacy seal. What is it, Naruto-kun? Hiruzen asked in a concerned voice. Well, I am sure you know, the Kaze Kage is Orochimaru. I think Gara is the trigger. I plan on neutralizing him before he explodes. I want to seal his bijou's chakra. If that doesn't work, I will knock him out the old-fashioned way. Since the Kaze Kage is likely dead, it shouldn't cause an international incident. Hiruzen was always blown away by the serious version of Naruto. He was impressed that the boy would so readily step up to a Jinchuriki. What would you like me to do? Asked Hiruzen, matching Naruto's seriousness. Keep everyone out of my way. Keep your guard up and don't let the snake get you in a one-on-one. -on -one. Please take this kunai as well. I have a feeling I may need to join your fight. If the snake or anyone else tries to prevent me from sealing Gara, please stop them. It will take unbroken concentration for this to work. Hiruzen took the kunai from Naruto and stowed it under his robes. He would put the Anbu and Jonin on high alert. What of Samui-chan? I have explained things to her, and she will withdraw. Okay, Gigi, see you on the other side. If anything happens to me, I love you. Thank you for all you have done for me. He wrapped Hiruzen in a heartwarming hug, which the Hokage returned. This one moment was more than enough payment for the near heart attacks this blonde caused him. Do be safe, my boy. I will see you when this is over. Have faith in your cage. Hiruzen's calm voice put Naruto at ease as he left the room and jumped from the booth down to the field. He recalled Q into the seal for this fight, knowing he would need his partner's help to get this done right. Samui leaned out of the finalist box and announced her withdrawal, to the disappointment of the crowd. Throughout the crowd, Jonin were receiving a telecommunication from Inoiki, who was relaying the Hokaye's orders. Their postures all straightened, and they became alert. Most of them were alerting the junior allied shinobi next to them in hushed tones. Gara appeared in the arena in front of Naruto by San Shunshine. The bloodlust he radiated hung thick in the air. All right, Kit. It is time to deal with my brother. I have talked to Yugito, and they will help deal with the invasion. If things spiral out of control, use the summoning jutsu. I sent my subordinate back yesterday and placed them on high alert. They will answer my call. And don't forget, Kit. I am here for you. Kurama felt his partner relax internally at this statement. Sage, he really had fallen under this brat's spell. Thanks, Q. I may use your chakra in the match, but I doubt it. However, I will not pull any punches in the invasion. I have deactivated all restrictive seals. All that's left is to kick some ass. Gotta go. He ended abruptly at the match started. Naruto was forced to dodge sand spikes that were appearing all over the ground. Okay, first we have to neutralize his sand and bypass his defenses. 
Naruto flashed three seals and called out Raiden, thunderclap. He charged both of his hands with lightning chakra and clapped his hands together. A thick bolt of lightning lance toward the Jinchuriki and penetrated the sand wall Gara had put up. The lightning bolt made contact with Gara's secondary defense and penetrated it, throwing Gara backwards. Gara flew and tumbled for nearly 20 feet. The audience gasped as he struggled to get back up. Naruto dashed over to him in a blonde blur and smashed his fist into the scorch mark on Gara's chest. Thanks to Naruto's version of Tsunade's super strength technique, Gara went sailing into the wall of the stands with a loud crash. The spider web cracks were nearly 30 feet in diameter, centered around a redhead that was rapidly losing his shit. Naruto didn't want to get the fans involved, so he used Shunshine to get near Gara and drag him out of the wall before he could begin transforming. Naruto felt the rise of Bijou Chakra and knew he had to make his move. He grabbed Gara's arm and chucked him back into the center of the arena before the sand could surround his arm. Gara landed in a heap and sand was rushing all around him. Naruto created eight shadow clone captains that sprang into a hexagonal position around Gara. They each flashed through a sequence of hand seals and called out Uzumaki Fun, Raiden, Electric Barrier A blue dome of electric chakra surrounded the now-formed ball of sand. Kurama warned Naruto that this was how Gara transitioned to his bijou state. When Orochimaru saw the barrier go up around the Jinchuriki, he panicked. He gave his signal to begin the invasion. His two guards split into four and threw smoke bombs at the cage's feet. This was the backup signal for the invasion, since Kabuto had been captured. Orochimaru attempted to grab Hiruzen by the throat, but the cage countered Orochimaru's lunge and threw him into the stadium. Orochimaru was going to crash into the electric barrier before he used Kawarimi to substitute with an unlucky subordinate. Said subordinate crashed into the barrier and was treated to a shock like a bug tempted into a bug zapper, Sarishino. Orochimaru was now in the base of the arena, surrounded by Jiraiya, Tsunade, Hiruzen and eight Naruto clones. He didn't have time to escape before the clones called our Uzumaki Fun, Raiden, Electric Barrier. This barrier encased the whole arena, with Naruto's clones positioned inside the barrier. The barrier containing Gara had shrunk and begun electrocuting the crazy redhead. The original Naruto was preparing a ceiling circle. Orochimaru attempted to get to the down Jinchuriki but was kicked backward by Jiraiya into the corner of the arena. Shit, fuck, what the fuck happened? Thought Orochimaru. He briefly looked to see his sound four engaging with Anbu squads. Jonin ninja around the stadium were dealing with enemy ninja while the Chunin were leading Janan and escorting the dignitaries and civilians. He was in trouble. Without killing the blonde, he wouldn't be able to get out of this barrier. He could try killing the clones, but he still has to get through his old team. He was panicking. He needed to create some space and summon his trump card. Meanwhile, Naruto felt Gara go unconscious from the pain and the subsequent massive spike of Shukaku's chakra. He finished applying the Bijou suppressing seal to the lightning barrier that was containing Shukaku. Naruto could see Tamari and Konkuro looking at him through the barrier with pleading eyes. They then were forced to turn around and fight Kurotsuchi and Samui. Naruto returned to the task at hand and called on Q's chakra to forcibly restrain Shukaku's chakra. Kit, something isn't right with my brother. There is another presence. It is the soul of some old priest that forced its way into the seal. Thinking quickly, Naruto said, Okay, Q. That seal should give us a couple minutes. The barrier is consistently weakening Shukaku. For now, we need him out of the picture. I will work on a solution for the priest problem later. We cannot reinforce his seal with that priest in there. I think that is what's driving your brother up the wall. Gotcha, Kit, the hard way it is. Kurama pumped as much of his chakra into Naruto as the boy could tolerate. He made sure to keep topping off his reserves. The kid would have one hell of a chakra hangover, but that is a tomorrow problem. Naruto felt the decrease in Shukaku's presence and let down the barrier. He placed a freshly written chakra suppression seal on the back of Gara's neck. The sand offered no resistance anymore and the seal phased into Gara's skin. The seal was written in an ink that contained his blood that was infused with Kurama's chakra. It is quite possibly the most powerful fuinjutsu medium in the world at this time. With the seal applied, Naruto channeled Q's chakra into the seal. Shukaku and Gara's chakra could no longer be felt. In a flash of yellow, Naruto took Gara to his father's training room. He left a clone to draw some more suppression seals on the unconscious Jinchuriki and flashed back into the stadium to the marker on Kurotsuchi's necklace. He arrived to see a one-sided battle. Kuro had melted Konkuro's puppet completely and was in the middle of a beatdown. Samui continued her fight from earlier and found much less resistance. Without her big fan, Tamari's wind jutsu were far less potent. 
Naruto appeared behind Tamari and applied a paralysis tag to her back. As she locked up, he did the same to Kan Kuro, who didn't even see him move. Kuro-chan and Samui-chan, these guys are political prisoners. They are the old Kazekage's children. He is most likely dead, but I want you to take them to the Reikage and Suchikage. Hand them off and return to your teams. The Reikage and Suchikage are holding the arena down. They should be able to secure them, Naruto said in a hurried but serious voice. Before they could even say, be safe, Naruto-kun he had disappeared. They both whispered it anyway before moving to comply with his orders. Naruto appeared on the top of the arena and took in the situation. The arena was mostly under control, but there was still a Rochimaru to deal with. There was a massive three-headed snake wreaking havoc in the front of the village. Two other massive snakes were approaching the village from behind it. You ready to go, Kurama? Naruto pulled on Kurama's chakra and entered his three-tailed cloak. He then used that chakra in a summoning jutsu. Kurama appeared at the edge of the arena, along with twenty foxes that were the size of lions. Kurama let out a roar and two seven-tailed foxes, about a third of his size, appeared beside him. He gave them orders to purge the village of any ninja with a sound or sand headband. Then he and the two seven-tailed foxes made their way to the front of the village, being careful not to destroy too much on their way or step on any puny humans. Upon hearing Kurama's roar, the whole village froze in fear. Then, ninja around Konoha bore witness to two more massive fox summons and a horde of battle foxes. The chaos that followed was purely one-sided. Konoha suffered its losses, but the foxes changed the tide of the battle entirely. The order went out to focus on the snakes and auto ninja. The foxes were called friendlies. Inoiki made this order clear through telepathic communication with the Jonin squad leader. Kurama was so happy to be summoned out of his container. The looks on the Mitsak's faces were hilarious. He was careful not to cause too much damage, but as he got to the snake summon, he lashed out with three tails. The gust of wind that followed the collision of his tails with the massive snake flattened the forest for 200 meters beyond Konoha's walls. The horde of sand shinobi that were following the snake summons into the village were forced to attempt to take cover. Most of the 200 strong forces were okay, but the massive snake summon smashed 20 or so sand shinobi into bloody smears. The massive snake was launched into the recently flattened forest. The fox could be heard laughing as his sharp claws severed the center snake's head. The rest of the summon fight was a bloodbath. Kurama's teeth sunk into the throat of the left head. With a deep, guttural and rumbling growl, Kurama's teeth clicked together in a massive spray of blood. The final head was wrapped in Kurama's tail and the snake's head rolled over the edge of the tail in the final massive spray of blood. The headless body writhed for a while after and produced tremors, but it was short-lived. Kurama loved this kit, but nothing beat his fox form being covered in blood. The sand shinobi fled from Kurama and reassembled in the woods where they called a hasty retreat. The two seven-tailed fox summons finished their own fights. The snake summons were left in bloody messes, unable to retreat to their summon realm. The two massive kitsune then folded down on their massive front legs and bowed their heads to Kurama. It is good to fight alongside you again, Kurama Dono. Pardon my rudeness, but where have you been? Ah, Khaleesi, it is good to see you again. It is a long story. I will bring our new summoner to the woods soon and explain the situation. For right now, know that there are complicating factors. Your assistance is no longer required, as we would do more damage than good. The other fox spoke. Kurama Dono, we thought we lost you to the Sinigami. I am relieved to see you again. We will await you in the woods. Thank you, Fenric. Tell the clan I look forward to seeing them. Kurama's short reply was enough for Fenric, who was his right-hand fox back in the day. All three massive fox summons disappeared in puffs of smoke, leaving a massive heap of snake and blood in their wake. Kuza, in his giant form, saw all of this take place. His chin was hanging open and a massive glob of saliva crashed down next to an equally stunned Shukaku. The splash of his friend's saliva brought him out of his trance with a resounding call of troublesome. The Jinan squads were responsible for evacuating the civilians and protecting the bunkers and hospital. Team 7 and 8 evacuated the academy students through the tunnels under the academy. Teams 9 and 10 joined a protective perimeter around the hospital. They each had to deal with two squads of auto shinobi. Luckily, they all came out alive. Sasuke suffered from a kunai lodged in his left shoulder blade. He was missing the constant feeling of confidence that Naruto always provided Team 7. Back in the stadium, Naruto saw that most enemy ninja were being dealt with. He looked into the barrier and saw Orochimaru being put to the test by three people he loved the most in this world. Anko appeared behind him and wrapped her arms around him. He leaned back into her embrace, 
noticing the strong smell of blood that was covering her. Hmm. I missed you, Ruto-kun. You know you scared everyone shitless with that stunt you pulled. Naruto chuckled. I sure did, Hebi Haim. Kurama is doing his thing and I trust him. All that's left for me is to deal with this snake. I am going to reinforce the barrier to make sure he can't get away. Then I am going to help Gigi, Buchan and Kyofu. Take me with you, Anko demanded with a firm look on her face. Naruto sighed. He was reluctant to let the snake near his heavy heim. Anko shook his shoulders. Ruto, I am serious. No sex for a month if you do this without me. Fine, fine, he said in a reluctant tone that abated when she planted a passionate, blood-covered kiss on his lips. Naruto wiped off the foreign blood and summoned eight more clones to take up positions around the barrier. They all put their hands on the barrier and channeled chakra. Naruto felt Kurama dispel and re-enter his mind. Have a good fight, Kurama? Naruto could practically feel Kurama smirk. Sure thing, kid. The foxes are getting restless. We will need to go visit them soon. Gotcha, Q. We need to wrap this up first. I don't like the feeling of the chakra coming from inside the barrier. How much more of your chakra can I take today? I don't know, kid. That summoning stunt put a strain on your coils. Give me a minute and maybe you can take a tail. Don't push it though. Naruto nodded internally to Kurama before turning to Anko and holding out his hand. Don't make me regret this, Anko-chan. His voice had a bit of pleading in it. She took his hand with a smile and the couple disappeared in a yellow flash. Naruto appeared inside the barrier and saw two coffins. The third coffin had been smashed by Tsunade. The coffins had first second and fourth on their fronts. Naruto knew this was nothing good. At least Jiraiya, Tsunade and Hiruzen look okay. The signs of their fight littered the area. Naruto saw the coffins drop their lids and immediately reach into his pouch. As the coffin's lids hit the ground, Naruto appeared in front of the coffins and applied chakra suppression seals to the two bodies and activated them. He received a powerful kick in his chest that shattered his third and fourth rib on his right side. Before Orochimaru could remove the tags, Hiruzen performed a combination jutsu with Jiraiya. Jiraiya was spitting a geyser of toad oil at the snake in his two coffins. Hiruzen lit it up with a flame head shaped like a dragon. The ensuing explosion was massive, and the heat was contained inside the barrier. Orochimaru hissed in frustration. That is when he noticed Anko and Tsunade attacking from his flanks. Anko managed to wrap him up in snakes long enough for Tsunade to land a world-shattering punch to Orochimaru's chest. His body went flying into the barrier, where a significant electric shock sent him flying back to the ground with his whole body smoking. On the ground, Orochimaru began to emerge from the mouth of his old body. The group was no longer stunned by the grotesque display. It was his third time using it already. A group of twenty shadow clones appeared, ten of them called out Katan, Dragon Flame Bullet while another ten used Futon, Great Breakthrough. The original Naruto channeled Chakra to shape the collaboration jutsu and said collaboration jutsu, Kitsune Firestorm. The raging inferno encircled the newly emerged Orochimaru. The group could hear his screams of pain and frustration inside the firestorm. When Naruto released the jutsu, nobody was ready for a big white snake with the head of Orochimaru to spring forth from the flames. The snake latched itself around Anko and tried to swallow her. Naruto panicked and forced a kawarimi with Anko. He felt the snake trying to take possession of his body. Kurama's chakra flared to life around Naruto in a one-tailed cloak and the snake slithered away from Naruto, badly burnt by the corrosive chakra. The snake then caught Hiruzen's crushing blow with Enma, the Monkey King, in his adamantine staff form. Anko jumped to her old master's writhing snake form and began stabbing it repeatedly with dual kunai, coating her entire body in the snake's blood. The crumpled heap of snakes lay there, motionless, bloody and ripped apart. The group encircled the snakes and Anko threw one of her kunai to nail the one, tiny, white snake that was fleeing. It was the last remnant of chakra Rochimaru possessed. Once Naruto had recovered from his near-possession experience and thanked Kurama, he sealed the snakes up into several different scrolls. He then incinerated the scrolls with a fire jutsu. Hiruzen breathed out a heavy sigh. That chapter is finally over. Thank Kami. Jiraiya walked over and put his massive hand on Hiruzen's shoulder. Tsunade leaned into Hiruzen and wrapped him in a loose hug. It's finally over, sensei. They both said in a soft and comforting tone. Anko had wrapped Naruto in a hug and was crying. Naruto was rubbing the back of her head in a comforting motion. Anko was going through a state of shock. The Orochimaru chapter of her life had been hanging over her for nine long years. She could finally start anew, with this wonderful man that was holding her in his arms.
Naruto stood there comforting Anko for nearly five minutes as the old team Haruzen got the closure they needed as well. Finally, Naruto dropped the barrier so they could begin to take stock of the situation. Naruto had nearly burnt out his chakra coils. Kurama and Tsunade warned him not to use chakra for the next couple of days and Anko volunteered to take him to the Namikaze compound while Jiraiya, Tsunade and the Hokage dealt with the aftermath and cleanup. Anko carried a worn-out Naruto through Konoha to the Namikaze compound. Most of the village was in decent shape, with small battle scars littered throughout. This was because they were heading toward the rear of the village where the damage wasn't nearly as prevalent. Pieces of smoke could be seen billowing in scattered battle sites throughout the village. The couple gained their fair share of hoots, hollers and catcalls. They were glad to see spirits were still high, despite the attempted invasion. Anko finally got to the Namikaze compound and carried Naruto to his bathroom. The two stripped after Anko drew up a warm bath. Naruto got into the tub first with Anko sitting in front of him. She lay back onto his chest as he wrapped his arms around her front. The two fell asleep in each other's arms in the bathtub. Later that night, Jiraiya came home looking for Naruto. He wanted to check on the kid. He had never seen Naruto that burnt out before. He didn't find Naruto in his room or his father's study. He was walking past the bathroom when he heard the slight sloshing of water. Jiraiya decided to check it out and open the door. He thought he walked in on a horror scene. The bathroom looked like a double homicide had taken place. There were bloody hand marks on the wall, bloody clothes with small blood pools coming from them and the tub was filled with blood-red water. He would have panicked if he didn't see the two sleeping peacefully in the tub. Jiraiya went and fetched Tsunade so she could see the horrifically cute sight. Chapter 16 Cage Summit Although the damage to Konoha was not nearly as bad as it could have been, there was still a good amount of damage to clean up and a funeral to plan. Hiruzen was grateful for the people over at Tandi, if they hadn't broken through Kabuto's mental defenses, then Konoha would have suffered far worse. Unfortunately, the morning after the invasion, Iviki presented a report to the Hokage detailing the loss of eight Tandi members and the escape of Kabuto. There were bone shards in the bodies of the Tandi shinobi, which pointed to a nearly extinct bone bloodline. The loss of Kabuto hurt, Hiruzen didn't want that kind of enemy out there plotting. However, it was a worthy trade in return for his village still standing. Hiruzen has taken advantage of their new ally and dispatched a team of ninja to go to Wave and recruit Tazana and some builders to help with the reconstruction effort. He sent Kakashi along with Team 8 to recruit and escort the builders back to Konoha. When the ninja got there, Tazana jumped at the opportunity to repay a debt and 50 villagers volunteered to help with the effort. Team 8 was stunned to see the great Naruto bridge and Kurenai had to scold Kiba for inappropriate comments about Naruto. The villagers made it very clear that they wouldn't tolerate such comments about their hero. When Naruto regained consciousness, he found that he was in bed with Anko. Both were clothed in loose t-shirts and a pair of his boxers. He didn't think too much into it. Instead, he wrapped Anko up in his arms and placed a soft kiss on her cheek. The soft hum that escaped her lips brought happiness to Naruto. After a morning celebratory session, Anko limped downstairs behind the blonde. Tsubaki gave them a knowing smile in the kitchen and told them they were to report to the Hokage when they woke up. Tsunade and Jiraiya were already out assisting with the village repairs. They grabbed a quick breakfast and headed out. They decided to run to better survey the damage. While running, Naruto felt Kurama stir in his mind. Damage report, Q Naruto thought internally. Well, Kit, you severely strained your chakra coils. I also found out that the seal will not allow more than three tails of power out at the same time. Talk to the perverted toad about it, I think he knows something. Do not use chakra for the next two days to give your body some rest. I am going to return to napping, wake me up if anything interesting happens. Naruto gave a mental nod and completed the journey to the Hokaye's office. He could see ninja everywhere cleaning up debris. The auto ninja's corpses had been collected in a large pile on training ground 53, Naruto could smell the stench two kilometers away. The sand shinobi's corpses were in a similar pile on training ground 52. Naruto was taking it all in, when he realized he forgot something. He brought Anko to a halt and put a three-pronged kunai in her hands before giving her a kiss and flashing away. Thirty seconds later he returned with a tied-up and still unconscious Gara. They continued the trek into the Hokage Tower and were given access to the Hokage's office. When the two entered the office, Naruto saw Hiruzen, Danzo, Koharu and Homura all sitting at temporary desks doing paperwork. When Naruto walked in, he felt like he was in a miniature council room since he was surrounded by the oak desks. They all stopped what they were doing and looked up. I was wondering what happened to young Gara there. Is everything okay, Naruto-kun? 
asked Hiruzen in a tender and tired tone. Yup, Hokage-sama. After subduing Gara, I flashed him to the compound and kept him immobilized. The suppressing tag I have on him has completely severed his connection to Shukaku. However, I have not had time to analyze his seal yet. I wanted to report in and see how you wished to handle it before doing anything. Naruto's casual reply lightened the mood a bit. Very good, Naruto-kun. First, Anko, it seems T and I was hit during the invasion and Kabuto escaped. Please report in there immediately. Hiruzen's voice now had a worn edge to it. Anko nodded, gave Naruto a kiss and departed. It was then that Donzo spoke. Naruto-kun, could you please locate Gara's seal and explain to us what we are working with here? Sure thing, Donzo gi Naruto looked to the Hokage to get a brief nod before continuing. He removed Gara's shirt and located the seal over Gara's heart. He was so appalled and angry at whoever made it that it caused Kurama to stir. When Kurama took the seal in, his reaction was much the same. Hokage-sama, the seal on Gara amounts to an expanded storage seal. There is no separation of conscious, no protections from the Bijou's chakra and nothing that was made to handle power of this nature. I can only assume it was made to make Gara a ticking time bomb that the sand could drop on its enemies. Quite frankly, it boils my Uzumaki blood to see something like this. Naruto's voice rose throughout his explanation, and it gained a combative edge. No wonder the boy was so unstable. Was Koharu's useless contribution to the conversation. Indeed, can it be fixed, Naruto-kun? We are scheduling the cage summit for two days from now. I planned on allowing the Santa representative to sit in. If the seal can be fixed, that is yet another bargaining chip we will hold over them. Hiruzen's eyes were now sharp and held a calculating edge. Well, Gigi, I cannot use chakra for two days. I overdid it during the invasion a bit. I can review the Uzumaki scrolls and develop a protective seal to override the current seal without too much difficulty. Naruto's pensive voice awakened something in Danzo. Hiruzen, would it be wise to give the sand back its Jinchuriki? There are other options. We could force the boy to stay here, remove the demon and seal it into one of our own loyal ninjas or simply seal the beast away. Danzo wasn't prepared for Naruto's reaction. Danzo, you have known me for a long time now and I have shared with you much about the bijou. You would do well not to talk about them as mindless objects in my presence. I respect you, sensei, but Shukaku will not be treated like a simple possession to be passed around. Naruto's feral characteristics were emboldened, and Kurama was roaring his approval of Naruto's words. Danzo held up his hands in surrender. Naruto, my boy, forgive me. I cannot help but think coldly and logically in this situation. To not take advantage of our current position would be folly. It was Hiruzen that offered Danzo his support. Unfortunately, he is right, Naruto-kun. The sand took part in the invasion, whether they were tricked by a Rochimaru or not. I will agree that we will not remove Shukaku, but we will have to bend them over the proverbial barrel to set an example. Naruto calmed down and bowed to the Hokage. I am not against doing such a thing. I think that when Shukaku is properly sealed and the foreign element is removed from the seal, then we will gain an ally in Gara. What do you plan on demanding from the sand? The group took some time to think. It was Koharu that spoke up. Naruto-kun, I was thinking that we could round out our wind jutsu. The sand has the largest collection of them. They also have good salt and an extensive poison collection. Homura chipped in. Hiruzen adopted a wry smile. They are also the only major village you haven't courted Akunoichi from. The room erupted in a fit of chuckles. Even Danzo was shaking a bit. Naruto adopted an exasperated look. Gigi, I am already juggling four and probably soon five. I will have to inform the other girls about Haku soon, if my suspicions are correct. Can we shelve that option for now? If the sand brings it up, we can entertain the idea. However, we will try to get them to accept another clan head. I need to get a solid foundation with my girls before adding another member. The elders nodded their heads at Naruto's decision while Hiruzen let out a hearty chuckle. Very well, Naruto-kun. You go work on the seal for Gara. We will see you in two days at 11 a.m. in the council chamber. Dress up and bring your game face. Were Hiruzen's final words to Naruto for the day. Naruto left the Hokage Tower and decided to check on his friends before returning to the Namikaze compound. He strolled around the village and saw Team 9, with Lee freshly out of the hospital. He locked eyes with Neji, who was contributing to the reconstruction by Hyashi's orders. Neji gave Naruto a subtly nod before Lee took the spotlight. Oh, Naruto-kun. Your flames of youth burn brightly today. What are you doing out here on this fine day? 
Lee's exuberant voice carried and attracted the attention of Mike Guy, who promptly bounded over. Well, Lee, I wanted to walk through the village and check on my friends. How very youthful of you, Naruto-kun. Was the twin response of Guy and Lee. Well, since I have you here. I want to inform you of your command for losing our bet. You will report into Ino Yamanaka for a makeover. Furthermore, you will wear the clothes she instructs you to for the next month. No questions asked. Lee was about to object before Guy cut in. Lee Kun, we must honor our bets. It is most unyouthful to break one's word. In order to support you, I will join you in your punishment. It is my duty as your sensei. The bold proclamation carried halfway around Konoha. Little did those present know the effect this was going to have on the Konoha rumor mill. Ino was having a bad day. She hadn't seen Naruto since the start of the invasion. Her team had been on assignment since early in the morning. She was covered in dirt and dust and scratches from moving debris. Her mood did a 180 when she heard the voice of her beloved call out to her. Then she was very confused when she turned around. Walking behind Naruto was Team 9 and Lee and Guy had streams of tears falling from their faces while holding each other. Um, Ruto, what's going on? What is Team 9 doing here? Her voice was lowered, so as not to draw the attention of the crying pair. Well, Ino-chan. I need a favor and I will reward you with two dates, anything you want to do, and all expenses paid if you help me. Okay, spill it. I accept no matter what. Was Ino's excited response. She had exchanged gossip with Anko and was incredibly jealous about how far ahead Anko was in her relationship with Naruto. Not to mention, Anko made the sex sound absolutely mind-blowing. She didn't know if she was ready for that yet, but she could start with some foreplay. I need you to give Guy and Lee a makeover. You're free to express yourself with them. Here is 20,000 Rio to get them started with new wardrobes. They have to listen to your fashion sense for the whole month, no questions asked. Naruto's excited reply was caught by Shikamaru as he strolled over to the group. How did you manage that, Naruto? Shika asked in a lazy tone. I won the bet between Lee and myself for the Chunin exams. Was Naruto's simple reply. At first, Ino was daunted by the task. Then she gained a devilish grin. She wouldn't have to see those green monstrosities for a whole month. Oh, she was going to have fun with this. She instructed Guy and Lee to meet her in the market tomorrow at 9 a.m. for makeovers and shopping. They ceased their tears and gave her an enthusiastic reply. Naruto continued his journey throughout the village and checked in with all his friends and girlfriends. He found Karen assisting Tsunade in the hospital. Tsunade had taken a shine to the Uzumaki girl and taken her as a second apprentice. They exchanged warm greetings before Naruto made his way to see Sasuke. When he entered the room, he saw Mikoto and Itachi and felt Hawk's presence. He closed the door and threw up a privacy seal. Hey bro, how are you holding up? Naruto asked in a cheerful voice. HN, I would be better if they let me out of this stinking hospital. It was just a sword wound and a mild case of chakra exhaustion. He gave his exasperated reply while pointing with his left hand to his bandaged right shoulder. I am glad you're going to be okay. How did everyone else fare in the invasion? He asked the other occupants of the room. Mikito smiled warmly at him. He always reminded her of Kushina when he displayed this level of caring. Just fine, Naruto-kun. I was substituting at the academy, and we were watching the fights with the students before things went crazy. I and the other teachers dealt with a few squads of Autonin before Sasuke and his squad arrived. No deaths and only a few casualties. Itachi spoke in his monotone voice. I led the Anbu squads and drove out the Auto Ninja. Even though there were nearly 1,000 enemies, they were pathetic. We suffered minimal losses. You should know, Kuma perished. His funeral is tomorrow night. Naruto's face fell. Kuma was a close friend of his and Naruto hadn't seen the gentle giant since the Mizuki incident. I will be there, Itachi. Congratulations on your promotion to Anbu commander by the way. He got a simple nod in response. Hawk wrapped an arm around Naruto. Speaking of promotions, oh Toto. I think we should all be congratulating you, Mr. Heir Apparent. Naruto shrugged off his arm and rounded on him. Jabbing his fist into Hawk's shoulder. Look here, Shisui. If you start treating me any different, I will pound you into next week. That being said, I am glad to see you well. Any sign of the orange mask during the invasion? The room's temperature fell, and the air grew deadly still. No. Was the one-word reply of Shisui and Itachi. Okay, we'll keep your eye out for him. There is no way he will ignore this chaos. I doubt he will ignore the summit coming up either. I am working on a seal to neutralize his space-time technique, but I have a way to go. 
It is completely experimental at this point. Let us know if we can help you with that, Naruto-kun. You know what, Shisui? You can. I gave Sasuke my intro to Fuenjutsu. Stop by the compound and grab the Fuenjutsu level 1 to 5. Work on that. I want to get Konoha to understand the importance of the art, and the Uchiha clan would be a great start. With your Sharingan you should be able to memorize the basics quickly. Naruto paused due to the loud slap that was heard. Everyone looked over to see Sasuke face palming himself. Why didn't I think of reading it with my Sharingan activated? Sasuke cried out in an exasperated tone. Not only that, Sasuke, you can use it to memorize the brush movements and kanji formula as well. Naruto chirped in a playful tone. Really, though, I want somebody I can bounce ideas off of. If you guys become proficient, it would really help me develop a new seal to deal with that orange bastard. Everyone in the room nodded their heads, even Mikado would try to take up the art. The applications of Fuenjutsu were simply too numerous to continue to ignore it. After that, Naruto said goodbye to the Uchiha and returned to his compound. Two days later, Naruto was dressed by Tsubaki, Tsunade and Hitomi into a formal kimono. It was the black and gold style of the Namikaze clan. The gold trimming provided an elegance and the gold Namikaze symbol was over his heart. On his back was a golden Uzumaki swirl that provided a backdrop to an orange rendition of the QB. The QB emblem had its tail splayed out behind it and was in the process of sideswiping with a menacing snarl on its face. Q helped with the design and was mighty proud of his likeness. After final touches were applied, Naruto departed with Tsunade to the council chamber. Naruto arrived in the chamber ten minutes early to find I, Yugito, B, Samui, Onoki, Akatsuchi, a golem guard, Kurotsuchi, Mei, Zabuza, Chojuro, Haku and a San Jonin named Baki around a circular table. All heads turned to him when he entered, and he greeted everyone before taking a seat in a chair next to the Hokage seat. The Hokage entered shortly after and opened up the conversation. My fellow cage and representatives. It is an honor to host this summit. Before we begin, I want to offer my sincere gratitude for your assistance during the invasion and in your efforts to help us clean up. He paused her to bow, Naruto stood and bowed as well with his cage. Moving on to the issue at hand, we will now address the treaties as they were written. We have modeled each of the treaties to follow the same layout, so we will start with trade agreements. Is there anyone that wishes to make changes to the trade agreements? Mei stood up. Hokage Dono, in the trade with Mist, you pledged 4 million Rio over the next 5 years to support rebuilding. We find this most generous. However, I wanted to know if timber could be included in that arrangement. Say, 2 million Rio worth over the next 10 years in exchange for another 5% off of the shipping tariffs for the agreed upon 10 year period. She sat back down and awaited his response. May Dono, I counter with 2 additional percent off of the tariffs and an equal value of fresh fish. May nodded so Haruzan continued. Very well, we will write it up. Any other concerns? No cage wanted to bring anything up at this time. Moving on to item 2, the non-aggression pact. As written, the non-aggression pact will endure for the duration of the union. Attacks by missing nin and opposing factions will not violate this pact. If foul play is suspected, the villages involved will form an investigative committee. If foul play is proven, sanctions will be imposed on the offending party by all parties linked in this agreement. I now open the floor. Onoki stood at this time. Hokage and other fellow cage, as you know, there is much resentment concerning my decision to enter this treaty. I am aware of a sizable faction that has taken root in my country to directly oppose the union of stone and leaf. I pledge to do all I can to eradicate dissenters. If you come across them, you have my full authority to deal with them as you see fit. I wanted to make this known in good faith. I stood up as well. Although the dissenters are fewer in lightning country, there are still a few who bear old grudges. I pledge the same as the Tsuchikage and would ask for the same understanding. This time, Hiruzen stood up. We all came into this knowing that the path to peace would be a difficult and bumpy path. I propose that each village set up an embassy to allow for better communication. Ambassadors from each of our villages will set up in the embassy and aid in international affairs. The ambassadors will be subject to the other country's law. If there is a supposed violation of that law, the cage will review the case in an international court of law. This will help build relations and acclimate our shinobi to working with foreign shinobi. The room took a minute to mull this over. I stood up. I will admit that I trust a few of your ninja. I propose that each cage has the right to screen and select the ambassadors that will be in their nations. There were multiple nods in agreement to this. Very well, that will be added to the second item then. Moving on to the third item. 
Naruto kun wishes to address the cage on this subject, Hiruzen said, opening the floor to Naruto. Honorable cage and counselors, it brings me great joy to see this day come so soon. I have shared with you my vision for peace and a better world. I swear to you that I have conveyed my true feelings to you. On the third agreement, there is a clause saying that the children will be divided by nation of the mother. I understand that this is to prevent an improper power balance. However, as an orphan, I cannot fathom forcing that fate upon my children. I implore each of you honorable cage, do not separate my family in such a manner. I offer that each child will be given dual citizenship with the country of the mother's origin. They will spend at least two months in the country of their mother's origin each year. I propose that upon their 14th birthdays, the children will take up a post in the mother's country of origin. I know that this is asking a lot, but I implore your understanding in the manner. Naruto bowed over at the waist throughout his overture. The sincerity of his words could not be doubted and moved each cage present. I countered Naruto's proposal. Naruto, I do not doubt your words. I do not doubt your integrity. You will find when you become a cage that not all decisions are ours to make. This treaty will have to be ratified by all daimyo and village councils. This is also a large concession. Is there anything the leaf is willing to offer in return for such a concession? Onoki and May nodded at this. They wanted to trust the boy, but knew they were going to face the same issues. Hiruzen looked to Naruto, he knew this issue was important to him and wanted to see how the boy would handle it. Naruto swallowed before addressing the cage. Uzumaki clan Fuenjutsu is a world-renowned art. The seals of my lost clan offer vast improvements to everyday life, village security and have combat applications. I demonstrated their combat effectiveness in the finals. Upon my rise to the Hokage position, I will share levels 1 through 5 with the nations that agree to my proposal. I will share one additional level per child that I am blessed with. I have in my possession up to 15 levels of sealing mastery. I am currently a level 10 seal master, the highest I am aware of in the elemental nations. I have seals that can improve many things your villages would be interested in. I would be willing barter the more complex seals out individually, should they accept my agreement. The cage were experienced politicians, but they couldn't contain their excitement at this. The small, poorly hidden smiles let Naruto know he was winning this exchange. Hiruzen looked uncomfortable. Naruto knew it was because Naruto had not shared such knowledge with the village yet, but Naruto would handle that shortly. It was May that stood up and accepted the amendment first, followed by Ayanonoki. Hiruzen took over at this point. On to item 4, the marriage and placements of the brides-to-be. It is proposed that the marriages will occur simultaneously shortly after Naruto's 15th birthday. That gives us a little over one year. The proposal is to make each woman the ambassador to Konoha from your respective villages. Are there any issues with this proposal? May stood up, Naruto-kun. It has come to my attention that in addition to Samui and Kurotsuchi, you are dating two Konoha shinobi as well. Is this correct? Naruto stood up and addressed the room. Yes, Mizukage-sama. That is correct. I intend to court Anko Mitarashi and Ino Yamanaka with the intention to marry. I have spoken will all women involved and demonstrated that I will be able to attend to their needs effectively. I understand that this seems rather salacious of me, but I assure you, I hold love in my heart for each woman. May felt she had to speak out on behalf of the women of the world. Ara, and how, pray tell, do you plan on attending to the needs of so many beautiful women? Naruto crossed his fingers and five copies of himself appeared behind him. They all sounded off at the same time. Mizukage-sama, I assure you that they will not want for my affection. Each clone ended the statement with a sly wink at the Mizukage, who sat down with a blush on her face. The male cage each adopted a look between a proud smirk and a jealous outrage. Are there any further objections? Asked Hiruzen in a tone that pleaded for no more. I stood up. Naruto, will there be a head wife? I stopped when he saw Naruto stand. Forgive the interruption, Reikage-sama. There will be no such position. I have made it abundantly clear to my girls that they will all share in my love equally. The Uzumaki clan history laid out some ground rules for polygamy that I intend to honor. First, the wives will become sisters and share in all things equally. I intend for this to apply to those that take the Uzumaki or Namikaze name. Second, all current wives must agree upon any new addition. This gets slightly confusing since I unintentionally started courting all wives around the same time. However, I did get the four current women to agree to each other. Naruto paused to catch his breath and compose his thoughts. May stepped in during this brief pause. Kiri is offering a bride as well, Haku Momochi. Will she be accepted into this group of sister wives? Naruto nodded. Mizukage-sama, I understand your concerns. 
I made the offer to Haku when I met her in Wave. She will be afforded the same opportunity as the others. I will remind each of you. I will not marry for anything short of love. I care not for possessions or promises of power. If any girl chooses not to marry me at the end of this year, it will not affect items 1 and 2 of the treaty. The absolute confidence of his statement left little room for argument. Each of the cage nodded the consent and let the final issue of the treaty stop there. Hiruzen stepped up to let them know that they will each get an amended copy of the treaty to take back to their villages. Baki stepped up after remaining quiet for the whole meeting. Honorable cage, will the sand be included in any of this? All cage looked to Hiruzen to respond. Ah, yes, Baki san. We invited you here to be transparent. Surely you understand the position your village is in. I am working with the Konoha Council to complete a list of demands to take back to your council. Since you have no cage, it will not be possible for you to sign this treaty. I would ask that you remain in the village until that is complete. The elegant way in which Hiruzen brushed off his request made him sit down and hang his head in defeat. Onoki took advantage of the momentary pause to bring up the most important topic of the day to each cage. Naruto-kun, Hokage Dono informed us that you know of a jutsu that can defeat paperwork. I am sure that I speak for each cage present when I say that I am willing to bargain for said jutsu. Excited nods followed Onoki's statement, and a playful gleam appeared in Naruto's eyes. Whatever could you be talking about, Onoki Dono? His playful tone was evident. Hiruzen loved when this side of Naruto was not directed at him. I stood up and slammed his hands on the desk. Quit fooling around, Naruto. We are serious. I will give you an open IOU from Kumagakor for this secret. The other cage quickly matched Ai's offer. Naruto smiled broadly and crossed his fingers. The clones went around the table and collected the papers that were scattered about. I will give you each a copy of the jutsu scroll that I just used. It is called the Shadow Clone Jutsu. I will make you swear to only teach this jutsu to your successors. This is an Uzumaki clan jutsu exclusive to Konoha. I will advise you ahead of time to read the warnings attached to said jutsu. I look forward to cashing in the IOUs. Hokage-sama, can you please draft a document detailing the agreement between each cage here and the Uzumaki Namikaze clans? Hiruzen chuckled at the look on each cage's face and nodded to Naruto. He called an end to the summit, and everyone made their way out of the council chamber. Samui, Kurotsuchi and Haku joined Naruto for a lunch date while the cage joined Hiruzen for a celebratory drink in his office. This was a big step forward for the elemental nations and it led to the cage and their escorts pregaming in Hiruzen's office before bar hopping around Konoha. The rowdy group accidentally added 20,000 Ryo to the repairs Konoha needed thanks to a rowdy eye, a demonstration from a plastered Onoki of his dust release and be partially transforming into an octopus. Hiruzen later labeled the repairs as diplomatic collateral damage. Chapter 17 Freeing the Caged Bird A week after the cage summit, Naruto was summoned to the council chambers again. When he entered, he saw the Konoha council joined by the Hyuga elders. He had been expecting this sooner rather than later. Hiruzen opened the meeting in a deadly serious voice before he laid the charges out before Naruto. The Hyuga clan has filed a formal complaint against the Uzumaki clan for direct interference in clan affairs. They cite the incident between Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze and Neji Hyuga. They demand recompense for violation of clan rights and compensation. How do you answer these charges, Uzumaki Namikaze-san? Homura read out the charges in an emotionless tone. Honorable counsel, I reject those charges in their entirety. I was in a fight against a Hyuga opponent. Before the match was called, I simply demonstrated a superior way for the clan to protect their dujutsu while securing my victory in the match. Was his sarcastic reply. It was met with absolute outrage by the Hyuga side of the council. Naruto-kun, I would ask you not to intentionally rile up our guests. The Hyuga clan's charges are serious, and we bore witness to them. Hiruzen's voice cut across the room and silenced the Hyuga. Hokage-sama, do clan practices and rights allow them to subvert the laws of fire country? Naruto asked in a sing-song tone that dumped a proverbial bucket of ice water on the Hyuga present. No, Naruto-kun. Clans are not exempt from the laws of fire country. Well then, Hokage-sama. It is my duty to inform you that the Hyuga clan's practice of applying the caged bird seal is in direct violation of Fire Country's anti-slavery policy. The caged bird seal does not simply seal away the dujutsu. It is actually modified from a prisoner seal that the Uzumaki clan developed. It is the same seal I applied to the prisoners from Sand, except my seal is far more humane. Once again, outrage erupted from the Hyuga present and one of the elder Hyuga made a lunge at Naruto with his Byakugan activated. In response, 
a whole squad of Anbu appeared in front of Naruto with their Kodachis drawn. This halted the advance. Explain, Naruto-san. Was the demand from Homura. Very well, I call Hizashi Hayuga and Neji Hayuga to the council floor, Naruto said in a professional tone. At Hiruzen's gesture, a squad of Anbu went to retrieve the pair of Hayuga. They appeared ten minutes later with a confused Hizashi and Neji. Naruto turned to Hyashi. Hyashi Dono, please don't use it, but will you demonstrate for the council the hand seal that activates the prisoner function of the seal? Hyashi reluctantly rose from his seat and Hitomi stood with an arm on his shoulder. He formed a unique hand sign. Hyashi Dono, will you explain the effects that activating that hand sign has on bearers of the caged bird seal, please? Naruto request turned into a demand when Hyashi saw the looks of the other counselors. He took a deep breath before explaining. The seal activates and overloads the neural network of the seal's bearer. It incapacitates the bearer and subjects them to severe pain. Naruto nodded and continued his inquisition. Is the Hyuga clan aware of any long-term side effects the seal has from repeated use? I will remind the council chamber that I can detect all lies and ill will thanks to my tenant, so please do not attempt to do so. Now the Hyuga clan members were deathly silent. They knew, they all knew. They paid off all of their clan doctors and it was the main reason the branch family rarely went to the Konoha hospital. Hyashi responded in a dejected tone. We believe there to be side effects, but there has never been an inquiry into it. Naruto halted the outrage before it could begin. Tsunade Senju, please inform the council of the potential side effects of such a barbaric practice. Tsunade ignored the Hyuga and smiled at Naruto. He was putting on a brilliant political show. Repeated activation of such a seal could cause any number of side effects. Overloading the neurons will lead to cerebral palsy, the seal connected to the eyes could lead to blindness, the repeat activation would degrade brain function and increase risk for diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia. Naruto continued. Thank you, Tsunade-sama. Hokage-sama, you have a number of Hyuga in active duty. As your ninja, they fall under your purview. Will you continue to allow a practice that actively degrades the quality of your shinobi force when there is an alternative sealing method to protect the dujutsu? Naruto paused for dramatic effect. Hokage-sama, before you answer, here is a letter with the seal of the fire daimyo. I took the liberty of informing him of my intentions before the finals. An Anbu took the letter from Naruto, inspected it and then gave it to the Hokage. The silence and tension in the room was palpable as the Hokage read the letter. Hiruzen looked up at Naruto, then over to Hyashi. Anbu, please escort the Hyuga elders, Sans Hyashi and Hitomi, to the waiting room for dignitaries. They are not to leave said waiting room until I give permission. Three squads of Anbu materialized and escorted the screaming Hyuga elders out of the council chambers. The Hokage let out a deep breath before looking at Hyashi. Hyashi Dono, by order of the Fire Lord, your clan is to cease and desist in the use of the caged bird seal. Any and all attempts to use the seal will be seen as a direct violation of the Fire Lord's will. The Hyuga clan will pay Naruto Uzumaki Senju a just price for his services in removing the caged bird seal from all Hyuga clan members. Hyashi was a mix of emotions. He knew Naruto was helping him find a way out of the use of the cursed seal. He had supplied him documents over the past couple of years detailing the seal itself. However, he had to put on an air as the clan head. Hokage-sama, you can't be serious. This boy violated my clan's rights, now you wish to force me to use his services? Do you know any other sealing masters capable of removing your clan's seal, with a seal already developed to protect your dujutsu? Was the Hokage's reply. No, Hokage-sama. I do not. Hyashi replied, feigning dejection. It would have worked better if Hitomi didn't have a victorious smile on her face. Neji's reaction was priceless to Naruto. Naruto unsealed his camera and took a picture before Neji could fix his face. He gave Hitomi a look that asked if she wanted copies. She nodded enthusiastically. By order of the fire daimyo and the Hokage of Kanahagakor no Sato, all Hyuga are recalled and to be detained in the Hyuga clan compound until Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze can safely remove the caged bird seal from all Hyuga branch members. The detention will remain in effect until all Hyuga members have the new protection seal applied. Hyashi, Hitomi, Hizashi and Neji bowed at the waist, hi, Hokage-sama. Mikado didn't want to waste this opportunity. Hokage-sama, the Uchiha clan wishes to petition Naruto to develop a protection for the Sharingan as well. Hiruzen looked to Naruto, who simply nodded with a smile on his face. Very well, Mikado. Naruto accepts your request on behalf of Konoha. 
the village will pay for the protection seals to be applied to each member of the Hyuga and Uchiha clans. After Mikoto sat down, he continued. Naruto, please gather the necessary supplies and head to the Hyuga compound to begin working immediately. An hour later, the branch members of the Hyuga clan were assembled in the courtyard. In front of them, Hyashi and Hizashi stood next to Naruto. By order of the fire daimyo and Hokage, the use of the caged bird seal is now outlawed. You will form a line in front of Naruto. He will remove the seal and apply a new protection seal to the base of your necks. Hyashi spoke in the typical Hyuga monotone. Naruto didn't expect the cheers that followed Hyashi's statement. Clan members were hugging each other and crying in disbelief. This was the most emotion he ever saw from the Hyuga clan. Naruto overloaded 10 clone captains with chakra and directed the 250 branch members to assemble in front of a clone. He closed his eyes and appeared next to Kurama. Q, I will owe you one after this. Can you help me with this? There is no way my chakra alone is going to be sufficient. Kurama chuckled and wrapped a tail around his container. Sure thing, kid. I told you I would help you achieve your dreams. How can you bring peace to the world with such a disgusting practice happening in your backyard? The sage would have killed the so-called elders of this clan without hesitation. Naruto leaned into Kurama's tail. Thanks, Kurama. Don't know what I would do without you. Naruto returned to the Hyuga compound, glowing red in Kurama's aura. He touched each of his clones and the shroud appeared on each clone. Worry not, this process is going to be chakra intensive. I will do my best to at least get rid of each seal today. If I have enough chakra, I will apply the new seal. The Hyuga branch members nodded eagerly as they were waiting in their lines. It took nearly three hours to remove all the caged bird seals. After each person had it removed, a display of gratitude followed. Tears, handshakes, hugs and a couple of kisses on the cheek. Everyone remained until the last branch member had their seal removed. Naruto dispelled his clones. When the exhaustion hit, he fell to one knee. Hinata and Neji helped him to his feet so he could address the crowd. My friends of the Hyuga clan, I celebrate with you today. A raucous cheer followed this. I have endeavored upon a great mission to bring peace to the elemental nations. It is a monumental task in which I will require your aid to achieve. Part of my mission is laying old grudges to rest. I recognize the great injustice that the branch family has suffered. However, I did this out of love for Lady Hinata, Lady Hitomi, and Lord Hyashi. If you wish to repay me, please do your best to lay old grudges to rest. Become the family that Konoha needs you to be. You are our most prestigious clan. My sincerest wishes for you to be happy. Do not dwell on the past, relish in the happiness of the present. Do not think of the pain, but revel in the joy that your children will be spared the suffering you endured. I know this is asking a great deal, but I believe in the love of the Hyuga. Thank you. Naruto bowed to them and got 256 bows in return. Thank you, Naruto-sama. Chorused out beyond the Hyuga compound. The branch family held a feast that night with Naruto as the guest of honor. He received thanks and gifts from almost every member. He received a hug and apology from Neji. Hinata gave him a hug and kiss on the cheek for helping her achieve her dream. Hizashi cried the hardest of any member. He bore the most resentment for the cursed seal and felt he owed Naruto double for saving himself and Neji from the hatred that resentment brought. Hyashi declared that the Hyuga would be eternal friends of the Uzumaki and Namikaze clans. It was all a bit overwhelming. He went to bed with a massive smile on his face that night. Two days later, Naruto had recovered his chakra. He reappeared in the Hyuga courtyard to cheers from the branch family and scowls from the elders. When he appeared, two elders dashed to kill him. Hyashi and Hizashi killed them in less than 10 seconds. The silence that followed was broken by Naruto. To those of you that listened to me two days ago. This is the fate of those who hold on to past grudges and hateful traditions. Please, let this be the last loss of life today. We will follow the same process as yesterday to apply the new seal. I apologize for any discomfort the new seal causes, he said this with a bow and was met by more cheers from the branch family and some of the main house. He once again called on Kurama's chakra and created ten clones. He saved the elders and main house for last, just to spite them. It took four hours to apply all of the seals. Naruto declined the invitation to feast with the Hyuga due to exhaustion. Hyashi said to expect an invite to dine soon. Hyashi was really hoping that Naruto would take Hinata as a bride. It would cement the future of the Hyuga and serve as a just payment for Naruto's services. Naruto spent the next week with his girls. He invited each of them to stay at the Namikaze compound. Kazuna had finished building an expansion to the already sizable house. Naruto wished for the original house to be used by Tsubaki, 
Sunade, and Jiraiya. The new house was for Konoha's new ambassadors. With five extra rooms to accommodate guests. With his payment from the Hyuga clan he could have built an expansion three times as big. However, much like his father, Naruto did not indulge in extravagance. At the end of this week Naruto was once again summoned to the council chamber. He stood next to Sasuke, Samui, Kurotsuchi, Haku, and Shino. Behind the Hokage, the Reikage, Suchikage and Mizukage stood wearing proud looks. The Hokage let them know why they were here. I apologize to each of you. This is long overdue. We have called you here today to award you promotions for your performance in the Chunin exams and subsequent invasion. Sasuke Uchiha, please step forward. Hiruzen's voice was proud and happy to be doing something easy and positive like promotions. For your performance in you fight against Haku Momochi and your efforts to secure the academy during the invasion, I hereby promote you to Chunin. May stepped forward. Haku Momochi, please step forward. For your performance during your fight in the finals and for your support during the invasion, I hereby promote you to Chunin. She handed Haku a Kiri flak jacket. I stepped forward. Samui of Kumo, post. For your splendid display of Kenjutsu and your mastery of the lightning element, I hereby promote you to Chunin. Hiruzen then spoke. Shino Abarame, for your efforts during the finals against a superior opponent and your subsequent efforts evacuating civilians during the invasion, I hereby promote you to Chunin. Onoki stepped forward. Kurotsuchi, for a great display of talent and tactical thinking during your fights in the Chunin exams, I hereby promote you to Chunin. All eyes in the room turned to Naruto as the Hokage spoke. Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, for your efforts in securing peace, for a splendid display of talent throughout the Chunin exams, for your contributions halting the invasion and dealing with the traitor Orochimaru, by unanimous decision of all cage present, you are hereby promoted to Jonin. Once each cage finished, there was a round of applause from the council. Naruto secured his Jonin flak jacket and equipped it. He knew he was going to have to make some modifications to it. The group of newly promoted Chunin and one Jonin went out to a celebratory meal at Akimichi Barbecue. Naruto sent out clones to find Hinata, Ino and Anko to join them for the celebration. Naruto hosted an after-party and housewarming party for the newly promoted. That night ended with four girls accompanying Naruto to bed. Hinata stayed until the group went to bed, but she was too shy to ask to stay the night. Return to Kumo, Kiri and Iwa. All cage admitted that they had stayed too long in Konoha and must return to their villages. They were not expecting to enjoy the trip slash vacation so much. Samui, Haku and Kurotsuchi were going to return to their villages to pack up their possessions and move to Konoha. Naruto created three overloaded clones and put stabilization seals on them to accompany each group back home. The clones each gave a copy of the Uzumaki, Shadow Clone Jutsu Scroll to each cage. Most of Konoha showed up to bid farewell to their potential allies. While Naruto Clone 1 walked back with the Reikage's envoy, it talked with B and Yugito about their experiences as Jinchuriki. Naruto also taught B how to let Juki out to enjoy the fresh air. By the third day of travel, Juki was let out of his seal. The octopus in human form was as big and muscled as B. It had horns, with the left one broken just like its bijou form. Juki pulled the Naruto clone into a big hug and Tabi had to stop him before he dispelled the clone. This group was a great group of people and Naruto smiled broadly when the clone's memories hit him. He would flash to Kumo to pick up Samui next week. Samui wanted a week to hang out with her friends and say goodbye. Naruto clone 2 walked with a much calmer group back to Iwa. He spent most of his time talking to Kurotsuchi, picking her brain for the best things to do and eat in Iwa. The trip was three days at a brisk pace. Onoki kept, thanking Naruto for the belt. It had been years since he could walk without pain. During the journey, Onoki agreed to set up a meeting between Han, Roshi, and Naruto. When the clone returned with the envoy to Iwa, a great crowd met them at the gates. The clone dispelled the day after arriving. The Iwa council had signed the treaty. Kurotsuchi wanted to stay for a couple weeks. Naruto would pick her up in two weeks' time. The clone that went with the Kiri team had the hardest time. It was awesome getting to know Haku and spend time with her. This alone brought out Zabuza's defensive side. However, the clone had to dodge advances from the Mizukage and Zabuza's sword for most of the way home. Mei kept comparing Naruto to Zabuza and would wrap Naruto up from behind. She positioned her massive bust on top of Naruto's head and would keep teasing Zabuza. The Naruto clone was thankful for his master's agility training, because he would have been forcefully dispelled by an enraged Zabuza without it. The clone noticed that Mist Country was in rough shape. Decades of war will do that to a place. 
When they returned to the hidden mist village, a very worn out owl greeted them. Naruto said his goodbyes and Haku told him to pick her up in three days. He gave her a three pronged kunai with instructions to channel chakra into the seal and throw it if she needs him. On the third day, the Naruto clones were escorting the Kijas. Naruto was forced to stop his research into a barrier that would isolate a certain space from another space and time. His clones were repeatedly thrown in other dimensions that were void of anything, disappearing into black holes or suffering other gruesome deaths. Honestly, he would rather keep researching than going to the Hyuga estate. He couldn't even bring Ino or Anko because they weren't officially his fiancés yet. So, he dressed up in his formal black kimono and asked Tsunade to accompany him to the dinner. Jiraiya decided to join in the fun. They arrived at the Hyuga estate and were immediately taken to a nice waiting room. Soon, they were guided to a dining hall where the whole Hyuga clan was assembled. Many members jumped to their feet and started clapping politely as he entered. Hyashi was seated at the head table with Hitomi, Hizashi, Hinata, Neji, and Hanabi. Naruto, Jiraiya and Tsunade noticed the absence of the elders. Hyashi stood up and addressed his clan. Let us welcome our honored guests. After a round of clapping from the Hyuga he spoke again. Please enjoy the feast and night of festivities in honor of Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze and the uniting of our clan. At this queue, servers came out and placed appetizers on the tables. After the head table began eating, so did everyone else. Tsunade, never one to pull punches, opened the conversation. So, Hayashi, I am noticing there is no table for the clan elders. What is that about? Part of the resolution to move forward was to strip the clan elders of their positions and power. They have been moved to a separate part of the estate, Hayashi said in a simple tone. Wow, that's a pretty big deal. I assume they are not taking it well. Are you concerned about backlash? They are under surveillance and confined to the compound. In order to prevent any brash decisions, we found this to be the best option. I would rather 10 clan members suffer than the whole clan. Hitomi cut in. There was a clan meeting with all members present. Hizashi was named the head of the branch house and acted as their voice. He petitioned for a clan-wide vote on removing the elders from their positions. Hyashi honored that request, and this was the result. That happened a couple days ago and already the atmosphere around the clan brightened significantly. Naruto took this turn to speak. A wise decision if you ask me. Elders should be respected, but if they refuse to adapt to changing tides, then they will drag your clan down with them. Hyashi and Hitomi gave a quick nod to that statement. Naruto-kun, I am sure you know that we are in your debt. Although we have already allied with you clan, I wish to strengthen that bond. Everyone at the table knew where Hyashi is going with this. The normally subtle clan leader was broadcasting his intentions. Naruto responded before he could complete the thought. Hyashi Dono, I am honored by your gratitude, but your debt is paid. I am about to embark on a journey to the Sage Woods to visit the Kitsune clan. I do not wish to add any more to my responsibilities at this time. Hyashi frowned slightly but remained undeterred. Well, I wish you luck on your journey. The Kitsune clan demonstrated their power quite magnificently during the invasion. I will ask you to consider bonding our two clans in marriage. I do not need an answer immediately, but I wanted to make it known that Hitomi and I wish you to have Hinata's hand in marriage. Naruto-kun, your mother and I were very close. We never formalized the deal, but we did agree to the mingling of our clans, should the opportunity present itself. A couple weeks before you were born, I found out that I was having a girl. Kushina and I agreed them to be wed, if they fell in love. It may have been the irrational delusions of pregnancy hormones, but I would ask you honor this wish. Naruto let out a deep breath, he didn't want to deal with this tonight. Now he finds out his mom's mouth was cashing checks that he would have to pay out. He looked over at the blushing Hinata and then back to Hyashi. Have you asked how Hinata feels about your proposal before asking me, Hyashi Dono? I have known of her affections for a while, and I admit that she is a wonderful young lady. However, you are aware of my stipulations for marriage. Hyashi and Hitomi both nodded. Very well, Hinata-chan, is it your wish to become my bride? Hinata was crimson. She had come a long way in her confidence and being around Naruto. However, nothing could prepare her to answer this question. Her voice caught in her throat and resulted in a squeak coming out. Naruto waited patiently, finally Hinata nodded her head and said, Yes, Naruto-kun. He looked at Hyashi and Hitomi. I would like to formally ask permission to court Hinata. I will not promise marriage. As you know, my other brides-to-be will have a say in this. I will, however, court Hinata with intentions toward marriage. Hyashi and Hitomi smiled broadly. Even Neji smiled at this before Hyashi stood up and announced it to the clan. Well, 
Shit. Now this is going to get around fast. Was Naruto's single thought on the matter. The dinner continued without further incident. Jiraiya kept making Naruto drink with him and praising him as his muse. Tsunade couldn't begrudge Jiraiya for living vicariously through Naruto. Though she did still smack him on his head for his antics. Chapter 18 Trip to the Sage Woods Dash Three weeks after the Hyuga dinner, Naruto had all his girls gathered together in the newly built living room of the expansion. He did the clone shuffle and cuddled up next to all the girls simultaneously. The topic of discussion tonight was Hinata. Naruto and his clones took turns speaking so that the girls never knew who was the real one. Okay, girls. I promise I am not doing this on purpose. Three weeks ago. Hyashi Hayuga formally. Offered me Hinata's hand. In marriage. I don't know why. This always happens. To me. The girls laughed at his antics. They were each more than happy to snuggle in with their Naruto. Unsurprisingly, it was Anko that took the lead. Damn, Ruto. Six girls before your 14th birthday. That is quite the pace you're setting. Her playful tone earned chuckles from the other girls. Samui added, I used to think guys that wanted harems were disgusting. Now look at me. She then planted a fat kiss on her Naruto clone. Haku laughed out loud as her clone tickled her. If it were anybody else, I would agree with you Samui. But this is Ruto. How can I not adore him? She then jumped onto the clone's lap and initiated a little make-out session. Yup, it is Ruto alright. I have known him since I was three, along with Hinata-chan, so I don't see a problem with letting her into the club. Ino squealed as a Naruto applied lighting chakra over her budding nipple. She slapped the clone in a playful manner and decided to follow the other girl's examples. Hinata watched the other girls make out with their Narutos. She made eye contact with hers, which happened to be the original, and closed her eyes, inviting him in for a kiss. Naruto obliged. Hinata had an enormous amount of pent-up sexual frustration. She had been watching him date other girls and build his harem. She wanted so badly to be a part of it, but never had the courage to ask. Thus, when she was kissing Naruto, she went from shy and timid to an unrestrained freak. It didn't take her more than a minute to mount him and lead the kiss from there. The girls eventually got their Naruto fix and calmed down, since Naruto made it clear he wanted to talk about something serious. Okay, girls. Kurama has told me that it is time for me to visit the Sage Woods. I need to go and address my summon clan. This can take anywhere from a couple of months to a year. Q has told me that we can stop back from time to time. My plan is to leave a blood clone in my place. It should act like a shadow clone, I don't really know. Haven't done this jutsu before. I am leaving the clone to study under the Hokage and act as the Hokage's assistant. I will leave it instructions to take each of you out once a week. Does that sound fair? Ruto, will this blood clone be able to make shadow clones? Was the astute question from Kurotsuchi. Maybe a couple. Since he will not have a link to Kurama, I don't want him to push it. That jutsu has a terrible backlash. It will have as much chakra as Kakashi and should be self-sustaining. So, it might be able to manage a couple clones, but nowhere near what I can make. Ruto, are we allowed to treat him like you? Was the suggestive question from Anko. I really wish you wouldn't. I should get all of its memories in the end, but I would rather enjoy firsts and save that level of intimacy for us. It was a sweet sentiment and he got nods from every girl except Anko. Naruto decided that a night to bond with each girl was a good idea. He went with each girl into their own room. Anko got her month's worth of sex out of the real Naruto that night. The rest of the girls enjoyed make-out sessions with light petting. Naruto was the most surprised, yet again, by the fierce transformation of Hinata in the bedroom. The next day came all too soon and the group was eating breakfast in the kitchen. Naruto had let Q out the previous night and saw Q in the kitchen with Tsume. She gave a casual greeting to the other girls. It was no mystery what her and Q were doing. Naruto wondered if there were anything he could do about the memories of Q and Tsume. Naruto found himself strangely attracted to and protective of the feral woman. Q and Tsume found it cute. Tsume just found it sad that her daughter, Hana, didn't have a place in Naruto's harem. Additionally, she found it surprising how well the girls got along. She just marked it up as a credit to Naruto. The Hokage, Jiraiya and Tsunade showed up toward the end of breakfast to see Naruto off. Naruto went through hand signs a leader of his blood that he had saved up formed into a blood clone. He confirmed with the blood clone that it understood his instructions before stepping into the middle of the training grounds. He summoned Kurama, who then reverse summoned him to the sage woods. The girls looked at the blood clone and realized that it just wasn't the same. Hopefully, it would be able to give them their Ruto fix. 
Naruto appeared next to Kurama in the sage woods. There were massive redwood-like trees that spanned as far as Naruto could see. The trees seemed to be around 30 feet in diameter with some standing above others with 50 feet in diameter trucks. The ground-level foliage was rich and fairly dense with brown pine needles filling in where green left space. There was a vibrant forest life in the area, between the squirrels Naruto could see and the deer running beneath the redwood trees. Kurama made a sweeping motion with his head that told Naruto to follow him. They bounded through the forest for 15 to 20 minutes before things changed. Naruto could see a clearing about a mile or two in diameter that was peppered with massive trees. The base of the biggest tree must have been 200 feet in diameter. He saw Kitsune scurrying around the clearing. They had anywhere from one to six tails and were a variety of colors. They varied in sizes from Labrador retrievers to mammoth-sized creatures. Naruto noticed that there weren't any fox kits running around but figured he could ask Kurama about that later. As Naruto and his partner appeared at the edge of the clearing, all foxes turned and bowed to Kurama. Kurama's voice carried across the clearing. It is good to see you all again, please return to what you were doing. The motion returned to the clearing. Kurama shrank down to a lion-sized fox with his nine orange tails swinging behind him. In this form, his shoulders were at Naruto's shoulder height. An envoy of regal-looking foxes made their way to greet Kurama. Two seven-tailed foxes were in the lead, flanked behind by five more. The lead fox on the left had a beautiful brown fur coat, with patches of white at its paws, underbelly and around its left eye. There were battle scars on its snout and it gave off a dominant aura. The lead fox on the left had a dark blue coat that shimmered with a purple sheen. Naruto saw that his one's underbelly was a soft purple, and he could make out teats. The face carried a gentler, but no less powerful, visage to it. The foxes in the rear were clearly older and smaller. Their whiskers were grayed, and their fur didn't shine like the two in front of them. Their auras were also not nearly as flamboyant despite them having six tails. Greeting, Lord Kurama, welcome home. Came the soft and elegant voice of the fox on the right. All foxes of the envoy bowed their heads in respect to Kurama. Ah, Khaleesi, it is good to see you again. Fenric, I thank you again for your help dealing with those snakes. Elders, it has been too long. Have your whiskers grayed more or is it just me? Kurama's playful greeting put the group at ease. Fenric answered, Lord Kurama, it is good to see you again. Thank you for calling me out for some fun. I am always up for a snake hunt. The elder in the center stepped forward, as impudent as ever Lord Kurama. We were alive when the sage, may Kami rest his soul, chose you. It has been a century since we last saw you. So, forgive this old fox for graying a bit. It is all in good fun, Henrik. We have much to discuss, but before we gather in the council let me introduce you to my partner and our newest summoner. Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. All foxes bowed their heads and Henrik beckoned them to follow him to the biggest tree in the clearing. Before entering the tree, all foxes shrunk down to the size of a Great Dane. After they entered, more foxes followed. Soon the massive room, complete with a balcony overlooking the main seating area, was filled by the Kitsune clan. The meeting began by Kurama telling his story and the reason for his absence. After he had spoken, Henrik explained the Kitsune's past century. The Kitsune had been in trouble without their fox lord present. Since Kurama's departure, they have not been able to conceive new kits, which had left the clan distressed. Any pregnancies would fail, and the lack of new blood had massive ramifications for the clan. Evidently, Kitsune received chakra blessings from Kurama when new kits were in the womb. These chakra blessings ensured a successful pregnancy. Naruto was distressed to hear this. After the Kitsune recognized his right to speak, he began. As of right now, Kurama is sealed inside me. We have found workarounds for this, such as his summoning and me letting his soul inhabit a human form. If you honor me as your summoner, I will do my utmost to create a portal that is linked to here from my home village. I am a Fuenjutsu master and will be able to link our two realms, should you allow it, Naruto concluded with a bow to those assembled. Khaleesi spoke, do you have the authority to create such a portal? And we cannot give access to our realm to any human. There were many nodding heads to this. In four years, I will become the leader of my village. If I cannot get approval to do it before then, then I will create the portal when I become Hokage. As I said, I am a seal master. I can create the portal so only the Kitsune clan and its summoners may use it. The toads have one such portal outside of Konoha. Fenrich then spoke, that is all well and good. However, Lord Kurama is sealed inside you and your souls are linked by the Sinigami. If he dies, the Kitsune clan will die out without his blessings. Kurama spoke. I will leave the Kitsune clan scroll in the possession of the elders. 
Should we fall, however unlikely it may be, either Fenrich or Khaleesi will take over the clan. Your blessings should be sufficient to birth the kits. They will not be as strong until you grow your eighth tail, but it will do for a worst-case scenario. Karama's tone was confident and absolute. One of the elders spoke up in a wheezy voice. Lord Karama, surely you are not content to be sealed in such a human. Would it not be best to kill him and begin your reformation? You are a fool. Do not sleep through my words. A power far greater than mine bonds us. The Sinigami himself has bound our souls. Until we repay the Sinigami, if he dies, I die. There is nobody foolish enough to attempt to trick the Sinigami. Death will always win out in the end. The elder backed away with his head bowed, ears down and tails between his legs. Naruto spoke up. I pledge to return to these woods once a month so Kurama can bless any kits. This is a priority to me, and it brings me to my next question. I have spoken with Kurama, and he wanted me to get the approval of the clan. I wish to make the Fox clan a family contract for the Namikaze side of my lineage. Murmurs broke out among the crowd of foxes. It was silenced by Kurama's growl. This human kit here has earned my complete trust. He has accepted and purified my hatred for humanity. I wish to leave this decision to the Kitsune clan as a matter of respect. Now, I will hear a vote on this. His voice echoed throughout the chamber. Khaleesi then put it to a vote. Kitsune had a rather unique way of voting. They raised their tails. Therefore, the more powerful members of the clan carried more weight in their vote. The final count was 420 tails in approval with 60 tails against the measure. Karama let out a pleased growl from his throat. Good, now on to the next matter. Where is Kiryu? An old grey fox stepped forward in response to Karama's call. Good to see you again, old friend. I wish you to instruct Naruto in the ways of the Kitsune. Once he has mastered your teachings, you will see if he can learn Sinjutsu. Gasps and chirps erupted from the foxes in attendance. Kiryu bowed his ancient and greying head. It will be done, Lord Karama. The meeting was brought to a close and Naruto went to meet and bond with as many Kitsune as he could. He created nearly 100 shadow clones that went out and got to know the Kitsune. While they were initially stunned, they opened up to him and welcomed him into the clan. Just like his affect of his human friends, Naruto's presence brought light and life back to the Kitsune clan. 8 Months of Training Naruto had studied with Kiryu, Fenrich, Khaleesi and Kurama for the past 8 months. He worked tirelessly to absorb the knowledge of the Kitsune clan. The only breaks he allowed himself were Sundays when he would return to Konoha for a day at a time. Many other of the battle Kitsune enjoyed sparring against Naruto as well. The way the boy used the shadow clones essentially made it so he could learn from anyone who was willing to teach him. He demonstrated his mastery of the Kitsune arts after three months of training. It was his training in Sinjutsu that caused him to hit a roadblock. Naruto had been meditating since early childhood so he picked up quickly on feeling out natural energy. Naruto could feel the natural energy and draw it into himself, however, instead of permeating throughout his chakra system, it flowed into the seal. Karama could feel the influx of natural energy, but he couldn't release it from the seal in a constructive manner. This problem went on until Naruto forced Jiraiya to give him the key to his seal. Naruto's plan was to unlock his seal and eliminate the obstacle. However, Kurama informed him that doing so would instigate a fight between Naruto's chakra and his. Kurama wouldn't overtly try to kill the boy, but the potency of his chakra posed a great risk to Naruto. Therefore, Naruto trained for the fight to come with Kurama's chakra. Naruto prepared in a cave, far from the Kitsune clan compound. He laid out seal matrices that would help him suppress and control Kurama's chakra. He created chakra storage seals on his own body. He combined these seals into a tattoo of Kurama over his back. Really, the tattoo was just a seal that converted the ink on his back into a permanent genjutsu. The real seals were hidden under the tattoo like genjutsu. Naruto spent weeks storing chakra into the seals to use as a reserve. Using these seals would severely strain his chakra network and tenketsu, but he deemed the risk worth it. At the start of the seventh month with the Kitsune clan, Naruto was ready to open his seal. He removed all chakra restrictive seals, weight seals and gravity seals that he had been using for training. At 14.5 years old, Naruto was going to take on the strongest biju in existence, at its full power. Naruto placed himself in the middle of his sealing matrix. He activated the barrier that would feed off of the chakra of those within the barrier to maintain itself. If he failed and lost control, he would be locked inside this cave in theory. Naruto meditated and entered his mindscape. He walked over to Kurama and hugged his massive snout. Kurama wrapped his tail around him and returned the gesture. After a I believe in you, Kit, 
from Kurama, Naruto approached the seal with the key in hand. The rock that was holding the sealing tag floated up to chest high. Tan showed Naruto the tag. Naruto removed the tag all at once and inserted the key. Suddenly, a pair of hands stopped him. He turned to see his father, Minato Namikaze, staring at him. Hey there, Naruto, I am a chakra construct left by, well me. The image of Naruto's father scratched the back of his neck sheepishly, the same way Naruto did. Yeah, I could have guessed that too Chan. Well, I was about to fight Kurama in order to share and integrate his chakra, wanna help? The nonchalant statement from his son caused Minato to grow worried. Son, are you sure you're ready? You don't even look 15 yet. Tu Chan, it seems you didn't have access to my memories as a stored construct. Here. Naruto touched the chakra construct's forehead and focused in memories into Minato's head. Wow, okay then. Well before you do that, let's bring your mother out. Minato put his hand on the seal and a redhead beauty emerged from it. She looked confused for a second before she ran and tackled Naruto. While hugging his mother, he also imprinted his memories on the now freed chakra construct. Kushina began crying into Naruto's shoulder. I'm so proud of my Sochi. Minato-kun, did you see all he has done? Yes, Kushi-chan. Who would have thought to bring about world peace by marrying someone from each village? It is so simple, it's genius, Minato laughed as he said this. I knew Jiraiya perverted you, you Uro Blondie. Another sheepish neck rubbed from his father and a chuckle, then, it never seemed to bother you in the bedroom. Naruto covered his ears and said you while Kushina's chakra construct pounded on Minato. Naruto thought that his mother must have gotten that from Tsunade. A deep chuckle drew the group's attention. Well, I regret to inform you that it is not good to see you both again. I have partnered with your kid, and he has my respect, but you two do not. Come on, Kurama. Don't be like that. They are only chakra constructs. Anyway, you want to get this fight over with? That chakra draining barrier will kill us both if we don't hurry this up. Naruto's playful response worried Kurama. It is like he wasn't taking this seriously. Oi, kid. This isn't a walk through the park. This is going to be your toughest fight yet. So, serious mode on and bring it, Ningen. Kurama's smile was battle crazed. He wanted a good fight. Naruto and the two chakra constructs took battle positions. Naruto approached the seal once again and turned the key counterclockwise. They were blasted by a wave of potent red chakra as the chakra barrier shimmered out of existence and Kurama let out a roar. The fight was on. Naruto summoned 40 clones and performed the Firestorm collaboration jutsu. Kurama answered it with his Kastun fire stream. The fire jutsu clashed in a magnificent display that blinded the motionless Kurama. He felt the chakra around him but his legs were wrapped by those damned Uzumaki chakra chain. 20 Naruto clones with Odama Rasengans and the 4th Hokage with his Odama Rasengan pelted the head of Kurama, driving it into the ground. Before dispelling, each Naruto clone attached a weight seal to the fox's head. Kurama struggled to lift his head due to the weight, and then he was wrapped up in Uzumaki chakra chains. The weight seals added more weight with the more chakra added. Since Kurama was made purely of chakra, they each kept soaking up chakra until each seal weighed well over one ton. Naruto dashed to Kurama, linked his chakra to his and began pulling on Kurama's chakra. The prone form of Kurama felt it impossible to move. The seal from outside was draining his chakra and the three constructs in his mind were making it difficult. He didn't want to kill the kid anyway because then he would die. He was holding himself back quite a bit, but he was still going to make them work for it. Kurama swished his tails in a violent maelstrom sending semi-sized wind blades left and right. Minato rapidly created a lightning barrier to absorb the impact of the wind blades. Kushina clasped her hands together and more chakra chains sprouted from the ground and began immobilizing Kurama's tails one by one. The fox was finally immobilized and Kushina was struggling to suppress the fox. Naruto had been pulling on Kurama's chakra, but it felt like his whole body was full of the burning chakra. He paused his advance as his left eye turned black with a red iris. Half of Naruto's body started cubifying. He had one fox ear on the left top of his head. His left hand had morphed into a claw. He sprouted four tails. This was more chakra than he had ever controlled before, and he felt his will slipping to the power of the chakra. A hand on his shoulder brought him back. Think of all those counting on you to return home, son. Anko, Ino, Hinata, Samui, Kurotsuchi, Haku, Tsunade, Jiraiya, Hiruzen, Danzo, Hitomi, Hyashi, Hizashi, Mikoto, Sasuke, Shisui, Itachi, Shikamaru, Kuji, Kurama.
the voice of his father urged him to take a step back with each name. Reaffirming his will, strengthening his resolve. By the time his father reached Kurama's name he was shrouded in a violent red storm with eight tails waving violently behind him. He remembered his promise to Ai, Onoki, and Mei. He remembered his vow to change this world for the better. He remembered his vow to himself. He screamed out in a loud, powerful and feral voice, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze never gives up and never goes back on his word. The last pull severed the connection between his chakra and the fox. The outer seals were helping to drain the excess chakra, but they were soon overloaded by the sheer quantity of it. Internally, his mother let go of Kurama and wrapped him in a hug. His black eyes with red pupils reverted to their ocean blue state. His features began to soften and return to normal. He embraced his mother's chakra construct and the tails condensed into a golden shroud around him. The seal on his stomach standing out in an intricate and bold black color was burning from the heavy chakra flow. His father embraced him from behind and helped bring the last bit of rampaging chakra under control. He walked over to Kurama, who looked like he was skin and bones and held out a glowing, golden fist. When the fox's fist contacted with Naruto's life instantly returned to Kurama. Kurama was perplexed, he just fought me for my chakra. Then he realized it. The chakra that Naruto returned was purified. The fog of hatred that Kurama normally felt from his chakra was absent. The ancient Kitsune looked down at the boy. He was now certain that he was the boy his father spoke of. Sorry about that Q, it was never about stealing your chakra from me. It was about removing every obstacle that stopped us from sharing it. What you say, partner? Naruto's voice was filled with mirth, and he had that gigawatt smile on his silly human face. Kurama roared out in laughter. I say that you are the one my father spoke of. From this day, until your dying day, I am your partner. Proud member of the Namikaze Kitsune clan. The fox placed a genuine smile on its face. Unfortunately, Minato and Kushina were not used to Kurama, so they perceived it as a menacing grin. Who could blame them? A 40-story fox with teeth as big as they were will inevitably look pretty damned menacing. Naruto turned around to address his parents' chakra constructs. He noticed that he was now standing as tall as his father at 5 feet 11 inches. The power radiating from him felt strange. He created a shadow clone and observed it. Indeed, it was taller and more mature. It looked like he had gone through puberty already. His body was toned into an Olympian figure and the tight muscles rippled just beneath the skin. His face was more angular and feral, and his whisker marks were more distinct. After taking in his appearance, he shook it off and shelved it for later. Thanks, mom and dad. I appreciate your help in that. Karama, I want you in on this so come. The mindscape changed from a destroyed battleground to the lakeside view. Kurama posted up on his rock and watched Naruto sit at the water's edge talking to his parents' chakra constructs. Kushina did most of the talking while Minato sat back and listened. Since they had access to his memories, Kushina kept picking his brain and bugging him about the girls in his life. He had about one hour with his parents to simply relax and be a kid. The chakra constructs started flickering and they knew they were running out of time. Kushina pulled Naruto into a deep hug. Keep true to yourself, Sochi. I am so proud of you. Sorry, Minato, I took up most of your time. No worries, my love. Son, listen to everything your nagging mother said. I am proud of the man you've become. Protect those you love, protect Konoha and fulfill your dream. You are on the right path. While he was saying this, he wrapped Naruto in a tender embrace. Kushina looked up to Kurama, I am sorry I never gave you a chance. Look after my Sochi, please. She bowed along with Minato to the great Kitsune. Kurama grunted. I gave him my word. Now you have it too. Rest peacefully in the pure world. Naruto was holding his parents' hands as the chakra constructs blinked out of existence. He wiped the tears from his eyes and went to rest in one of Kurama's tails. Now that the seal was down, Naruto's connection to him felt so vivid. Being near Kurama felt like home. His consciousness fell into a peaceful resting state while wrapped in Q's tail. After Naruto awoke in the cave, he returned to his Senjutsu training with Kiryu. It took him three additional days to reach an unstable Senjutsu state. The remainder of the month was him perfecting the Senjutsu state. Just like every other problem, Naruto found that he could solve it with clones. In battle, he could dispatch clones to collect nature energy and dispel to return the energy to himself. In his full Kitsune Sage mode, Naruto's speed doubled, his sensory abilities went beyond Kurama's own, his strength increased by five times and his body was far more durable. He naturally healed fast, but with Sage Mode activated he could heal broken bones in less than a minute and lesser injuries almost instantly. 
the balance of natural energy with his chakra enhanced his jutsu and elevated their potency and scale. The final test of Naruto's senjutsu training was a fight between Khaleesi and Fenric, at the same time. It was a very one-sided contest. Naruto nailed them with multiple combination jutsu and would attack openings with punches and kicks that sent the massive foxes sprawling. They ended up surrendering due to injuries. After the spar was over, it was announced that the first birth in the clan would happen in one month's time. The group celebrated with a barrel of Kastun fire whiskey. Not even Naruto's natural resistance to poisons could prevent the hangover he felt the next day. Return to Konoha. Naruto thanked the Kitsune clan and promised to be present with Kurama for the birth of the first kits in centuries. There were multiple pregnancies in progress and the spirit of the Kitsune clan had never been higher. The clan bid them farewell before Kurama reverse summoned them to Konoha. Naruto appeared in the training grounds of the Namikaze estate, where the girls were waiting for him. They had each made do with the Naruto blood clone, however, they realized it paled compared to the real thing. It was Anko who tackled him to the ground and the rest piled on. He was showered in love, affection and I missed you. When he all got the girls to let him stand up, they gasped. Naruto was now a full head taller than all of them. Multiple hands felt out his toned body and Naruto had to stop Anko's hand from exploring elsewhere. Okay, girls. Do you want to catch up together or clone style? He asked while chuckling. The girls looked at each other and then back to him. Clones, please. Naruto laughed heartily as five other Narutos appeared laughing as well. They dashed inside and came back out carrying an assortment of drinks and snacks. Each pair split off and caught up with each other. They talked until dinner time. Then Naruto and his clones went to prepare a meal for his ladies, after which the group ate in an amicable peace. Once the group finished eating, the girls told Naruto that they all wanted to spend the night with the real him. Naruto wound up on his bed with six gorgeous women. Most people would call this heaven and Naruto tended to agree. Lying on a king-sized bed with six horny women in their nightgowns was a slice of heaven. Since Anko was the only one that had crossed the sex line with Naruto, the night ended calmly with the girls falling asleep on top of him. The next morning, he promised each girl a date and some alone time. It was then that his blood clone came to him while he was eating breakfast. Naruto and the blood clone joined hands that the blood clone dispersed in a red mist. As the mist was absorbed into Naruto, eight months of memories came charging back into his head. He meditated for an hour to sort it all out. That was when he picked up on a key event. The San siblings were still in Konoha, and the Naruto clone had been involved in resolving the fallout with the sand. Flashback six months ago. The Naruto clone, just Naruto for this flashback, walked into the Hokage's office. The typical important people were there. You called for me, Hokage-sama. Yes, Naruto-kun. The sand has sent us their response to our demands, and I wanted you to be involved. How is the Gaki involved this time, sensei? Don't tell me it's another marriage proposal. Jiraiya deadpanned at the look Hiruzen was giving him. The boy already has six intended spouses. Isn't that the maximum allowed by the CRA? Koharu interjected. She was growing sick of this kid being involved in literally everything. Let's review the other items before addressing that one, Hiruzen said in a cautious tone. He knew Naruto's political harem was stretched thin already. Then that damned Hyashi had to go and throw his daughter into it. The first item was a trade for their captured shinobi. They claim that they do not have the funds to match our demand, Homura said in a simple tone. Well, they don't have much of a choice, Donzo started. The standard price was attached to the heads of the prisoner shinobi. I do not see why we should concede on such a thing. The reason for them joining Orochimaru in the first place was an economic depression brought on by their daimyo giving us more missions than Tsunaga Corps. If we press on this issue, all-out war is the inevitable outcome, Hiruzen said wearily. Naruto chipped in, what if we forego immediate payment? Say, we take 10% of their GDP until the standard amount is paid off. In addition, we let them have the missions from their daimyo and effectively turn all of Tsuna into a labor force. Our forces are stretched this as is with all the mission requests after the tuning exams. We could apply this policy to all our demands. This will secure a financial income source for Konoha and not completely destroy their economy. Danzo shook his head, we trained you too well, Naruto-kun. Maybe we should have all village children given political education by clan heads. It has produced wondrous results so far. Hiruzen nodded his head. That is an idea worth considering another time. For now, we will put the vote of payment by percentage to our council for a vote. The next issue was repaying cost of reconstruction. They bring up a fair point that it was Odogakor that did most of the damage. 
How about we reduce the amount owed by half and offer to put this to their collected debt? He got nods from around the room. Donzo felt he should speak on this next issue. The return of the San siblings, whom we are holding as political prisoners. This is a card we cannot afford to play lightly. We have their Jinchuriki and two of their highest potential shinobi. Naruto offered his opinion. I believe this is where we press for jutsu and knowledge. Let's ask for a few tsuna win jutsu and their collected knowledge on poisons and antidotes. This got excited looks from those in the room. Tsunade decided to speak on this. Tsuna was always leagues ahead of us in poisons. I had to work my tail off in the second shinobi war to keep up with Chio. I believe this knowledge will be worth it. Which brings us to item 4. They want to offer political marriage to reinstate the prior alliance and prevent betrayal. Unlike other villages, they will not fight for the custody of the children. In return for this leniency, they selected Naruto as their chosen suitor for Tamari Sabaku. Hiruzen's voice was cautious in its approach. Am I the only damned man in Konoha? Even I must admit this is getting ridiculous. Naruto was exasperated. Can we at least attempt a counteroffer on this point? I will not make the decision on this. At this point, you can ask my future wives if they refute the counter. Koharu was shocked at his reluctance but appreciated the boy's integrity. I believe we have many other clan heirs that could pass. Shikamaru Nara, Itachi Uchiha, Kuji Akimichi and Kiba Inuzuka to name a few. Too lazy, Anbu commander, not really the political type of guy and are you insane? Was Jiraiya's response. While crude, there was truth in all he said. Hiruzen sighed deeply. We will counteroffer with their pick of the clan heirs. Finally, what to do about Gara's seal? They did not wish to pay to have the seal reinforced. Then I will do it for free. You all know my stance on Bijou and their hosts. I cannot, in good conscience, return Gara without altering his seal. It is part of my promise to Kurama. I propose we offer this as a good faith addition. Naruto's stern voice once again made them look at him as far more than a 14 year old kid. Danzo had to pitch in his two cents. Naruto, Seals regarding Bijou are some of the most highly prized secrets of every hidden village. We cannot simply give it away. Danzo sensei what does it cost us to do so? I will not use any of the best Uzumaki sealing techniques. I will simply separate the Bijou from its host. Imagine if you and Mrs. Shimura were stuck together 24-7 365 and she knew every idea that popped into your head. Not only that, but she could force certain thoughts into your head. That is how Gara has lived his life. Donzo visibly shuddered at the idea. Donzo was a man that required his alone time. Naruto just spelled out one of his nightmares. Fine, Naruto-kun. You have done well diplomatically thus far. Is there any way to incorporate a failsafe should said Jinchuriki be turned against us in the future? No, Donzo-sensei. I am the failsafe. Even if Gara gets complete mastery over Shukaku, I will be far stronger. Bijou suppressing and containment seals are far too complex to try adding foreign elements into the seal. Everyone nodded at this and knew it to be true. Naruto casually thrashed Gara in the finals. Naruto had one last thought to add. Hokage-sama, these negotiations will go on forever via letter. I propose that they send an envoy of council delegate since they do not have a cage. Since they are the ones in the wrong, they should come to us. Set a date for after my original's return. I leave the rest in your capable hands. With a bow, Naruto left the group to discuss. End of flashback. Chapter 19. Naruto sighed as he flashed outside of the Hokaye's office before he casually walked into the office. In the office, he saw Team 9 had just reported in. However, something was different with them. Then he realized it, Lee and Guy were wearing legitimate ninja clothing. Lee and Guy, why do you look so, normal? Was the stunned Naruto's eloquent entrance to the conversation. Ah, Naruto-kun. After our most youthful wager, and my wardrobe change, I started dating Sakura-chan. She said she really liked my new look, so I kept it. Was Lee's overly excited response. Indeed, Naruto-kun. It was the power of love that inspired me as well. The beautiful Mikoto Uchiha agreed to date me as well. She also appreciated my new look. A growl could be heard from the corner of the room behind the Hokage. Dragon, is that you? Your mom is dating my guy? Ha ha ha. That worked out better than my wildest dreams. Naruto was on the floor, rolling around, clutching his side and roaring out in full-blown laughter. Dragon, against all decorum, broke from his spot in the wall. Sharingan blazing from behind his mask. He placed Naruto and Kurama into a genjutsu where they were forced to watch the cursed Lee plus guy genjutsu. 
Naruto was so horror-stricken that it took a full iteration of the scarring genjutsu for him to break free. He could still see the rainbow and hear the ocean waves rolling in. Dragon, that is quite enough. Need I remind you that Naruto is my heir apparent, and thus your superior. Hiruzen's tone was playful but firm. Dragon turned and bowed to the Hokage before returning to his post. Team 9, that will be all. Please have your written reports to me by the end of the day and you have tomorrow off. After Team 9 left, Naruto had the Hokage clear the room, except for Dragon. Sorry, Itachi. I couldn't help it. After his HN response, Naruto continued to tell the Hokage what happened in the Kitsune woods. Dragon's mask fell off he was so stunned and Hiruzen was no better. Naruto snapped a quick picture for a memento. Naruto the brought out Q, who validated Naruto's statement. They noticed his accelerated growth and noted it as further proof that what he said was true. Naruto went into Kitsune sage mode to satiate Hiruzen's curiosity. The feral features, golden slitted eyes, orange markings on the face and an aura that dwarfed any Hiruzen could compare it to. He instinctively knew that Jiraiya could no longer stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Naruto. Then Naruto did the impossible. He entered his golden fox form, his human state of bijou synchronization. The chakra pressure broke all windows and nearly broke through the reinforced floor. The weight of the chakra had almost forced Itachi and Hiruzen to their knees. Both of them were floored. They both acknowledged Naruto as the strongest shinobi in Konoha but deemed that it should be kept a secret due to the threat of Akatsuki. The Hokage told Naruto that he would get a full briefing on the Akatsuki from Jiraiya later. Okay, Naruto-kun. The results of your training are most impressive. The Tsuna delegation will arrive next week for the finalization of the new treaty. Your ideas went over well for the most part. We will have final deliberations and ratification next week. If you wish to adjust Gara's seal, you will need to do so by then. Take the week to work out the seal you want to use. Naruto nodded to the Hokage and disappeared in a yellow flash. Date nights with the ladies. When Naruto returned to the compound, he found out that the girls had some competition to see who would get the first date with Naruto and it was Ino. Naruto picked Ino up from the flower shop that evening and took her to her favorite restaurant. Ino had grown a bit since he last saw her. She had filled out nicely with a C-cup bust hidden behind a purple top that cut off just below her breasts. Think Ino from Shippuden. The dinner was amazing. Naruto always loved Ino's personality, and she had gotten feistier from spending time around Anko. Evidently, Anko had taken Ino as her apprentice. Ino had developed rapidly under the snake mistress and earned a promotion to Chunin at the Kumo Chunin exams. Naruto's clone hadn't made it out to Kumo due to its responsibilities as heir apparent. Naruto paid for dinner before Ino guided Naruto to their next destination. They walked hand in hand through the village talking to each other like nobody else existed. They arrived at the base of a waterfall and a small lake 15 minutes later. Before Naruto could ask, Ino had stripped down to her birthday suit and laid her panties on top of Naruto's head. While Naruto was stripping, Ino jumped into the shallow pond. Naruto jumped in after her and used a burst of speed to swim up behind her and embrace her. She felt his length on her leg for a brief moment before Naruto dunked her underwater. Author's note, there is a lemon here, I can't post it on YouTube as my channel will be taken down. If you want to read it link to the story is in the description. If you are a patron then you can also find the unedited version over there. Naruto attempted to carry Ino and tour her room after flashing back to the house. Unfortunately, nothing is missed when you live in a house with six women. Sometime during his stay in the sage woods, Hinata and Ino had gotten the approval of their parents to move in with Naruto. He liked to think it was because they trusted him completely with their daughters, but it likely had to do with his increased station and meteoric rise to power. Ino was still shaking and exhausted from their session earlier when they were jumped on by Anko and Kurotsuchi. Surprisingly, when out of the public eye, Kurotsuchi really let her hair down and became a bit wild, like Anko and Ino. Once the three started living together, it all kicked into overdrive. Thus, Naruto was left standing in the hallway as Anko and Kurotsuchi locked themselves away in Ino's room for girl talk. Naruto shrugged after staring at Ino's door for a couple seconds before going to make himself some food. Naruto ended up creating clones to cuddle each girl to sleep that night. The next day came and went after a day full of Naruto deciding which route to take with Gara seal. Samui was the next girl in line for dates with Naruto. Samui was always a fun challenge for Naruto. She maintained a very cool exterior, but Naruto knew that is only what she chose to show people. He enjoyed the challenge of getting to Samui's soft and gooey sweet side. Samui chose to wear a light blue, strapless sundress that accentuated her ample bust. In a little less than a year, 
Samui had gone up several cup sizes and now sported a pair of Didi's. The sundress cut off mid-thigh giving Naruto a very pleasant view of her long and toned legs. Samui was a sushi kind of girl, so they walked to the sushi bar in a high-end district of Konoha. Naruto was used to catching looks while walking through town, but the looks with Samui on his arm were far different. There was a lot more gawking from the males and jealous looks from the females. The way Samui pressed herself into him as they walked brought his thoughts back to her. They made small talk until they were seated in a nice booth on the second floor of the fancy sushi restaurant. Once in the booth, Samui chose to slide over to his side and get some quality cuddle time while waiting for the food. The warm saucer of sake also helped to loosen Samui up a bit. Ruto, can I ask you a question? Her timid voice garnered his immediate attention. Sure thing, Samui-chan. Fire away. His cheery voice and disarming smile made her relax a bit. Does it bother you that I am not as sexual as the other girls? Absolutely not, I actually enjoy the different paces. It keeps things fresh. Plus, the way I see it, we have the rest of our lives to enjoy each other's company. Would you still love me, even if I weren't a virgin? Naruto could feel Samui shaking slightly, so he pulled her in closer. Samui proceeded to tell Naruto about how her adoptive father started to sexually abuse her when she was 10. He did it for a whole year before Yugito found out and spilled his guts in a bar in Kumo. I then let Yugito adopt and raise Samui until she was 13 and graduated from the ninja academy at the top of her class. Naruto was at a loss for words. He was enraged by what he heard, but he knew that wasn't what Samui needed. She needed to know that he would love her through it all. He pulled her onto his lap and snaked her arms around her belly. He used a light application of chakra on several pressure point in her midsection to help her relax. He continued to hold her close, listen to her and whisper soft reassurances in her ear until their food arrived. Samui decided to go to the other side of the table so they could look at each other while eating. Thank you for telling me, Samui-chan. Know that I will honor you in all that I do. I love you and you can set the pace you're comfortable with. She nodded and continued eating. Ruto really got her to drop her walls. She didn't feel like she needed the cool personality around him. He was the first man to ever break through the facade she wore and for that, she could safely say she loved him. After dinner, Naruto told Samui that he had a surprise for her. He walked her to a massage parlor, and they entered a room together. Instead of the couple's massage that she was expecting, Naruto asked her to strip and lay on the table. For the next hour, two Narutos worked her over from head to foot. The Narutos use variations of chakra and massage oil to enhance the massage and put Samui into a comfort coma of sorts. Authors note, there is a lemon here if you want to read it link to the story is in the description. Naruto once again flashed them back to the house. They cuddled on the couch together while the girls interrogated Samui about their date. They each cooed over the adorable look in Samui's eyes as she recalled the date for them. The jealousy Naruto could detect from them when Samui told them about the sensual massage made Naruto laugh. Naruto ended up sleeping alone with Samui that night because he wanted to make her feel special. The next day, Naruto went to visit the San siblings. They had been cooped up in a house that was made to house foreign dignitaries. It was a nice house, but a prison is a prison. Tamari answered the door shortly after Naruto knocked. The annoyed look on her face turned to confusion when he asked if he could enter. She took him to the living room where Gara and Konkuro were watching TV. Naruto didn't miss the flash of fear in Gara's eyes when he recognized him. I am sure you have been told that the treaty should be signed in a couple of days. I apologize that it took me so long to get here, I had some summoning clan business that I had to attend to. They didn't give him a verbal response so her continued. I came here to offer you help, Gara. I can see the separation from you Bijou has mellowed you out quite a bit. At this Gara nodded, it has been good to sleep again. However, I haven't been able to use chakra since you placed that seal on me. It makes me feel very vulnerable. Like I said, it was never my intention to take this long. Diplomacy got in the way. To be frank, your village didn't want to pay the leaf for my services. They have already compiled quite the bill from the failed invasion. That is why I offered to do it for free. Tamari stepped in, why would you do that? Why help a potential enemy and somebody who already betrayed you? Naruto locked eyes with Tamari. She was taken aback by the depth and compassion she saw in them. It forced her own eyes and posture to soften in response. Naruto answered her question. I don't know if you know, but I started the negotiations between the Leaf, Kumo, Kiri, and Iwa. Shortly after the invasion, a treaty was signed, largely due to my influence. I made an appeal to them that I will make to you. I care not for grudges of the past. I care not for greed or power. 
all of my efforts are focused on forming a better world for my children, my children's children and as many others as I can along the way. I am the Jin Churiki of the Kyubi no Kitsune, he does not wish me to share his name with you. When I befriended him, I made a promise to help my fellow Jin Churiki and Q's brethren whenever I had the chance. Gara's seal is an atrocity that harmed him and Shukaku. I intend to fix that. What Gara does with that power is up to him, but I would encourage him to create an understanding with Shukaku. Naruto took a deep breath after his monologue. The San siblings were speechless, especially Gara. His whole life he had been persecuted and his life had been under threat. Shukaku kept him alive at the cost of his sanity. Gara knew that after these eight months of peace, Gara didn't want to go back to the insanity. Will a new seal allow me to sleep? He asked in a submissive tone. Yes, and it should allow you use of your sand again as well. I do not know how much of your sand ability was you and how much was Shukaku. From what I understand, abilities such as yours run in your family so it is possible Shukaku's chakra just enhanced your natural ability. It was Konkuro that asked a question this time. What made you do all of this? Why go this far for strangers? Why reach out to the other villages? Naruto chuckled at the question before responding. I am the last of the Uzumaki and Namikaze clans. My mother's clan, the Uzumaki, left a parting message for any survivor that found the vault in Uzushiagakor. They asked me to let go of past grudges and rebuild the Uzumaki clan to former glory. My father endeavored to bring peace to the elemental nations before making the ultimate sacrifice. I inherited my dreams from them and came to accept it in my own way. Because of my lineage, I was raised in secrecy. That secrecy was only broken a little less than two years ago. Rather than run from the past grudges my lineage carried with it, I ran toward them. Kumo, Iwa and Kiri destroyed the Uzumaki clan. My father left deep scars on Kumo and Iwa. I focused on burying the past and moving toward the better future. My appeal to I and Onoki worked and here we are. Now I make a similar offer to you. The San siblings were blinded by the light that emanated from Naruto. They had never been shown such kindness or sincerity before. Their father always treated them with a cold, militaristic practicality and in Gara's case, hatred. It didn't hurt that those blue eyes and killer smile practically demanded access to their souls. It felt like everything was laid bare before him. I will trust you Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. Naruto's smile lit up further. He informed Gara that he would return tomorrow and take him to his compound. The ceiling would be done there. Naruto disappeared in a yellow flash leaving three stunned siblings to figure out what the fuck just happened. Naruto returned the next day and escorted the three siblings to his compound. The clones were fewer in number today, a mere fifty, out in the training grounds. The sand siblings still gawked at the clones on the way in. Naruto saw Jiraiya waiting for them in the living room. After brief introductions, the group made their way down to the study. Once again, Naruto had done an amazing amount of prep work drawing seals all over the floor of him father's study. Naruto had Gara strip off his top and two clones began drawing the intricate seals on his body starting from the seal's origin, his heart. While the clones were drawing the seals onto him, Naruto let Gara in on part of his plan. I am going to use Q's chakra and enter your mindscape to have a discussion with Shukaku. I believe I will be able to locate and isolate the foreign element while I am in there. You will come in with me. Be warned, since there is no separation, we will be in the same area as Shukaku. Shukaku will likely be in a foul mood after having his chakra suppressed for so long. I would advise you to use this opportunity to make a proper introduction and aim to put old issues to rest. At Gara's nod, Naruto had him sit down in a meditative posture. The clones continued their work while Naruto put his hand Gara's head. He closed his eyes, focused on his link to Kurama and entered Gara's mindscape. Naruto appeared in a desert with the sun bearing down with Gara on his left and Kurama behind him. The only thing that stood out against the endless dunes was a giant cave. Shortly after they arrived, the giant San Tanuki emerged from the cave. He stood about 20 stories tall, had his full body and tail made of a dull brown sand with what appeared to be tattoo markings running along the length of its body. The tiny, beaded golden eyes looked down on the group, except Kurama who towered over the Tanuki. The Tanuki let out a great shriek and yelled at his visitors in a shrieky voice, Be gone, brother, you are not welcomed here. Naruto spoke in a calm, yet firm tone. I care not if you invited us in. I have come here to deliver a message and a warning that you will heed, Shukaku snapped his mouth shut and waited for the boy to speak. First, I will be reworking your seal to make it more comfortable for you and Gara. I recommend you learn how to work with your Jinchuriki, as I have worked with Kurama. Now, this got a reaction from Shukaku. 
First the tanuki reeled back in surprise and gaped its mouth. Then it bellowed out its laughter. E, he hey a e hey a. The almighty Kurama brought to heal by a human boy. Never thought I would see the day. Shukaku was cut off as Naruto entered his golden kubi state and flared his aura. Immediately behind him, Kurama assumed a menacing posture, snarled and flared his aura as well. Even if the giant tanuki was at full power, this would have silenced him immediately. Naruto's voice carried a sharp warning edge to it as he said, This is your one warning, Shukaku. You will respect my partner in my presence of suffer my wrath. Now remain silent, lest I lose my patience with you. Kurama snickered at the verbal beating his little brother just received. The warning I have come to share is that a group of S-ranked missing ninja will soon make their move on the bijou. We do not know what they want with the bijou, but we do know that, at your current level, you are an easy target. Thus, why I told you to work with Gara. Shukaku sneered at this. Me, work with that boy? I fear no human. Naruto cut Shukaku off with a Kurama-enhanced gale palm that sent him flying. When the Tanuki landed on his back, he opened his eyes to see Naruto on his snout looking down on him. Shukaku, you are an immobile opponent with glaring weaknesses on your own. I have no doubt, that should you break out of Gara's seal, that this group is prepared to handle you. I could handle you without the use of Kurama's chakra. You will work with Gara to get stronger, or you will both die. It is as simple as that. Now, sit here and be a good tanuki while I got and say hello to the priest. Naruto jumped off Shukaku's snout and appeared at the entrance to a dark cave. The stalagmites hanging down dripped water in an eerie drip, drip that echoed across the cave. Naruto entered what he assumed to be the main area to see a man in white cloth, with a sash across his abdomen, watch him enter. Before the priest could speak, a claw formed from Kurama's chakra stretched out from Naruto's arm and ensnared the priest. The priest became coated in the fiery red chakra and screamed as his existence was snuffed out. Naruto didn't feel like listening to the ramblings of a madman. Hopefully, by doing this, Shukaku will have some peace inside the seal. Naruto had nothing left to say to the Tanuki, so he closed his eyes and withdrew from the mindscape. Outside the seal, Kankuro and Tamari had watched Naruto enter his golden kubi state and saw a brief spark of red chakra around Gara's seal. They dared not make a move with Jiraiya watching them. Shortly after, Naruto and Gara opened their eyes. Gara looked at his siblings and gave them a nod to show he was okay. Naruto clapped his hands together, okay, Gara, that was the easy part. Naruto then put Gara into a medically induced sleep and lay him in the seal matrix written on the floor of the training room. He once again entered his gold state and tore off the suppressant seal that he had applied to Gara eight months ago. There was an immediate presence of Shukaku's chakra that permeated the room. Naruto then channeled chakra into the sealing array. It went much the same as it did for Anko. First the array around the room collapsed to surround Gara. then Kanji began moving along Gara's skin and causing severe discomfort. Finally, the kanji coalesced around Gara's heart until it shaped into the Uzumaki swirl. Naruto reverted into a normal state, inspected his handiwork and escorted Tamari and Konkuro, who was carrying Gara, back to their lodgings. He parted, letting them know he would see them in a few days. A few hours later, Gara woke up from his sleep to find that he could use his chakra again. He played with small amounts of sand in his palm as he talked to his brother and sister. After verifying he was okay, something strange happened. Tamari noticed Gara was smiling, not the creepy, sadistic smile, but a genuine smile. Then Gara spoke and blew his siblings' minds. I think I will do all I can to help Naruto achieve his dreams. I will first make Tsuna a better place to live. Then, should Naruto ever need my help, I will help him achieve his peace. Meanwhile, back on the Namikaze compound, it was Kurotsuchi's turn to go out on the town with Naruto. She chose to wear a sleeker and sexier version of her combat attire. She wore a ruby red dress that covered the left arm and left the right arm exposed. The dress hugged her figure down to the slit on the left leg that revealed all the way to her upper thigh. Naruto picked her up in an orange button-down shirt with a unique golden Uzumaki swirl surrounding the kubi on the back. They walked around the Konoha market, stopping at vendors to look at knickknacks and other things they found interesting. They made their way to a dumpling stand that Kurotsuchi had taken a shine to. They enjoyed a light dinner there before a movie. Kurotsuchi wanted to watch the new Princess Gale movie that starred her favorite actress, Yuki Fujikase. Naruto could care less about the movie, but it was great spending time alone with Kurotsuchi. Much like Samui, Kuro posed a tough exterior figure with a soft and sweet inside. During the movie, hand-holding, turn to cuddling turn to making out, finally turn to hands wandering. 
the couple's antics were largely ignored by the other people in the theater thanks to a genjutsu Kuro put up. When the movie was finally over, Kuro asked Naruto if they could go to the Hokage Monument. Being up high on the mountain made her feel at home. They enjoyed the view for a couple of minutes before Kuro climbed into his lap and straddled him. Naruto's hand found their place on Kuro's tight reed end and began squeezing in gentle provocation. She smiled down at his chiseled face before kissing him. Naruto was working on a chakra sensation theory he had developed since mastering his Kyofu sensual arts. Essentially, Naruto used his chakra to invade the person's sensory system and amped up their sensitivity to stimulation. This ecstasy had the side effect of being quite addictive. After a thorough makeout session on the Yondaime's head, the two returned to the house. Kuro had explained how she wanted to save the rest of the sexual stuff for after marriage. This risk of political fallout was too high otherwise, and Naruto respected that. Instead, she enjoyed a massage from Naruto and a solid night of cuddling with her dream man. The next day passed with nothing special happening and it was Hinata's turn to go out on a date with Naruto. Naruto was blown away by the lavender dress that Hinata was wearing. It protected her modesty quite thoroughly by have only a slight dip to the chest, but it left both arms exposed. The dress continued all the way to Hinata's high-heeled shoes. However, due to its form-fitting nature, it showed off Hinata's tremendous bust. At a little over 14 years old, Hinata was sporting D-cup breasts, a flat and toned stomach and a plump ass. It made Naruto grateful that she always wore the baggy clothes to keep the boys away. Unlike his previous dates, he had the misfortune of running into his old classmates. Hinata wanted ramen, so Naruto had booked the premium lounge at Ichiraku. On their way there, they were holding hands and having a great time until a certain moot showed up. Oi, Naruto, you bastard. First, I see you out with Ino, then that sexy proctor from our exams and now Hinata. How dare you play Hinata-chan for a fool. The angry voice of Kiba carried across the market district and caused more than a few people to look at him askance. Kiba, shut your mouth before I muzzle you. There are things that you don't understand, and I quite frankly don't have the patience to explain to you. So, I will say this once, Moot, get out of my way and go ask your mom to see the wedding invite she received. Naruto's voice carried a deadly edge to it. Kiba knew he was outclassed, but Hinata was the one girl that he had his eyes on from his class. Seeing Hinata in that beautiful dress emboldened Kiba's feral instincts. He attempted to puff out his chest and assert his dominance on Naruto. Naruto brushed it aside and asserted his aura. Even though he focused it on Kiba, it still caused the ground around his feet to crack and the wind chimes in a vendor's shop to go haywire. Kiba instantly backed down, with his tail between his legs. In a meek voice, he said. You deserve better, Hinata-chan. This guy doesn't appreciate you the way I do. Hinata put a hand on Naruto's shoulder to halt his response. She stepped forward boldly and looked Kiba in the eye. What makes you think you know anything about Naruto-kun? Despite having six of us girls, he treats us all better than we ever imagined. Now stop ruining our date, Kiba-san, and run along. She made a shooing movement with her hand. Naruto couldn't hold back his laughter. The ever-gracious Hinata Hayuga just made a doggy joke to Kiba. Oh, this was gold. He couldn't wait to share the memory with Q, he would never stop rubbing this in the lil pup's face. The sad and dejected look on Kiba's face didn't even bother him. He just scooped Hinata up bridal style and made his way to Ichiraku's ramen. It was Naruto's first time in the premium lounge at the Ichiraku's restaurant. The years had been good to Ayame and Tuchi. It helped that Naruto's harem and everyone close to them loved to eat at the restaurant. The lounge was nice, with a private and comfortable table for two nestled between two love seats. Hinata chose Naruto's lap for her seat. She really appreciated the privacy of the lounge, it let her bring out her inner freak. A blushing Ayame entered the room to see the two making out. She greeted them both warmly, took their orders and swore to knock before entering next time. Hinata had come the furthest in the past nine months. Her shyness around Naruto eroded away and her freak side was stoked by the flames of Anko and Ino. Those two were wild. However, unlike Anko and Ino, Hinata could keep her inner freak on a leash in public. They enjoyed the ramen and sake before moving on to the next part of their date. Tonight, there was a show put on in the Konoha Theater. It happened to be a play about two star-crossed lovers, whose families hated each other, blah, 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 dude gets himself killed and this Juliet chick offs herself. Hinata was moved to tears while Naruto put on a fake smile and applauded. It wasn't his kind of thing, but tonight wasn't about him, it was about Hinata. Hinata modeled after Kurotsuchi and Samui when it came to sex. She would save it for after marriage because if she did it before marriage her father would likely kill Naruto. 
That didn't stop her from giving Naruto some of the best head he had ever received. She saw how he would apply chakra during the light touching and petting sessions they had previously. She just applied that concept with her hands, mouth and tongue. She looked so gorgeous with the little kum dribble coming from her lips. Fortunately, or unfortunately, for Hinata, she awoke the beast in Naruto. His tongue and fingers left her in a crumpled heap on a soaked bed. She cuddled up into the warmth and safety of his chest and enjoyed a wonderful night's sleep. Haku was a quite possibly one of Naruto's greatest challenges. The girl had grown up subservient to the will of her master, Zabuza. Unfortunately, this mentality had carried over to Naruto. Him and his clones had tried to break her of the submissive habit with minor success. There have been marginal improvements, but she immediately cowed to Naruto's will. He decided to make her choose the date's itinerary for the night. After a long day of working on space-time fuinjutsu techniques, he was exhausted, and he wanted Haku to decide their destiny for the night. Naruto was pleased when she chose the same sushi restaurant that Samui did because it showed him that she was favoring her preferences. They enjoyed a quiet dinner where Naruto discovered more about her wants and dreams for the future. She had struggled to think of a dream for the future the first time Naruto had asked her. However, she gave him his answer tonight. Naruto-kun, what I want is to become your wife and lead a branch of the Uzumaki clan. I want to pass on my bloodline to our children and train them. I so desperately want to see this peace you so passionately speak of. I would like to further my training in the medical arts and get a job at the hospital here. While I will continue to be a shinobi until I am with child, I would like to have that job to fall back on. As for the future, I just want you and our future family in it. The look on her face was radiant as she said this. She was wearing a long sleeve, v-neck blue shirt with white edging that gave just a glimpse of her cleavage from above. It was the exposed midsection that barely covered the under boob that really got Naruto going though. The way she squeezed his hand while Hazel met Azure blue eyes furthered her allure. Naruto was pleased with this development and let her know as much. They had a great dinner with a more two-sided conversation than Naruto was used to having with Haku. Haku chose to go on a hike through the woods near Konoha's wall. She chose a trail that had a wonderful waterfall on its path. They sat on a rock atop the waterfall and talked some more. The sun had yet to fall when she requested Naruto to take her to her room. When Naruto walked in, he saw some light bondage gear laid out on the bed. He took a step back and held her shoulders with straight arms. Making sure to maintain eye contact, he waited for her to explain. Ruto, I will do my best to be more assertive in our daily lives. However, when I was listening to the other girls' experiences with your clones, I thought about what I would prefer in their situation. I want to be submissive to you in the bedroom, Ruto. I want you to own me and ravage my body when we are within the confines of my bedroom. Will you do this for me? Haku broke out the puppy dog eyes and broke Naruto's will to resist. Chapter 20 Naruto donned his game face the next day as Hinata helped him adorn his formal yukata. Since returning from the sage woods, Naruto had been holding the two clan head seats in all village council meetings. For most meetings, he sent shadow clones. However, today was the day the sand envoy arrived, and he was called to join the negotiations. He entered the council chamber and only Hiruzen, Jiraiya, Danzo, Baki, the sand siblings and two other Tsuna counselors were in the room. He took the seat to Hiruzen's right before the meeting began. Greetings and thank you for traveling to join us in negotiations. We have agreed upon many of the terms through previous correspondence. Let us now review those terms. For the duration of the following treaty, Konoha agrees to redirect missions from the Wind Daimyo to Tsuna. For the next five years, Tsuna will pay 10% of its GDP to Konoha for payment of attempted invasion. For the next year, an additional 5% will be taken to cover the cost of repairs. For the release of all Tsuna Shinobi, totaling 147, Tsunaga Corps will give Konoha copies of all Wind and Jutsu scrolls and a compendium of poisons and antidotes. For the next 10 years, Tsuna and Konoha agree to trades of timber, water and food in exchange for iron, salt and oil. These trades shall be tariff-free. Tsunaga Corps will pay 2 million Rio over the next 10 years for the return of Subaku no Gara, Kankura, and Tamari. Addendum, if Tamari marries a ninja of the leaf and takes on an ambassadorial role, this shall be reduced to 200,000 Rio. Both villages agree to a mutual non-aggression treaty for the next 10 years, or for the duration of any political marriage. Upon violation of any of the above listed terms, Konoha retains the right to void this treaty and seek compensation by conquest. In good faith, the hidden leaf has strengthened the seal of the Jinchuriki Tsubaku no Gara. There is no compensation required for this action. These terms are now open to discussion. Baki hated that he was appointed the interim Kazekage. 
to handle the responsibility for the complete submission of Tsuna will not look good in the history books. It was his goal today to ensure that Tsunagakor got to exist long enough to write said history books. Thank you, Hokage Dono. As you said, we have agreed to a good number of those terms prior to today. Tsuna wishes to offer Konoha 5C rank, 5B rank, 3A rank and 1S rank wind and jutsu. The other jutsu fall under clan rights and Tsuna law. In return, we will provide samples of each poison and antidote along with a compendium of knowledge. Is this agreeable? Hiruzen looked at his counsel briefly before nodding his consent. Tsunagakor wishes to offer Tsubaku no Tamari's hand in marriage to Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. We find no other suitor worthy of her, and she has expressed as much. Baki-san, if that is the case then we will need to recess for the night. I have already informed Hokage-sama that such decision must fall upon my wives. In addition, I have already chosen the maximum number of spouses allowed to me under the CRA. You will have to receive the approval of Konoha's counsel to amend said law. I would never forsake those who have so readily given their hearts to me. Furthermore, I make no such guarantee that Tamari and I will be married. I will only marry for love, nothing else. Thank you, Naruto maintained a professional tone. He had prepared himself for this possibility, but it still annoyed him. Tamari had listened to Naruto speak. She had heard about his harem of sorts and wondered if she would be forced to join it. From Tsuna's angle, it must be Naruto because Naruto is the link to all other villages. Even if Tamari married some other clan heir from Konoha, it would do very little to help Tsuna in the long run. Not to mention, the way he carries himself, his looks, his power, his passion and his determination set him far above all others his age. Then he went and helped Gara for no reason other than he wants to help those with the same burden as him, and if Gara is to be believed he wants to help the bijou. Yeah, she agreed with Tsuna, it was Naruto or bust. Naruto-san, forgive me for speaking out of turn. Am I that unappealing to you as a wife? Would you not fight for my hand in marriage? Tamari's voice was timid and lacked confidence. Maybe it was because she had stood and spoke before she had even thought it through. I meant no such offense, Tamari-san. I am sure you are a wonderful woman. Your skills as a kunoichi are superb and you are beautiful to boot. The problems I have with this arrangement are those I stated before. The CRA allows up to three wives per clan. If I do not set the limit there, then I will end up like the legend of King Solomon from ancient times. I am not greedy or proud enough to covet more wives. If my village asks it of me, and we get along well, then that is one issue. However, I have six women that share my heart. They are my strength, my love and my future. I cannot make this decision without them. I apologize if this causes you any distress. Naruto bowed to show her his sincerity. His words silenced her and the rest of the rebuttals from Suna. Danzo spoke up, we will take your petition to the Konoha Council and Naruto-kun's wives-to-be. We can reconvene in three days, if that works for you, Hokage Dono? Very well. Give us three days to consider the offer. I am sure you know this, Baki-san, but Naruto is the greatest prize of Konoha on multiple fronts, I would highly advise that you don't act like you are doing us a favor by offering Tamari-san exclusively to him. I put that addendum in there to give you a way out, for it is not my wish to forcefully annex Tsuna. Enjoy your stay in Konoha. Hiruzen's words carried a warning that was duly received. After the Tsuna representative cleared the room, Danzo and Hiruzen tried to open Naruto up to the idea. They were sure they could get the council to agree. They were unsure about the girl's approving thought. Hiruzen had been watching Naruto's dates in the crystal ball. Naruto put a tremendous amount of effort into making each girl feel special. It is doubtful the girls wish to share him more than they already have. Naruto only said he would think about it. He was dismissed for the night and returned to the compound. He sent out clones to retrieve his girls for a talk. Anko was already in the house waiting for a date, however, she saw the look on Naruto's face and asked for a rain check. He gave a meek apology to her, but he promised her a rain check. Since it was Anko's night, she sat on the real Naruto's lap and each girl chose to accept a clone for the meeting. Okay, girls, I swear I did nothing this time. The only reason I even ask you to think about this is because it is another major village. My feelings up front, Tamari is pretty and strong. I don't know her much more than that. I don't know how she feels, all I could pick up was concern and anxiety during the meeting. I am not exactly against it, yet I am reluctant to actively pursue it. I promise that I would bring this issue to you, and it has been brought. I will stay and listen to you talk it out so that I may get my cuddle time in. It makes me feel better. Naruto sounded tired, which was highly unusual for the blonde ball of energy. Anko took the lead, as she often does. I don't know this girl either. 
a big part of me says make her choose another man, but I can see only boys amongst your age group. I understand why she would choose our Ruto kun. Really, it comes down to do we feel like sharing even more than we currently are and how she would fit in with us girls. We all know she will fall for Ruto. Kurotsuchi picked up the mic next. I see the political merit in bringing her in. We would have a representative from each of the big five. That in itself is significant. I don't mind including her so long as she develops genuine feelings for Ruto. Surprisingly, Haku spoke next. She had just woken up from her sex-induced coma. I put Ruto in the same situation. I knew him for less than a week prior to the tuning exams. It would be hypocritical of me to refute on those grounds. Additionally, I know Naruto's heart is big enough for one more. I would like to ask you, Ruto-kun, what is you so drained about this whole thing? Naruto gave a dry chuckle before responding. I know I started this in an effort toward peace. For the large part, it has worked. However, it has worked too well. I feel it unfair of me to put each of you in this situation. I do wish we had more time together and that the pace would slow down a little bit. Then, there is this part of me that knows that I am the only person Tsuna could possibly ask for because of the position I find myself in. A part of me feels guilty for wanting to refuse the offer outright in defense of what I already have. Anko kissed Ruto passionately to break him out of his tailspin. Ruto, you are driving yourself in circles. Relax. This could never make us love you any less. Take a deep breath. We are, and will always be, here for you. Each of their girls wrapped their arms tightly around their clone at this statement. I don't know what I did to deserve you all. Kami blessed me so much already that I dare not ask for or expect more. Naruto's tears filled and clouded his azure blue eyes but refused to fall. Samui spoke up, Ruto-kun, I love you. It is clear that you are distressed about this. I think it is fair to say that if you asked each of us a year ago would sharing you with five other girls be cool, the answer would have been a resounding no. Now, I can't imagine my life without my sisters. That is thanks to your love, Ruto-kun. Ino chimed in with a perky voice. All in favor of giving Tamari a shot, say aye. Those that disagree, say nay. On the count of three, one, two, three. A round of I was heard by six different voices. That settled the great Tamari debate. Naruto didn't think about Tamari again all night, Anko made sure of that. She had drawn inspiration from each of her sister's stories and incorporated a mix throughout the night. Nothing drags a teenage boy from the pit of depression like hot, passionate sex. The rest of the girls thought along similar lines and gave their clones blowjobs, Kuro's was probably the best. After waking up, he reviewed the clone's memories and couldn't help but smile. Then he took Anko to the shower for a couple quickies that turned out not to be so quick. Two days later the council convened and agreed to let Tamari court Naruto. They gave a one-year period for the two to develop feelings. Thus, even if it worked out, Tamari would likely not marry Naruto at the same time as the other girls. With that item on the treaty addressed, the treaties were signed. All Tsuna ninja, including Tamari, left the next day. Naruto gave Tamari a three-pronged kunai with his seal so that he could pick her up in two weeks' time. Four months later, wedding day. Konoha was in a hectic state. Citizens were running everywhere setting up for what appeared to be a festival. Konoha was illuminated by the sun, and you could see lanterns, streamers, banners and various party supplies. A closer look around would show that Konoha spared no expense in preparing for the grand occasion. Over the main gate, the flags of Iwa, Kumo, Kiri and Konoha flew. They were positioned equal to each other as a sign of partnership and goodwill. The flags were flanked by Jonin and Chunin patrols that were monitoring the overwhelming number of foreign visitors entering Konoha. The village security was at maximum to prevent anything from interrupting this monumental moment in history. At the front gate, all clan heads, the civilian council and the Hokage stood behind Naruto. Naruto was given the honor of greeting the various cage and daimyo into the village. Naruto had extended an invitation to the rice country daimyo. He had been working alongside Hiruzen and Naruto's clone since the invasion to annex rice country and get it under Konoha's protection. In return, the rice daimyo had been helping to root out Orochimaru's old hideouts in an effort to eliminate the lingering forces. The Hokage was concerned about the prisoner who escaped during the invasion, Kabuto Yakashi, who was Orochimaru's right-hand man. Unfortunately, they had yet to locate this man. The raids on all of Orochimaru's hideouts in rice, fire, lightning and earth countries had been very successful. The country shared information on this subject freely and convened a joint council on what to do with his research. Most of it was vile and the countries agreed unanimously to destroy it. However, there is always some light in the darkness. 
Orochimaru had stumbled upon some medical cures and captured many prisoners with bloodlines from all over the elemental nations. This medical information was shared amongst the villages and the prisoners were given back to their respective countries. After greeting the rice daimyo and thanking his for his efforts and aid in rooting out Odogakor, Naruto spent the rest of the day greeting at the gate. It had been an exhausting, yet fruitful, day. Much to his protestation, the village council had taken over control of the wedding guest list, since the village was funding the wedding. Actually, Naruto would fully admit that he had almost zero control over the wedding. He just went along for the ride and supported his girls any way he could. Tamari was also the head coordinator for the wedding party. Each girl had brought one girl to stand next to them as a maid of honor. Naruto had elected one friend for best man for each of his six girls. It was Tamari's job to coordinate for these people and ensure they knew what to do for the wedding. The wedding day arrived and the Namikaze estate was bustling with brides and their attendants running around preparing. The girls were staging at the Namikaze compound before heading to the Uzumaki shrine. The village had agreed to upgrade the Uzumaki shrine and turned it into one of the largest shrines in Konoha. The Uzumaki had always honored their direct link to the Sinigami, so the shrine had various tributes to the Sinigami. Naruto had drawn out a rendition of his seal and that was the centerpiece that was proudly displayed on the front of the shrine now. He said that it would honor the new pact his clans were forming with the god. The girls shared a chaotic staging area in the shrine. Women from various countries were running around performing various tasks for their respective brides. The room was pandemonium incarnate. One wedding was bad enough, seven weddings at once was hell. Tsunade was in a particular in a mood. She wanted a small wedding with Jiraiya but had been overruled by the old monkey. He said the Sanin were of international importance and should share the stage with Naruto. Thus, Tsunade had relented and was going to be married the same day as her adoptive son. Shizun was running around the staging room handing out drinks to everyone. Tsunade then stood in her beautiful dress and raised her saucer in the air. All right, listen up. It is a tradition for the bride to share a drink with her wedding party before the wedding. Now, that means I wish to share a drink with all of the brides-to-be and those important to them. I propose a toast to getting this crazy day over with. At the wide eyes in the room she added, and to the health and prosperity of all couples married today. Everyone drank to that. In front of the shrine, 500 chairs were grown directly from the ground by Yamato, Konoha's last Makutan user. Each chair was filled by important people from around the elemental nations. In front of the chairs were seven elaborately decorated tresses where each of the brides would be positioned. In front of six of the tresses stood a copy of Naruto, dressed in an elegant red kimono. The kimono bore the Uzumaki Namikaze crest on its back. Over its heart was the union symbol for the elemental nations. This logo was an Uzumaki-styled swirl with the kanji for earth, wind, fire, water and lightning within the five blades of the whirlpool. It was an internationally recognized symbol for shinobi that acted as ambassadors in any international task force. Under the far-left tress, Jiraiya stood in a fire-red tuxedo. The old perv had cleaned his white, spiky hair up and had it situated into a tame ponytail. The Mizukage, Tsuchikage, and Reikage, decorated in their respective ornamental garments, stood in front of three tresses where their kunoichi were to be married. Hiruzen stood in front of the tress by Jiraiya. The fire daimyo stood in front of the fifth tress. The sixth and seventh tresses did not have anyone alongside Naruto. An orchestral band played a song denoting the arrival of the wedding party. A procession walked down the main aisle toward the front. Kakashi and Shizun walked down the aisle and positioned themselves next to Jiraiya and Tsunade. Zabuza and a mist Kunoichi did the same and stood in front of the Mizukage. Amoe and Yugito walked down the aisle and stood in front of the rakage. Akatsuchi and Kurotsuchi's maid of honor stopped in front of Onoki. Gekko Hayate and Yuzuki Yugao stopped in front of the fire daimyo. Sakura and Sasuke stopped in front of the sixth tress. Finally, Neji and Tenten stopped in front of the seventh tress. The music changed to announce the brides. Tusbaki walked arm in arm with Tsunade followed by Haku and Zabuza, B and Samui, Kurotsuchi and her father, Anko and Hana Inuzuka, Ino and Inoiki and Hinata and Hayashi. Each escort handed off the brides to Jiraiya or a Naruto. Inoiki and Hayashi then took their places in front of the sixth and seventh tresses respectively. Q appeared on an elevated platform in front of all seven tresses. Welcome esteemed guests, we thank you for joining us for this grand celebration, I am Q and will be the master of ceremonies. Today we celebrate the marriage Tsunade Senju and Jiraiya, two very important people to the groom. We also come together today to celebrate the union of Haku of the Mist, Samui of Kumo, Kurotsuchi of the Stone, Anko of the Leaf, Ino of the Leaf and Hinata of the Leaf to Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. 
For those of you who don't know me, I am the QB no Kitsune, Naruto's soul bound partner. While Jiraiya may be a lovable knucklehead, Naruto is a human of fierce intelligence, respect, humility, strength, determination, and love. Today, we come to celebrate love and all of the blessings it brings. It is our sincere hope that the love we celebrate today will be the starting point on the path to peace. Please begin the ceremonies. The audience watched as Jiraiya married Tsunade. Tsunade was wearing an elegant white strapless wedding dress with her hair let down and flowing freely behind her. She had a Senju style hair ornament with a glowing green crystal embossed with the Senju emblem. A polite round of applause went up after the two exchanged vows and rings. The weddings for Naruto and his girls follow the same, ceremonial script until it was time to exchange vows and rings. This is also where each ceremony was allowed to diverge and follow the tradition of each girl. The Mizukage stepped forward, carrying an ornate ceremonial bowl of sea water. Naruto Uzumaki and Haku Momochi, as all things came from the sea, so do we ask the sea to bless this union. May then had them link hands. She sprinkled water on each of their foreheads before placing the joint hands into the bowl. Haku wore a beautiful ice blue, long sleeve wedding dress with a high collar that kissed her neck. The wedding dress had a diamond shaped cutout that showed off modest cleavage and accentuated her beauty. The backless dress contrasted the modesty of the front, almost completely exposed and coming to a point just above her shapely rear. She looked longingly at Naruto. Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, the most unpredictable ninja and owner of my heart. You gave my life new meaning and inspired me to find a new purpose for my life. I love you for your pure heart and selfless strength. You came into my life and turned my world upside down in the best way possible. I am yours. I will love you till the day the sea reclaims my body and hope our souls find each other in the pure world. Haku Uzumaki, we started out as enemies in the land of waves. I felt the purity of your heart and chakra as soon as I met you. When I removed your mask, your beauty disarmed me and made my heart skip to beat. The trust you chose to place in me since then has only grown. I vow to love and cherish you. To hold you when you're cold and be there when you feel alone. Kami blessed me with you, my ice princess. From now till the day I die, I love you. Naruto's voice wavered slightly with emotion, but still carried for all to hear. After Naruto's vows, the next ceremony began. The rakage stepped forward holding a ceremonial band decorated in lightning. Samui and Naruto Namikaze, may the clouds bless you and hold you. May you be spared their wrath in storms, sheltered from the burning sun in their shade and may your life be blessed by their absence on sunny days. May your union earn the favor of Kami in heaven. You may now exchange vows. I hand them join hands and wrap the ceremonial cloth around their wrists, binding them together. Samui wore a truly stunning white dress, it wrapped around her neck in a thin strip and exposed her chest and back. The chest area was modest but enticing, while the back showed off the strength and beauty of a top-notch kunoichi. Samui started, Ruto, from the moment I read your letter, I knew you were something special. When I saw you for the first time, my feelings reawakened. The feelings that you awoke in me brought color to my life and fullness to my heart. I vow to remain yours, and only yours. To walk alongside you on this perilous path toward peace. I love you like crazy and will love you long after Kami calls me to the pure world. Naruto wiped a tear from his eye before responding to her vows. Samui Namikaze, my cool wife he paused to let the laughter die down from the Kumo crowd that knew Samui. What started as a crazy idea in my head has turned into the greatest blessing of my life. My beautiful and unshakable lightning princess. You bring calm and sanity to the chaos of my life. When I am with you, my heart is at peace. I vow to love you, cherish you and walk alongside you for the rest of my days. This Naruto clone wiggled his eyebrows and squeezed her hand when he said, Love you. Samui's giggles and the beautiful smile on her face lit up the area under Tress 3. Onoki took over after Naruto's second set of vows. He walked forward carrying an old stone that had ancient carvings of a man and woman holding each other on it. It was the matrimonial stone of Iwa. He had Kurotsuchi and Naruto each place a hand on it, they decided their free hands would hold each other's. Kurotsuchi Kamazura and Naruto Uzumaki. The will of stone is the strength to endure all things. As the earth's surface shapes and bends itself to the whims of time, it maintains its strong foundation. May your union be blessed by the stone. May you endure all of life's struggles together and may your foundation of love last for all your days. You may now exchange vows. Kurotsuchi's black eyes with pink irises peered into the depth of the azure blue orbs. She was wearing a ruby red dress, her hair trailed in waves to her mid-back. She adorned a beautiful golden hair ornament with the Kamazura family crest seen through the ruby. Ruto, you are a strange one. 
You transformed a bloodborne grudge into an olive branch. The best decision of my life was giving you a chance. Since reading your letters, my love for you has grown daily. My heart aches when we are apart, and its truest desire is to be near you. The past year has shown me the joy that love can bring. My will of stone is to protect our family and the peace we are aiming toward. I vow to love you with all I am for as long as we walk this earth. Kuro Chan, like a fire ruby will shine in the darkest depths, you illuminate my life. You help me find joy in all things. I am forever grateful you gave our love a chance. What was once a spark of curiosity has grown into a passionate fire. May our love be like a diamond. May we take all the heat and pressure of life and use it to refine ourselves. May our love shine for all to see. I vow to love and cherish you, in this life and the next. The fire daimyo stepped forward holding an ornate basin that held dancing orange flames. Fire brings light to the darkness and warmth to the cold. Fire purifies impurity and forges the strongest metals. May your love be like this fire, everlasting and burning brightly. May it continue to bathe the world in the light and provide comfort to each other. Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze and Anko Namikaze, may the fire of your love keep your hearts pure and forge an everlasting bond. He took Anko and Naruto's hand and held it above the fire. Anko's normal seductive beauty was transformed into a majestic beauty. She wore a traditional white, strapless wedding dress. It had snake-like patterns in the fabric of the wedding dress that accentuated her curves. She had golden snake earrings with an ornamental gold crest made of interlocking snakes in her hair. Ruto, you saw me when all others saw a snake. You loved me when all others offered hate. You brought me into your arms when I was alone. You freed me of my curse. For these, and many other reasons, I pledge to love you eternally. I vow to do all I can to protect and build our family. I am yours until death do us part, and hopefully forevermore. Anko Namikaze, my heavy heim. We have grown closer and closer together since I was nine and saw a woman that dared defy the world. I fell in love with your strength, I was captivated by your beauty, and I am enraptured in your presence to this day. You spice up my life and keep me on my toes. I vow to love and cherish you for all my days. The ceremony was the same for Ino and Hinata. We will move straight to the vows. Ino chose to do her hair up in a ceremonial bun adorned with yellow lilies. The yellow wedding dress covered her shapely bust and a diamond cutout exposed her perfectly toned abdomen. The yellow of the dress contrasted beautifully with her blue eyes. Her eyes shone over her bright red lips and drew Naruto in. Ruto, I would like everyone to know I was the first one to call you Ruto. Since we were three, you have been my son. Your sun-kissed blonde hair and brilliant blue eyes pulled me to you. Your warmth, kindness, generosity and love kept me near you. You are the reason I learned what true love is. You're the man I love. I vow to honor that love and care for it like the flowers in my shop. I will nurture it, care for it and give it all it needs to last the rest of our days. Naruto smiled at Ino's words and Azure met baby blue. Ino Namikaze, my flower princess. You brighten up my life and the lives of all those around you. Your smile is Kami's gift, and your scent lingers in my dreams. Your energy revitalizes me and keeps my heart full and young. You are one of my oldest friends and I am blessed to have you as a lifelong partner. I vow to love and cherish you for all the days of my life. Hinata had her princess cut hair done up in a traditional ceremonial bun. She had ornate silver ornamental decorations that contrasted beautifully with her silky black hair. She wore a modest lavender wedding dress that accentuated her shapely body. She projected a refined beauty often reserved for princesses that made Naruto's heart jump into his throat. Hinata took a deep breath and stared into Naruto's eyes. She was always able to pull strength from them. Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, without you I would never have made it this far. When I was three, you saved me for the first time. You freed my clan from its curse to help me achieve my dream. You give freely the love and joy that fills my heart. You embolden my heart and are the moon to my night. Your love and light chase away the shadows of my life. For these and many other reasons, I love you and will continue to do so for the rest of my days. Naruto looked into the beautiful white eyes of Hinata. He marveled at the beauty and lavender tint they possessed. Hinata Uzumaki, Maitsuki Hime. You and your clan have been lifelong friends and now partners. You are the calm to my storm and the beauty to my beast. Your presence brings me joy and peace. Your eyes hold the beauty of the moon and can see right through me. You temper my fire and make me wish to be a better man every single day. My friend, teammate and lover. I vow to love and cherish you for all my days. Throughout the vows, many tears were shed. Mikoto had given Guy a whole box of tissues and it did little to stem the flow of tears from him and Lee. There was a miniature lake forming below the two. 
They would normally be holding each other, but Mikoto and Sakura kept bonking them on the head to prevent the horrid genjutsu from ruining the lovely wedding. Sasuke and Karen were holding hands and enjoying the wedding. Karen was amused to see Sasuke crying during the various vows his honorary brother made, especially during the last one. In general, the crowd thought that this very unique joint wedding was adorable and heartwarming. After the vows, Q had them exchange rings and announced that they may now kiss the brides. Six deep and passionate kisses moistened the panties of every woman in attendance while Jiraiya was limited to a kiss with no tongue. The momentary pout that flickered across his face became very well hidden when Tsunade stepped on his toes. Those in attendance then showered the newlyweds with rice and confetti as they made their way back into the shrine. Naruto created a host of clones to tidy everything up and prepare for the reception. He then flashed the group of them to the reception. The reception was held in Konoha's high-end district. It was quite literally a street party. Naruto felt that while they could limit the wedding to 500, that this was an event everyone should celebrate. There was a heavily decorated stage set up in the plaza next to a park. The stage seated all the newlyweds, wedding party, cage and foreign dignitaries. There were tables set up all throughout the park for the open reception. Konoha hired almost every chef it had to provide the massive feast for the banquet. It seemed like the whole of Konoha was present. Those that couldn't fit in the park were partaking in street parties. All of Konoha seemed to have succumbed to the will of Dionysus. Drinks flowed freely, food and drink were shared, and the cacophony of voices echoed for miles around Konoha. Jiraiya, Tsunade, Naruto, Samui, Haku, Kurotsuchi, Anko, Hinata and Ino had to endure a never-ending greeting line. Everyone wishing them luck and trying to curry favor. Luckily, Hiruzen knew this would happen and had an Anbu team designated to keep the line flowing smoothly. After an hour of greeting high-class guests and dignitaries, the wedding party was finally able to eat and enjoy the festivities. Naruto shared dances with each of his girls. It took people a while to get used to watching six Narutos on the dance floor, but in the end, everyone that knew him just thought that's so Naruto. After the first dance, everyone joined on the dance floor. The funniest dance of the night was watching Zabuza try to dance with Mei. Let's leave it at ungraceful. The most surprising dance of the night was Lee and Guy spinning, flipping and dipping Sakura and Mikoto to a rowdy country song. It was a beautiful night where people of all great nations celebrated as one. Hiruzen never thought he would see the day where Ninja of Iwo would dance with Ninja of Konoha. Chapter 21 The wedding party retired to the Namikaze estate after a long night of celebrations. Even though it was 1 a.m., the sounds of celebration still managed to break through the privacy barriers around the Namikaze estate. The newlyweds were so worn out and tired that this was probably the tamest night of the previous year. They all joined Naruto on his king-sized bed after changing out of their wedding dresses. Naruto slept with Anko and Ino on his right arm, Hinata and Haku on his left. Kurotsuchi slept lower down on the bed with her head sharing Naruto's abdomen with Samui. Despite the crowded bed, all parties had grown to cherish the other's presence, which gave the group a wonderful night's sleep. Naruto cursed the sun's light for rousing him from his warm and comfortable position. The six girls were still resting peacefully, so Naruto just thanked Kami and lay still to let the girls get their sleep. Unfortunately, Naruto felt the pull on his conscience that was him being called to the Hokaye's office. Naruto created a clone and swapped places with it, the seamless transition only woke up Hinata, who Naruto whispered back to the realm of dreams. He took a shower and threw on his kit before flashing to the Hokaye's office. I, Mei and Onoki had joined Hiruzen for an update meeting on the Akatsuki and state of affairs in the elemental nations. Since the Great Five were working together, it became much easier to keep tabs on the Renegade organization. Hiruzen had also shared his information on the Orange Masked Man with the other cage. He asked them to exercise discretion with this information because if he was Madara, then that would have massive ramifications for the Shinobi nations. It is suspected that the Akatsuki was gathering support from the minor nations that occupied territories between the Great Five. The minor nations were getting nervous. They knew of the alliance and the danger it posed to them. Not that any of the cage actually planned on attacking, but it is an easy enough premise to rally the more militant minor villages. So far, Kuza, Hoshi, Yuki and Tanagakor have been noticed as mobilizing. Nothing directly conspiratorial, but there has been increased activity. The various intelligence organizations suspected Akatsuki involvement. Through the joint information gathered by the nations, the cage knew that Akatsuki was starting to make its move. They had each reinforced protection around their Jinchuriki. Each Jinchuriki was to never be left unattended. Han and Roshi hung out together most days with a golem team guarding them. Mei had tried to relocate Utakata with no luck. She had a hunter team trying to locate him, 
but last update she received showed Akatsuki were on his trail. The San B was still dead and would likely not reform for another year or two. I kept B and Yugito together as well since there was an attempt made on B last year by a blue, shark-looking Akatsuki member known as Kisame. Gara had been informed about the threat they posed, but all cage agreed that he was vulnerable. Finally, there was Fu of Takigakor. The village of Taki posed almost no threat to any S-ranked ninja, thus, she is the most vulnerable. The cage planned on sending an international team to inform Taki of the threat and offer assistance. When Naruto walked into the office, the cage greeted him and congratulated him on a wonderful wedding celebration. They each apologized for not giving him a day off, but this was urgent. Taki was recently infiltrated by rogue ninja that had stolen some of their hero's water. The village has had an alliance with them since Konoha gifted them the seven tails and they were calling for support. Naruto-kun, we would like you to assemble two squads and go to reinforce Taki. If possible, retrieve the hero's water. While there, please try to connect with their Jinchuriki. We all agree that she is the most vulnerable. We have prepared this offer of alliance and defense contract if they are willing to let Fu reside here with the seven tails. We are being generous in order to deny Akatsuki a valuable piece. When done, please return here via Hiraishin to ensure the safe transfer. Hiruzen used a strictly professional tone of voice since the other cage were present. I added, who do you plan on taking with you, Naruto? Naruto bowed to show respect before replying, Honorable Cage, I believe it unwise to separate from my new wives at this time. If I bring them with me, along with Jiraiya, I believe that would be the best team. Why Jiraiya-sama? Asked Mei. Because I believe your estimation is correct. Taki is the most vulnerable, especially after the recent attack. I believe there is a mid to high risk of running into Akatsuki. I would prefer taking another Jinchuriki with me, but I know that is not possible. As such, I believe a Sanin is the best alternative. Onoki chuckled briefly. You are indeed wise beyond your years, Naruto-kun. You worry that you would not be able to deal with 2S rank shinobi and protect your wives. Hi, Onoki Gizen. My girls are strong, that much is certain. However, I cannot say with certainty that they would be able to hold off an S rank threat yet. As I stated earlier, it would be unwise to forcefully separate us at this time. Bringing Jiraiya mitigates both threats. Plus, this could almost be a honeymoon if we don't run into the Akatsuki. The cage all chuckled and Hiruzen sent Anbu to bring Jiraiya. Jiraiya entered 10 minutes later. He took in the gathering and figured it had to be about Naruto. Okay, Gaki. Why the hell am I being dragged here in the morning after my wedding? Naruto assumed his signature sheepish pose and chuckled before replying. Kyofu, I am in the same situation. Long story short, we need to take a trip to Taki. I cannot leave my girls behind and due to the active threats, I need you for backup. Worst case scenario, we get a good fight. Best case scenario, I look the other way as you watch your muse at work. The cage all looked at each other, but it was Onoki that asked the question. Jiraiya, don't tell me you use young Naruto as the inspiration for the books we love so much? Yes, all cage read Icha Icha. It might as well be considered a quirk prerequisite for the position. Jiraiya just chuckled and waved Onoki off. They all thought it better left unsaid, so Naruto and Jiraiya bid the cage farewell and went to break the news to their newlyweds. After waking the girls up, making them breakfast and packing their bags, the group set off for Taki. Jiraiya didn't eat breakfast but partook in the finer wake-up call for Tsunade. Thus, when he joined the group with a shit-eating grin on his face, everyone knew. The girls just wished that they had their own time with Naruto this morning. The group headed out around noon for Taki and camped out about half a day away from Taki. That night, Naruto conveniently forgot to put up the privacy seals on the tent. That night alone inspired a whole new book for Jiraiya, four months later Icha Icha, Sister Wives would make its debut. The group arrived the next day late in the afternoon in front of the hidden waterfall. Naruto flexed his chakra to alert the guards and patrols of their presence. After a minute, a mint-haired girl in her early teens appeared at the front of a squad of Taki Ninja. She wore a crop-top white shirt with mesh armor seen around its edges. She also wore a short, white skirt and white arm guards and she had a red container on her back. She spoke in a suspicious tone to address the international ninja group. Hello, Ninja-san, I am Fu, state your business with Taki. Naruto gave her a disarming smile and extended his hand. Nice to meet you Fu-san, my name is Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. These are my wives and Jiraiya the Sanin. We have come in response to a request from Shibuki. I have also wished to meet you, Seven. Tell Chome Q says hello. Fu's eyes seemed to zone out for a bit before she smiled brightly. 
Naruto-sama, we have been expecting you. News of your exploits have reached us, and I would be glad to talk with you. I don't know about becoming your wife though, I think you have enough already. The girl smirked at her in amusement. Anko decided to be the group's representative. You'd be surprised, Fu-chan. Naruto can tire us all out. We might have to call you in for reinforcements. Anko gave Fu a kinky wink. The poor girl just blushed, turned around and beckoned them to follow. The whole group shook their heads. No matter how true what Anko said is, it still isn't something that should be shared with strangers. The group was escorted by the Taki squad through a complex labyrinth in the behind the waterfall. Naruto could sense traps built into the labyrinth that would make a frontal assault through the cave suicide. The group finally exited through the caves and saw a group of Taki elders standing behind a man in cage-like robes. Naruto once again took the lead. Good afternoon, Shibuki Dono, I presume? At the nod of the man's head, he continued. We are the response team from Konoha. I am Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, this is Jiraiya, these are my wives Anko, Hinata, Ino, Samui, Kurotsuchi, and Haku. We are here to assist in recovery of your hero water and I also wish to address your counsel. Would that be possible? Well met, Naruto-sama. I am Shibuki, the elected leader of Taki. We would appreciate your assistance and we will move to our council chambers as soon as you're ready. Fu, please show the others the site of the theft while we talk to Naruto-sama. Fu nodded and beckoned the girls to follow her. Luckily, Hinata and Anko were tracking specialists. It should be possible for them to track them, even with a three-day head start. Naruto and Jiraiya followed the council to their chambers. The council took their seats and got the formalities out of the way. They then gave the floor to Naruto. Counselors, I come today to discuss two things with you. First, I wish to warn you about a group of rogue ninjas dubbed the Akatsuki. They have a core group of 10s ranked ninjas, and they have many more spies and minions throughout the elemental nations. Their goal is to capture Jinchuriki for some reason. We can only speculate on their end game. We do know that one of their core members is Kakuzu, a missing ninja from this village. Use that to evaluate the strength of the other ninja. Naruto stopped here to let them digest. Shibuki discussed this information with the counselors in hushed tones before responding to Naruto. We thank you for this information, Naruto Dono. We are wondering why you offer this freely and what you wish to do about this. Naruto gave a small bow to the council at this. Shibuki, we offer this information as a sign of good faith. My goal is to bring peace to the elemental nations and the Akatsuki poses the biggest threat to that peace. I am a Jinchuriki myself and I care about what happens to my brethren. It is my hope that you will let Fu return with us to Konoha. I will train her how to bond with her bijou partner to prepare for the threats ahead. Shouting erupted from the counselors. Naruto could pick out comments like they wished to take our Jinchuriki and other nations were right. Naruto had planned on letting them respond to this, but he grew impatient. He flexed his chakra to silence the council. Let me be frank. I do not need any power other than my own if I wish to destroy you. That is not a threat, but it is a truth. The ones after the Jinchuriki have prepared to fight Bijou. If you are thinking that you could protect Fu, I beg to differ. There is no ninja in this village that could force me to use my partner's power. Even if they took your vaunted hero water. Your defenses are useless against a rogue ninja from this village. They will undoubtedly come for Fu. You cannot stop them. I have this offering from Konoha and the international forces. We offer trade and defense to Taki in return for letting us borrow Fu. Plus, having Fu out of your village will take the target off Taki. I have not the patience nor the will to listen to your back and forth. Consider the offer and give me your answer when we complete the mission. Naruto put the updated treaty and offer on the table. He was forced to deal with the Konoha council enough, so he didn't feel like staying in there any longer than necessary. He informed Jiraiya about his suspicions about one of the counselors as they walked out. He was getting a nervous and negative feeling from him, which varied greatly from the outrage on the others. It put Naruto on edge. An hour later, he met back up with Fu and his girls. They had picked up the trail and gotten the general direction the ninjas were heading. Likely suspects are Iwa rebels or Hoshi. Jiraiya decided to stay behind in Taki to keep an eye on things. He had the same bad feeling in his gut that Naruto did. Naruto summoned Teilai, a tracker fox, to track the missing ninja and the group headed out. Evidently, Fu was assigned to go with the team and protect Taki's interests. Thanks to Teilai, they had caught up to the group of missing ninjas on the border to Iwa. Naruto was grateful that he was officially on good terms with Iwa. There were still concerns about rogue elements, and it seemed like this group may be one of those elements. Naruto sent clones to scout out the cave system the ninjas were using. 
It had two entrances that he could find and approximately 12 missing ninjas from a variety of countries. He split the girls up into teams of three and four. Anko, Haku and Ino took the rear entrance while Fu, Kurotsuchi, Samui and Hinata took the main entrance. Each group had a Naruto clone captain with them. The clones would not intervene unless needed. Naruto also summoned a few shadow foxes to keep an eye on his girls. Kurotsuchi led the way into the caves, flashed some hand signs and directed the girls to prepare for combat. The two guards watching the inner passage would alert the others if they weren't careful. Kuro and Samui darted from their cover and slit the throats before the two missing nin could make a sound. They caught the bodies and placed them to the side. Hinata called out that there were eight missing nin in the next chamber. Kuro said that she would flood the chamber with lava, but Fu said they were tasked with retrieving the hero water if possible. Therefore, it would have to be precision attacks. They sent a shadow fox with a message to the other group to collapse on the main chamber in five minutes. It also warned of the two guards on their end, thanks to Hinata. Anko's team made short work of the two guards, Kami, snakes are scary. Haku and Ino were more than happy to let Anko take care of those two. Ino had the idea to take over the mind of one of the ninjas in the main room and use him to scout for the hero's water. Anko approved and let the other group know via Kitsi, a small two-tailed shadow fox. Ino hijacked the mind of what looked to be the leader. She was hidden by Naruto's cloaking seal and guarded by Anko. Hey, boys, who wants a taste of that water? I bet nobody here is man enough to take a sip? Ino decided to use the leader to taunt the others into revealing the water's location. Aw, shut your yap, Bruce. Supposedly, that shit'll kill you. I tell you what, if you do it first, I am sure Gary will match you an unknown ninja said. Okay, but if we do this, we get first dibs on the next bitch we capture and we get to finish the sake we have left. Eno made Bruce say. At the taunting cheers of the remaining ninjas, Eno sealed the deal. All right, bring it here. Gary, come here you Neanderthal, we are going to sample the product before completing this job. There was a large round of cheers as one of the bandits brought the hero's water forward. Eno made Bruce take a sip, chop Gary's head off and then he plunged his sword through his chest. Eno cut the connection just before the sword hit the bandit's chest, but Bruce couldn't stop the momentum through the disorienting feeling left over from Eno's mind transfer jutsu. Anko sent snakes in to secure the hero's water before all hell broke loose. The six remaining missing ninjas turned and faced the direction the snakes were coming from. Hinata, Samui, Kuro and Fu attacked from the shadows with well-placed flash tags. The screams that erupted from the bandits and the subsequent flailing motions made it child's play to kill all but one of them. They kept the missing ninja from Taki alive, evidently his name was Sween. They slapped a paralysis seal on him and threw him into a prisoner scroll. Naruto walked in and congratulated the girls, they all performed perfectly. They stripped the belongings off of the ninjas and sealed them away. Two were B-class missing ninja with bounties in Iwa, Naruto took those two heads. Sween was A-class missing ninja from Taki, so Naruto thought the girls could collect the bounties there. Kuro provided the complimentary fire jutsu to burn the remains and they all departed for Taki. They set up camp just inside the Taki border, there wasn't much of a rush and the group didn't want to navigate in the dark. Fu was startled when Naruto summoned some clones to keep watch and lay out security seals. Meanwhile, his whole group went into the same tent for some celebratory activities. Then, another Naruto clone came and offered her a tent and helped her set it up. Fu was used to sleeping in the trees of the forest that surrounded Taki but she supposed it would be nice to sleep on a mat for a change. After setting up the tent, the Naruto clone decided to go to a more serious conversation. Fu, how have you been treated in Taki? I know that life isn't easy for Jinchuriki, and I was picking up mixed feelings inside the village? His earnest and concerned tone caused Fu to relax, despite the nature of the question. Not great. The only one who treats me with respect is Shibuki. The rest just order me around like I am some emotionless soldier. I am not allowed inside the village on most days and Shibuki has ninja squads bring me food. Most of the time it is expired or nearly rotten. She replied in a somber tone. I am sorry to hear that. What if I said I made them an offer that they likely can't refuse that would bring you to Konoha with me? Would you like to leave? Really? Why would you do that for me? What is in it for you? The hope that flashed through her orange eyes was rapidly clouded with suspicion. Because I am the Jinchuriki of the QB. I made a promise to him to find my brethren and help ease their burdens. In return, Q agreed to partner with me to help me achieve my dreams. Once again, Fu's eyes went hazy and returned shortly after. Chome says there is no way that her brother would work with a silly little human. Naruto smirked at this and formed his cross-shaped hand seal. Moments later, 
Q formed and walked over to Fu. Q had a mischievous grin on his face. He walked up and looked directly at Fu's eyes. Oh really, little sister? You don't see in this boy what I see in him? You don't see how in a little over 15 years he has united the five great nations? Oh, how blind my happy-go-lucky little sister has become. Fu was confused when her tenant started yelling in her head. It turns out that when the queen of all insects starts rambling and clicks that it is hard to discern. Eventually Fu was brought back from the one-sided conversation with her bijou, and she looked in between Naruto and Q with an awestruck look on her face. You were telling the truth. Chome wishes to know how you freed her brother. Fu wishes to know too. Chome has been Fu's only friend and I want to let her out too. Naruto and Q just smiled down at the little girl. It is a clan secret, however, if you return to Konoha with us, I will teach it to you. Trust me when I say that I want to do right by you and Chome. Fu was quiet for a while with the usual clouded look on her face. She turned back to Naruto with a smile and said, Fu wants to go to Konoha with you. Fu thinks it would be much better than staying in Taki. They continued talking for a while about more light-hearted topics after that. Fu didn't seem to have any problems with Naruto and his harem, although she did clarify that she didn't have to become one of his wives if she wanted to go to Konoha. Naruto just laughed at that and waved her off. It was about an hour after the group went to bed that things started going haywire. Around 1 a.m., Naruto felt one massive and one large chakra signature approaching their campsite. They were still around a mile out and walking slowly, but they felt dark. His Sinigami seal started burning and he had a feeling he needed to go deal with these two. Naruto had one of the guard clones flash to Jiraiya and inform him that a massive fight was imminent and give him directions on how to find them. Naruto roused the girls and told them that he wanted them to get battle ready. They were to keep their distance and not intervene. If it is the Akatsuki, he would need a clear mind and couldn't worry about them getting hurt. They all vehemently refused and told him right where to shove it. Since Naruto feared the wrath of all six wives, he relented but said they are only to fill support roles. Naruto sped off into the night with ten clone captains already formed and wearing the stealth seals. He pulled on Kurama's chakra to immediately replenish his reserves before summoning two four-tailed battle foxes that were around the size of lions. He was going to go check this out and wanted to be prepared for a worst-case scenario. A couple minutes later, Naruto approached the two strangers as they were walking along the foothills of Iwa's mountain range. They were doing nothing to hide their chakra, fully confident to flaunt their presences. One of them was rambling to the other when the taller one shut him up. Naruto had activated his eyes and took in the unsightly pair. The one that had been rambling about some Jashin wannabe god had grey, slicked back hair, a crazy look on his face and was wearing a black robe with red clouds. He wore his crossed-out hishiate around his neck and carried a big three-bladed red scythe. Kurama warned his partner that this fool was a Jashinist and that he may be blessed with some sort of immortality. The partner stood a full head taller than the Jashinist and most of his face was covered by the black robes. He had his head wrapped in some white cloth and wore a crossed-out hishiate of Taki. That let Naruto know this was Kakuzu of the Hidden Waterfall Village. Naruto also registered that these were the two the Sinigami had tasked him with killing. He waved his girls back, saying that he would be the one to engage first. Then, Naruto presented himself in front of the two ninjas, he knew that he had been sensed out but figured that at this distance he would be able to react in time. What brings you two to these parts? If I venture to guess, you would be going after the Nanabi Jinchuriki, am I right? What's it to you, heathen? I am going to kill you and offer your blood to Jashin-sama. Oh, I can't wait to be covered in your blood. Oh, the sweet ecstasy I will experience by carving you up and offering you to Lord Jashin. Hidan's hysterical tone escalated as he continued to speak. Kakuzu threw ice water on Hidan's excitement. Shut it, you fool. This is the Kyuubi Jinchuriki and he chose to confront us. We have been warned against fighting him. Kyuubi Jinchuriki, tell us where the Nanabi is, and we will spare you the embarrassment of your defeat for right now. Naruto adopted a cocky smirk on his face, oh, is that right Kakuzu? Tell me what you want with the Jinchuriki, and I may point you in the right direction. Then again, maybe I won't. Hidan screamed out at Naruto. Shut your mouth, heathen. You don't need to know what leader Sama is planning with the bijou. All you need to worry about is greeting Lord Jashin. He attempted to make a move toward Naruto before being grabbed by Kakuzu for the second time. Once again, Kakuzu forced his partner to exercise restraint and held him back. He was getting a terrifying feeling from the Kyuubi Jinchuriki. At that point, a massive blue barrier surrounded the area. Four clone captains decided to contain the two marks. Six remained hidden inside the barrier. Naruto sensed his girls outside the barrier along with Fu. 
they were not happy about him sealing himself inside with the two enemies while they were forced to watch. Naruto spoke up in a confident tone filled with hidden rage. Hidan and Kakuzu, the Sinigami has a score to settle with you too. I care not to meet this wannabe god that you worship. Jashin is a demon of destruction, not even a real god. If you tell me about the Akatsuki and its goals, I will make your death painless. Kakuzu could no longer restrain Hidan, the Jashinist charged across the expanse at Naruto. Nobody talked about his Jashin Sama that way. As Hidan began sprinting at Naruto, Naruto flashed into his golden cloak and disappeared. He drew Whirlpool's edge and met Hidan in the middle of the battleground. He slid under a wild horizontal swing of the massive scythe and severed Hidan's right arm with an upward slash. The limb fell limply to the ground while the scythe went flying 20 feet before reaching the end of its chain length. The shocked Hidan couldn't react as Naruto the spun up and out of his slide and severed his head. The whole interaction took about 3 seconds. The severed head of Hidan made a squelching sound as it hit the ground, but that didn't stop Hidan from rattling off a chain of curses at Naruto. While that was happening, the clone captains performed the collaboration just to firestorm on the distracted Kakuzu. He was unable to fully react in time due to the scale of the attack and the wind mask that he was wearing as a heart broke due to the immense heat. When the firestorm had cleared, Kakuzu saw Naruto splitting Hidan's severed head in two. That ceased the profanities that were pouring out of the severed head. Now, there was just gurgling noises coming from the bisected head that was still somehow moving its jaws. Hidan's whole world was pain. His brain was split in half, but he was still somehow conscious and able to process things. The ecstasy of the pain the insane Hidan was feeling stopped him from being able to process his situation. Kakuzu was on high alert. This boy was clearly ready for them. He couldn't afford to worry about his fool of a partner. Right now, his survival instincts were screaming at him to escape this situation and live to fight another day. This was supposed to be an easy snatch and grab mission for the inexperienced Nanabi Jinchuriki. Instead, he was locked in a deathmatch with the Jinchuriki that Toby had warned him about. Once his earth heart had slid into position by replacing the broken wind mask, Kakuzu tried slipping under the barrier through use of the hiding like a mole technique. The jolt he received from the barrier in exchange for his efforts caused him to surface and curse out loud. Naruto had watched the ninja take the firestorm head on and was cautious of the rogue ninja. He could sense five remaining presences combined in his enemy, which put him on guard. After some small shuffling of the man's singed cloak, Naruto sensed earth chakra buildup. He let the ninja try to escape, knowing his barrier would hold him in. Lightning was Earth's only real weakness after all. When the Kakuzu was forced to resurface, Naruto attacked with his Wakazashi. The fast-paced fight was a blur for the spectating women outside the barrier. They were able to hear the sounds of Naruto's sword hitting something very hard, but it seemed like the battle was going nowhere. Naruto could pick up on the small gashes in the earth armor that Kakuzu had coated himself with, but he was surprised that his wakazashi couldn't cut through it despite the wind chakra he had been channeling to the blade. After five minutes of non-stop, fast-paced combat, he broke contact with Kakuzu to reform a battle plan. When Naruto jumped back, Kakuzu caught his breath. His earth armor was as strong as diamonds and this boy's blade was chipping it off little by little. The fact that he couldn't land a hit on the blonde blur frustrated him even further. It was then that Kakuzu picked up on two blurs running at him. It wasn't until a set of lightning-covered claws tore at his face that he saw they were Kitsune's. The two Kitsune had picked up on the use of Earth Chakra and only one of them could channel any lightning. Therefore, Kiyure decided to act as a distraction. She would launch volleys of fireballs and attack cautiously from blind spots. She saw her summoner dash through the barrier and knew that she had to buy time. Kiryuga was taking advantage of the openings Kiyure created and was trying to land a decisive hit for his summoner. Every time he clawed the masked human, it felt like his lightning-covered claws were going to break off at the tips. Despite landing a number of attacks, all he had to show for it was some claw marks along the arms, abdomen and legs of Kakuzu. The two Kitsune continued the combo attack until Kakuzu landed a decisive blow on Kiryuga. The summon was forced back to his realm with a couple broken ribs, but its job was done. Meanwhile, Naruto used the distraction created by his fox summons to jump outside the barrier and give Samui a kiss. He asked her for her sword, which she gave with little resistance. The girls and Fu asked to join the fight, but Naruto said he had it under control. He then rejoined the fight leaving the girls stuck outside of the blue barrier. The girls were starting to get worked up over all of this. I'm going to give it to that Baka good when he is done in there. Ino smashed a fist into her open palm. Does he really think that we can't help him at all? It's really not cool. And he took Stormy from me. Added Samui in a subdued voice. I agree, Ni-chan. 
That gaki better be ready for what's coming to him. Keeping me out of such a bloody fight. It has got me all worked up and I have nothing to let loose on. Anko's bloodthirst was leaking out in droves. These were the people she had been training to fight and her lover denied her any of the action. Um, girls, have you been watching the fight? I know we are good, but I can't even track Naruto's movements. Not to mention, Kakuzu is in the bingo books for having fought the first Hokage. He escaped the fight with Hashirama after a defeat, but anybody of that caliber is extremely dangerous. Kurotsuchi tried to reason with the group, but even she didn't just want to sit and watch her lover do all the work. We should trust Na. Oh no. Hinata squeaked out as she saw Kiru Yuga take the hit from Kakuzu and go flying. Naruto returned to the fight immediately after Kiru Yuga had been dispelled and used the distraction to attack Kakuzu from behind. Naruto had sped around to Kakuzu's backside and used his overextended position to dash in with a lunge and stab of Samui's katana. The lightning-covered storm's edge pierced through Kakuzu's back easily and pierced where the heart should be. The hardened earth armor shattered and fell off of him in flakes as the lightning-covered blade protruded from his chest. Naruto thought he had done it, but he was blown back by a massive fireball that erupted from Kakuzu's back. When the smoke cleared, Naruto saw that Kakuzu's robe was no more. Instead, a bizarre sight greeted the blonde Jinchuriki. Kakuzu's body looked like it was composed of pulsing threads. In these threads were masks for fire, water and lightning. The lightning mask was now positioned where Kakuzu's heart should be. The threads were bulging around the fire and water masks until the two masks separated from Kakuzu's body and formed into some sort of animalistic masses with the masks acting as the head. On Kakuzu's back were two cracked masks with the kanji for wind and earth on them. As Naruto was processing the bizarre sight, Kakuzu was panicking. He had fought Hashirama Senju back in his prime. Even that great battle didn't inspire the fear that Kakuzu was feeling. He decided to separate his masks and overwhelm his opponent. The blonde just created two clones in response. Kakuzu's water mask launched a massive Sutan, water colliding wave at the group of Naruto's. Kakuzu channeled lightning chakra through his body and called out Raiden, Thunderbolt as he pointed his arm at the mass of water. A massive wave almost half the width of the barrier and ten feet high, pulsing with a lightning chakra, hurled itself at Naruto and left no angle for escape. Naruto's barrier clone substituted with him to take the hit. Naruto gave a mental thanks to the clone for its sacrifice as he regained his bearings. Before returning to the fight, Naruto created another clone captain to take the position on the barrier. The real Naruto passed through the barrier and flipped through hand seals before whispering futon, pressure damage. The massive wind attack, empowered by Kurama's chakra, acted as a blunt force hammer that tore across the battlefield. Kakuzu managed to shield himself and the fire mask, but the water mask took a direct hit and was sent hurtling toward the lightning barrier. Before it could recover itself mid-air, the mass of thread slammed into the lightning barrier and was electrocuted. The shock of the lightning chakra cracked the water mask and the threads fell in a tangled heap next to the barrier. Kakuzu called his fire mask back into his body, he couldn't leave it exposed when this boy was handling them so easily. Kakuzu also activated his last defense. Long 20-foot threads emerged from Kakuzu's back, chest and arms. They swayed about randomly and made Kakuzu appear like wraith with a writhing mass of tentacles. Naruto was cautious of the new form, he had felt how durable those threads were and didn't want to get into their range. Naruto sent four clones at the writhing mass and each clone was dispelled easily by the missing ninja. However, after the fourth clone dispelled, Kakuzu was unable to move, and his threads dangled loosely from his body. What the fuck did you do to me, brat? Kakuzu had now lost his cool and was struggling against some invisible bindings. Fuinjutsu is amazing, isn't it? Clones acting as a medium for Fuinjutsu is just as awesome, but I am guessing you wouldn't be able to understand. I will let you see the final form of my father's jutsu before you die. Then, Sinigami-sama will collect your soul. Enjoy your eternal stay in the Sinigami stomach, Kakuzu. After Naruto said his piece, he formed a Rasengan and funneled wind chakra into it. He stabilized the wind chakra with a thin barrier form from Kurama's denser chakra. Once it was stable, a high-pitched whining sound was coming from the golden, bladed orb in Naruto's hand. Naruto then hurled the spinning orb at Kakuzu. He tried to break off his fire mask and have it escape, but it was too late. The sphere made contact with his chest and cut straight through him. Immediately after cutting through Kakuzu, the sphere expanded, and the small whine of the wind's blade turned into the shriek of gale force winds. A massive dome composed of millions of tiny wind blades about 40 feet in diameter appeared over the form of Kakuzu. The windstorm lasted for about 10 seconds before dispersing leaving eerie silence over the battlefield. 
Once the dust cleared, all that remained of Kakuzu was a shredded tangle of wire and part of Kakuzu's face. Naruto went to gather the remains of the Jashinist and chuckled as the two halves of the head writhed around in his hands while trying to bite Naruto. Naruto threw the halves of the head by Hidan's hair over to Kakuzu's shredded form. He then carried the body over and unceremoniously dropped in on the ground next to the bisected head. Naruto then had his clones drop the barrier and allowed his wives to walk onto the battlefield. Each one of them was shocked. They knew Naruto was strong, but he just dealt with two s rank ninjas like it was a walk in the park. Kurama had his fist extended, ready for a fist bump, when Naruto entered the mindscape. Naruto wearily bumped fist with Q before laying down on one of his tails. That was a great fight, Kit. I am glad I was here to watch that live in action. Next time, maybe you could summon me so we could share in the fun. However, now we must summon the Sinigami to uphold our end of the bargain. Kurama's voice made no effort to hide the pride he felt in his summoner. Gotcha, Q. I just want to catch my breath and ease my chakra coils for a bit. I want to have a suitable chakra offering for him. Do you really think that Hidan guy was S rank? He seemed pretty pathetic. The weariness in Naruto's voice was already fading. Kurama chuckled, well, Kit, when somebody relies on a false immortality, it is no surprise when their battle tactics become sloppy. Not to mention that bunch of Jashinists have more than a few screws loose to begin with. When I was free, I used to hunt them. They were some of the most evil and vile Ningans that I ever tasted. After listening to the fake retching sounds Kurama was making Naruto responded. Yeah, he was sloppy. I did get the feeling that he was dangerous, but he was so slow, and that scythe was massive and lopsided. It made it easy to find openings. Anyway, we can review the fights later. I need to deal with my girls now. Later, Q. Naruto brought himself back to the present with his girls hovering over him. He was sitting in a meditative posture to calm his riled up chakra flow. He looked up at the girls and dealt with five minutes of reassuring them he was fine. Hugs and kisses rained down on him along with shouts of indignation for not letting them help him. A kiss from Anko was followed by a slap across his face. Naruto diffused this tense situation by informing them of his deal with the Sinigami and saying that these were the two the Sinigami had requested he kill in exchange for Kurama's other half and his father's soul. The girls were already stunned speechless by the story, but when Naruto got up and informed them that they would be meeting the Sinigami, they nearly pissed themselves. Ladies, the Uzumaki clan had a long-standing relationship with the Sinigami in the past. I intend on rekindling that relationship and honoring my ancestors. You are part of my family and as the matriarchs of the Uzumaki and Namikaze clans, I wish for you to join me in honoring that arrangement. Is that all right with everyone? His voice softened for the last part and he got nods in response from all of his girls. Naruto stood up from his meditative pose and returned to his golden cloak state. Naruto then went through the long chain of hand seals to summon the death god. He made a blood offering and then slammed his hand on the ground. The whole surrounding environment stilled, and a frigid presence settled upon the landscape. Naruto bowed deeply as he sensed the presence and his wives followed suit. Fu was standing there without a clue as to what was going on before listening to Chomei's screams and bowing as well. Sinigami-sama, I am honored that you answered my call. I offer you the gifts of my chakra and the two humans you requested I hunt. Naruto was bent over in an L-shaped bow. The Sinigami's raspy voice answered Naruto, You have done well, mortal. These are indeed the two I assigned you. The Sinigami paused here and extended its long, spindly fingers to grab the souls out of Hidan and Kakuzu. It raised the writhing, ethereal masses to its mouth and chomped down. With that, your debt is paid. Thank you, Sinigami-sama. As we spoke of previously, I wish for my clan to once again partner with your excellence. These are my wives and future matriarchs of the Uzumaki and Namikaze clans. I wish to introduce you to them to rekindle our relationship, Sinigami-sama. The Sinigami let out a loud and scratchy laugh before it snapped its fingers. The frigid atmosphere vanished, and the group was drawn into the Death God's dimension. The Sinigami was seated on an ornate throne and there were chairs positioned in front of a fireplace. The Sinigami made a motion with its hand and Naruto's group sat in the chairs. The whole environment was awkwardly cozy. Then, the Sinigami morphed into a beautiful, pale-skinned woman. Unlike her summoned form, her skin glimmered with an ethereal sheen. The mess of pale white hair was now groomed into a dignified ponytail. A beautiful and regal face hovered over a pair of breasts that put Tsunade's to shame. All the girls remained frozen in a stunned silence as they took in the newfound beauty of the Death God. Very well, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. I will allow you to be my agents in the realm of the living. 
You may call me Shin and drop the formalities when we are not in public. I ask that you now introduce your wives. The regal tone had a beautiful and mysterious ring to it. Naruto rose and once again bowed. Shin, these are my wives Anko, Samui and Ino who will be heading the Namikaze clan. These are Kurotsuchi, Hinata and Haku who will be the matriarchs of the Uzumaki clan. It is my wish to have both of my houses serve you. As he introduced the girls, they each stood and bowed to Shin. Once he was finished, Shin returned the bows with a nod of her head. Shin let out an enchanting chuckle. It is pleasant to have patrons once again. Come forward, Naruto, and please release Kurama so that I may address him as well. Naruto let Q out in his human form before Shin continued. Kurama, it has been ages since we last spoke. How have you been, young Kit? Q's face wrinkled in frustration. This damned eternal being always called him that. He re-schooled his features before responding to the Sinigami. As of late, I have been content Shin. However, I must ask that you do not address the head of the Kitsune clan as Kit. You may use my name. His tone sounded rather petulant, which made Naruto stifle a laugh. Shin waved him off and adopted a serious look on her face. As you know, I had previously bound your souls together. I did not expect young Naruto-kun here to gain your trust and power so rapidly. Tell me, Kurama, do you find your current arrangement agreeable? After a slight moment of hesitation, Kurama answered. Yes, Shin, I do. I will assist Naruto throughout his life. However, he has agreed to free me upon his death, will you honor that arrangement? Ah, yes, yes I will. I never thought I would see the day that you would willingly forfeit your freedom. I had planned on making an offer to free you from your seal. Are you sure you do not wish to accept? Kurama paused here and looked at Naruto. Naruto mouthed that it was his choice. He was torn on what to do, but he remembered the promise made to Naruto. Shin, I do appreciate your offer. When the kid here dies of old age with hordes of grandkids, then I will take you up on your offer. I made a promise to Naruto to partner with him. He has earned the right to my respect and power, and I feel that I will honor my father by sticking with the kit. Shin let out a pleasant laugh that entranced Naruto and his group. She clicked her fingers and an old man with white hair, a stern aged face and horns materialized. He wore a Magadama necklace with six Magadama. His long white monk's cloak also had Magadama on the neckline. Shin clicked her fingers in cue and the old man disappeared. Now, Naruto-kun, while those two are catching up, why don't you answer a question for me? Why do you seek to restore the pact with me and your clan? Simple. I seek to restore the greatness of the Uzumaki clan. I read about the prior arrangement and saw it as a net positive. I trust that you will not abuse my power and that you will use me to maintain balance in the realm of the living. My wives are a part of me and will assist me in this effort, should you so wish. In return for a lifetime of service, I ask that you let us reside together in the pure world. They are each an integral part of my soul and I wish to stay with them after death. The sincerity of his tone brought tears to each girl present. When Shin looked at them, they each nodded their heads in affirmation of Naruto's words. Shin adorned an ethereal smile. Very well, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. I hereby name you, my champion. You will be an extension of my will in the realm of the living. You will lead your wives and future generations to maintain the balance in my name. You will target the tainted souls of evil men. In exchange, you can call on me without a chakra or soul offerings. You, your wives and your future children will be sent to the highest realm of the pure world upon their deaths, so long as they honor our contract. I grant you this seal, which will store the souls of those you slay and those that have not yet passed to the pure world. I will call you to my realm once a year to collect those souls and lay them to rest. Any questions? Naruto's mind was racing. He may have read about the relationship with the Sinigami in his ancestral texts, but this was a lot to take in. He took a deep breath to calm his thoughts and looked at the new seal on the palm of his right hand. It mirrored the intricate seal on his stomach, which made him think of Kurama. Shin, I would ask that you free and protect Kurama in the event of my untimely death. There are those that seek to control him and the other bijou. If I fall in battle, I ask you to release him from the seal and offer him protection. I do not plan on dying, but I would feel better knowing that Q will be taken care of should I fall. Shin had seen her fair share of humans pass through the gates to her realm. She rarely if ever saw a human put something before itself. This child was marvelous. Very well, Naruto-kun. Should that come to pass, I will offer Kurama my protection. Now, the one named Yakashi Kabuto is using that cursed jutsu to steal souls from my realm. He is the next one I ask you to punish. You will find he has joined the organization you are fighting against. 
Please excuse me, I must go brag to Kami and Yami about my new champion. She moved before anyone could process it and placed a chilling kiss on Naruto's forehead. The group snapped back to the living realm and found their bodies hadn't moved. It looked as though no time had passed because Fu was just standing there looking confused. Naruto was rubbing his forehead as he promised to explain later before sealing up the lifeless remains of Hidan and Kakuzu. He looked down at his hand and saw the seal of the Sinigami. The girls all looked at it too. They were all in shock from meeting a deity of this world that just acted all buddy-buddy with their Naruto-kun. After Naruto sealed up the remains, he went with the girls back to the campsite. Later that night, while he was lying in a pile of his girls, Naruto felt Kurama's conscience return to his mind. How did it go Q? That guy the sage of six paths, right? Naruto asked internally. Yes, Kit. I cannot tell you much of what we spoke of. However, my father confirmed something that is a big deal to me, Kit. It may be revealed in time, but it was a great gift being able to speak with him again. Naruto didn't know what to say to that, so he settled with aha. Kurama let him rest for the night, they will have plenty of time to talk about it later. The group began the return trip to Taki late in the next morning. Jiraiya had finally found them and then entered a gobsmacked state when Naruto told him about his fight with Hidan and Kakuzu. Jiraiya remained in a stunned state until they returned to Taki. They appeared in front of Taki's council and gave the hero's water back to Shibuki. Then Naruto unsealed the remains of Kakuzu's body and the prisoner swing. The elders reacted the way Naruto expected, with an uproar. After Shibuki calmed them down, Naruto addressed them. I do not know what decision this council has come to but heed my warning. Last night, Hidan and Kakuzu, your own missing ninja, attacked me on their search for Fu. Their organization wants the Bijou for some nefarious purpose. While I was able to deal with said threat, I assure you that nobody in this village, nor the village as a whole, could have dealt with them. The next person they send will be stronger than these two. Allow Fu to come with us and the target will be taken off your village. I also suspect a traitor on your council, since they were heading directly toward where we were dispatched for our mission. I leave that for you to deal with. I will expect the bounties to be paid out with our mission pay. I will leave you with that. Do not call me back here until you have come to a decision. Naruto's tone was deadly serious and carried a finality with it. He walked out of the room accompanied by his girls and Jiraiya. As Naruto left the room, the Taki council was in an uproar. Shibuki was still young and couldn't take proper control over the council, so they pretty much ran roughshod over him. The screams back and forth about the Uzumaki brat started giving Shibuki a headache. They were all frustrated because they realized there was absolutely nothing they could do. Konoha and the Great Five had them by the balls and all parties knew it. It was when he heard things like we should join the coalition of minor nations and fuck the Great Five that Shibuki stepped in and shut them council down. He spent much of that day getting the council to acknowledge their current situation and pointing out the folly of rebellion. After all, they did get a sizable payment, preferable trade deals and a defense agreement out of this debacle. With that, most of the council was satiated, but Shibuki would later assign a team to investigate each counselor and sniff out the potential traitor. Fu showed the group a hidden pool that she uses for swimming and relaxation. The girls put on their bathing suits and joined Naruto for an afternoon of fun, flirting and swimming. That G-rated fun lasted for 30 minutes before going X-rated. More than a few loads of spunk were added to the clear waters that afternoon to Fu's amazement. Fu simply marveled at the positive energy and love the group had, along with their complete lack of shame. She did choose to fly away after multiple girls started moaning though. As far as Naruto was concerned, it was a great way to pass the time. The next morning, Naruto got the council's answer. They would let Fu reside in Konoha, but they would not release their claim on her. Naruto didn't care, once they were out of this damned village they could do nothing to him or Fu ever again. They signed the treaty and that is all that matters. They couldn't pay out the bounty for Kakuzu in full, but they did pay Naruto half of the money up front. Naruto didn't bother with pleasantries after receiving his pay. He allowed enough time for Fu to say her goodbyes to Shibuki, but he couldn't give a fuck less about the counselor standing behind him. Naruto joined hands with Fu while his girls all put a hand on him. He flashed golden and then used the Horishin to appear outside the Hokage's office. He told the girls to go home and get some rest while he and Fu reported into the Hokage. Alright guys, that's it for the video. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe. As always, the rest of the story is already out over on Patreon, link to that will be in the description. Anyways, until next time, peace.